Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we shall move on to the matter of privilege as flagged on the red. Senators. By letter dated the 29th of August 2021, Senator Patrick has raised as a matter of privilege the failure of the Commissioner of Taxation to comply with an order of the Senate requiring the production of documents related to JobKeeper payments. While the Senate has generally preferred political or procedural remedies in disputes over documents, it may, in disputes over documents, it may also seek to enforce its orders through its contempt jurisdiction. In that vein, the Senate, in June this year, referred a dispute over documents withheld from the Economic References Committee to the Privileges Committee for inquiry as a possible contempt. The letter from Senator Patrick sets out the background to the current matter. The Tax Commissioner de declined to comply with the Senate's order of 4 August, raising the confidentiality of taxpayer information as a public interest immunity claim. On 23 August, the Senate explicitly rejected that claim and ordered the Commissioner to, quote, Quote, to fully comply with the order. The Treasurer then responded with his own public interest immunity claim, while the Commissioner declined to take any further action until the Treasurer's claim was determined by the Senate. Senator Patrick seeks to have the Commissioner's refusal to comply with the second order dealt with as a matter of privilege and referred to the Privileges Committee for inquiry as a possible contempt. Where a matter of privilege is raised, as I've said before, my role is to consider whether it should have precedence in debate. In making that determination, I am bound to consider only the criteria in Privilege Resolution 4. These criteria seek to reserve the Senate's contempt powers for matters involving substantial obstruction to Senate and committee processes or to Senators' duties. They also recognise that the Senate is generally reluctant to deal with contempt, conduct as a contempt where there is another, more appropriate avenue for redress available. It is clear that the conduct of the kind recited in Senator Patrick's letter could substantially frustrate the orders of the Senate requiring the production of documents. The Senate has declared in Privilege Resolution 6 that disobedience of a lawful order of the Senate and refusal to produce documents in accordance with the Senate order may be dealt with by the Senate as a contempt. I am therefore satisfied that criterion A is met. The questions whether the matter warrants investigation as a possible contempt or whether the Tax Commissioner has a reasonable excuse for his conduct are not questions for me, but for the Senate. In relation to the second criterion, regard for the existence of other remedies. Only the Senate can remedy conduct obstructing its own orders. In that sense, this criterion is also satisfied. However, I note that there are also procedural and legislative avenues available to the Senate. They include taking action to consider the public interest immunity claim made by the Treasurer, or seeking the publication of the information by legislative means. In relation to possible legislative action, I note that Senators McAllister and Patrick have both circulated amendments to an upcoming Treasury Laws Amendment Bill that would require publication of the information in question. In any case, the matter meets the criteria I am required to consider, and I have determined that the matter should be granted precedence. However, it remains for the Senate to determine whether the matter should be progressed by way of a referral to the Privileges Committee or whether another remedy should be pursued. I table the correspondence and I call Senator Patrick remotely to give a notice of motion in respect of the matter. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. I give notice that on the first day of the next sitting period, I shall move that the following matter be referred to the Standing Committee of Privileges for Inquiry and Report. 
having regard to the matters raised by Senator Patrick in correspondence tabled by the President on 1 September 2021, whether the Commissioner of Taxation has, without reasonable excuse, disobeyed a lawful order of the Senate, failed to produce documents in accordance with an order of the Senate, or improperly interfered with the power of the Senate to obtain information necessary to support its accountability functions, and, if so, whether an any contempt was committed in this regard. I, and I also seek leave to make a short uh, statement of, of no more than three minutes. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a very important issue. Irrespective of whether senators might agree or disagree with the order, the Senate has uh, placed an order on the tax commissioner. It was placed on the tax commissioner because the information is not able to be obtained by the Treasurer uh, by way of uh, uh, Division 355 of the Tax Administration Act, which prevents uh, the Minister seeking access to taxpayers' information. Uh, the Commissioner uh, responded to the 4th of August uh, order for production, uh, advancing a public interest immunity, as he is entitled. The Senate has then rejected that on the 23rd of August, uh, giving the tax commissioner until the 26th of August to comply with the order, and he failed to do so. It's a very serious matter when a member of the executive fails to comply with a lawful order of the Senate. In relation to the remedies, and I thank the president for raising uh, the other alternate remedies, the amendments in relation to uh, the JobKeeper uh, or sorry, the, the, the Treasury laws amendments that are go or bills that are going through this, the Senate involve a process which requires the House to agree to those amendments. And in effect, uh, I, I, I respectfully suggest it raises comity issues as to whether it's appropriate for that to be a remedy uh, to a potential contempt of the Senate. In relation to the Treasurer's uh, advancement of a public interest immunity. The order was not directed at the Treasurer for good reason, and there is no lawful ability for the uh, Treasurer to countermand an order of the Senate. It is an important issue that needs to be resolved, and I will, uh, in accordance with the, the notice I've given, give the Senate the opportunity to consider this over the, the, uh, the break between uh, the sitting periods. Thank you, Mr President. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day Number 1, Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the second reading amendment moved by Senator McAllister. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I rise to speak on the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021. I almost admire the commitment of the Human Rights Commission is on a crusade to engineer Australia into its own warped image of a progressive society poised to punish and dissent from the orthodoxy of the woke, an orthodoxy which I'm sure the Commission believes it should have the power to determine itself. The Commission has a remarkable tendency for overreach, a love of fair with costly red tape and massive bureaucracy, and is very selective about which rights it promotes and defends. It certainly doesn't promote or defend freedom of speech, a fundamental right of democracies like Australia. It's with dismay that I've listened to Senators demand that every recommendation of the Commission's Respect at Work report be implemented immediately. At least I can appreciate the contribution of Green Senators, because in their own passion for the subject, they've revealed the real agenda behind this nonsense. They want to engineer gender equality outcomes how, how far would it go? Do they want equal gender representation in our prisons? Do they want equal gender representation in homelessness? Do they want gender equality in life expectancy? Experience in other countries demonstrates that where there is strong support for equality of opportunity and maximising choice in education and employment, you don't get equal outcomes in pay and or occupations. If anything, the differences in pay and occupation between men and women increase with more choice and opportunity. And that's simply because 
There are important biologically based differences in preferences between men and women, something the Greens and the Human Rights Commission refuse to acknowledge. One Nation has always supported equality before the law for all Australians and equality of opportunity for all Australians. What happens after that should be up to Australians themselves, not unelected would-be social engineers like the Human Rights Commission. It has made some very disturbing recommendations in the respective work report that One Nation will never support. It is recommending the indoctrination of school children into woke gender equality ideology. It is recommending the Australian media be forcibly indoctrinated in the same ideology and wants guidelines in place to prevent the media from reporting on sexual harassment in any way other than what the Commission deems acceptable. The Commission wants to indoctrinate workers' compensation bodies and tell businesses what to do with respect to non-disclosure agreements. The Commission wants to indoctrinate judges and magistrates too, as if adherence to the law and presumption of innocence are not sufficient for them to do their job fairly and effectively. The Commission wants to hide sexual harassment civil proceedings in our courts from the public. The pressure on our universities, already badly compromised by work, work ideology, is increased under these recommendations, with the Commission demanding more taxpayer money to help smaller universities implement its agenda. The government has already established the recommended Workplace Sexual Harassment Council, the vehicle by which the Commission seeks to put effect to its agenda. One Nation has posed this establishment of this body. We need less red tape, not more. The Commission wants to force a duty on employers to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation and wants the power to assess the compliance and enforce it. It's as if the Commission wants to take the place of the courts and police and doesn't understand that we already have numerous laws which make such conduct illegal. The Commission wants more power to inquire into systemic discrimination which is already unlawful, and to penalise those who do not take part in these virtual signalling witch hunts. The Commission wants to extend the time in which it does not have to terminate a sexual harassment complaint and ensure anyone bringing a complaint has taxpayer support to do so. The Commission's ambition to effectively rule over Australian business, education systems and the judiciary should alarm every member and senator in this parliament. The Commission wants to be a law unto itself, and it is secure in this arrogant presumption because successive Australian governments have repeatedly failed to reign in this naked ambition. We can safely dismiss Labor on this issue, hopelessly compromised by its abysmal record in dealing with sexual harassment. Let's never forget the hypocrisy of Julia Gillard, Australia's first woman Labor Prime Minister passionately defending the integrity of former Speaker Peter Slipper while funding his defence against sexual harassment charges. The victim was left to fund his own enormous legal costs and years later is still seeking to recover them. Labor knew all about Slipper's reputation for sexual harassment, with other victims paid off by the <laughs> Department of Defence before they elevated him to the Speaker's role. Labor ena enabled his harassment of young men by giving him the third highest office in the nation, a wardrobe of wigs and robes, and a never-ending supply of liquor to stay drunk as lord after midday. The master plan to elevate this cringe-worthy man to Speaker was developed by none other than Labor's current leader, Anthony Albanese. Despite everything, the now Labor leader knew of Mr Slipper's actions in this parliament. Mr Albanese knew Mr Slipper had slipped through the bedroom window of a former male staff member to play more than footsies under the doona while a secret video camera rolled in the corner of the room, but still didn't deter the member for Grandler from giving Mr Slipper the third most powerful job in our parliament. The white hypocrisy on display today by Labor is blood curdling. Senator O'Neill was in the lower house at the time. What did Senator O'Neill do to help protect the victim? Nothing. 
Senator Kitching also needs reminding that it was her husband, Andrew Ladenew, who wrote the appalling, hateful, false stories on his website, Vex News, that almost drove the victim to suicide. He recalled the moment he considered pulling out in front of a V-double truck and ending his life on the Bruce Highway following the torment her husband put him through for simply speaking out against a perpetrator. Christopher Pine shouldn't be left off the hook either. I'll have another 15 minute speech lined up on the former member for Sturt before this parliament is out. Let's just say the South Australian golden haired child of the Liberal Party has far too many skeletons in his own closet that many members of this Senate know all too well are a strain on their party and, and not on this place. The whole lot of you are sanctimonious pretenders. Labor has zero credibility on the matter. As for the government, it too has been compromised by its surrender to the politics of the woke and the spectacle of Brittany Higgins. The government collapsed like a house of cards before Miss Higgins' allegations, shamelessly used by political opponents to attack the Prime Minister and essentially blame him for the alleged attack. It doesn't matter who in the Prime Minister's office knew about the allegations. The inquiry into this is a politically motivated waste of time and resources. It is strictly a matter for the courts, and earlier this month it was confirmed a man had been charged in relation to the alleged attack and will face court next month. I can only assume the presumption of innocence will apply and that the evidential burden rests solely with the prosecution and accuser. I raise these issues because so much of the gender equality narrative around sexual harassment, including the Me Too movement conspicuously referenced in the Respect at Work report, denies the very concept of personal responsibility and presumption of innocence. It seems to deny that victims of sexual harassment or assault have personal agency or sovereignty. Make no mistake about this, sexual harassment and sexual assault is wrong and can have lasting negative impacts on everyone involved, especially victims. That's why we have strong laws and penalties against it. But now we're being told all victims' allegations must be believed, regardless of the specifics and regardless of the decisions and choices which led to them. So much for the presumption of innocence. It is not blaming the victim to point out that Ms Higgins, when she reported the allegations to Ms. Minister Reynolds, chose not to proceed with charges against her alleged attacker. The fact is that she could have proceeded with the matter much earlier and would have been supported in doing so. Accordingly to the orthodoxy of the work, she never had a choice and wasn't responsible for the long delay between the alleged attack and charges being laid. I don't accept that and neither do a lot of other people. We are all responsible for our own actions and we are all answerable to the law. Let's make sure we don't become answerable to the unelected Human Rights Commission by indulging its work crusade. This legislation seeks to implement six recommendations from the Respect of Work report. These include recommendation 16 to amend the Sex Discrimination Act 1984, One Nation notes and rejects the push to make this law achieve substantive equality between women and men, because as I pointed out earlier, we support equality of all opportunity, which has been demonstrated to lead to unequal outcomes between women and men. Recommendation 20 to amend section 105 of the SDA to ensure it applies to sexual harassment. Recommendation 21 to amend the Australian Human Rights Commission Act 1986 to make explicit that any conduct which is an offence under section 94 of the SDA can form the basis of a civil action for unlawful discrimination. One Nation rejects this recommendation on the basis such matters should be the subject of criminal proceedings. Recommendation 22 to amend the AHRC Act so that the President's discretion to terminate a complaints under the SDA on the grounds of time does not arise until it's been 24 months since the alleged unlawful discrimination took place. One Nation rejects this recommendation and supports the time frame remaining at the current six months. Recommendation 29 to introduce a stop sexual harassment order equivalent to the stop bullying order in the Fair Work Act 2009 and recommendation 30 to amend section 
387 of the Fair Work Act to clarify that sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to a valid reason for dismissal. We can only hope the government is far more careful in examining other recommendations in the report to ensure the Human Rights Commission cannot dictate how we must all behave. For goodness sake, it's time we stop seeing virtue in victimhood. Everyone's a victim these days. It's like we're raised in a nation of sooks. There is no virtue in being a victim, and yet it seems many of today's female role models have no credibility unless they claim they're a victim of some injustice or other, usually at the hands of a man, men or the so-called patriarchy. It's now a recommended entry on our ambitious women's <laughs> resume, contact details, education credentials, relevant work experience, personal interests, and now victim status. How far have we fallen? Our one nation stands against the indoctrination of Australia with the Human Rights Commission's dystopian vision for a society of compliant work sycophants too frightened to say what they really think. One Nation continues to, to stand for personal responsibility and integrity, the objective rule of law, presumption of innocence, equality of opportunity and equality before the law. We will continue to provide a voice to Australians disenfranchised by this government and this parliament who we are confident roundly reject this attempt to engineer our society. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, Minister. Thank you very much. And uh, I rise to sum up the debate on the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021. And I thank all senators for their contributions to the debate. The Australian government is pleased to be taking action to strengthen and streamline the national legal frameworks that deal with sexual harassment as part of its long-term strategy to preventing and addressing sexual harassment outlined in the Roadmap for Respect, Preventing and Addressing Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. The bill makes important changes to the Sex Discrimination Act 1984, the Australian Human Rights Commission Act 1986 and the Fair Work Act 2009 to ensure Australia's legal frameworks are effective in preventing and responding to sexual harassment. The changes made by the bill give effect to recommendations 16, 20, 21, 22, 29 and 30 of the Respect at Work report by clarifying that the Sex Discrimination Act covers judges, members of parliament and ministerial staff and ensuring that state and territory public servants are covered by the Sex Discrimination Act by removing the existing exemption expanding the coverage of the protection from workplace sexual harassment under the Sex Discrimination Act by picking up the broader concepts of worker and persons conducting a business or undertaking as defined under the Work Health and Safety Act to ensure all paid and unpaid workers, including volunteers and interns, are protected from sexual harassment under the Act. Introducing an express provision to clarify that sex-based harassment is prohibited under the Sex Discrimination Act, inserting a new object clause in the Sex Discrimination Act to make it clear for decision makers that the Act aims to achieve, so far as is practicable, equality of opportunity between men and women, in addition to the elimination of sex discrimination and harassment, expanding the coverage of the ancillary liability provisions in the Sex Discrimination Act to include sexual harassment and the new sex-based harassment provision amending the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to extend the time period for making a complaint under the Sex Discrimination Act, meaning that a complaint cannot be terminated on the grounds of time unless it has been 24 months since the alleged incident rather than six months, clarifying that victimising conduct can form the basis of a civil action for unlawful discrimination under the Sex Discrimination Act in addition to a criminal complaint, Clarifying that the Fair Work Commission can, under the existing anti-bullying jurisdiction, make orders to stop sexual harassment, and clarifying that sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to a valid reason for dismissal under the unfair dismissal provisions of the Fair Work Act. Whilst not recommended in the Respect at Work report, the bill also enables an employee to take up to two days of compassionate leave if the employee or the employee's current spouse 
or de facto partner has a miscarriage. The government has also made changes to the Fair Work Regulations 2009 to give effect to Recommendation 31. The Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee has reviewed the bill and recommended after feedback to defer commencement of the extended anti-bullying jurisdiction of the Fair Work Commission until no earlier than two months after royal assent. The government has moved amendments to the bill in line with this recommendation. The committee report also contains a number of dissenting recommendations and comments, many of which refer to implementing new changes which would necessi necessitate substantial policy consideration and consultation beyond that undertaken by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner in developing the Respect at Work report. In respect of a positive duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment, sex-based <coughs> harassment and discrimination under the Sex Discrimination Act, Further policy consideration and consultation is required to ensure such a duty would operate effectively without increasing complexity for those seeking to use the protections. This includes an assessment against the model work health and safety laws, which already impose a positive duty on employers to protect workers from health and safety risks, including psychosocial risks such as sexual harassment, so far as reasonably practicable. Work health and safety laws also provide for compliance, enforcement and inquiry functions to be exercised by work health and safety regulators. Employers that fail to meet obligations under work health and safety laws can be subject to prosecution and severe penalties. In respect of providing the Australian Human Rights Commission with new powers and functions in respect of sexual harassment, the government notes that it would not be appropriate to provide the Australian Human Rights Commission with a discrete function in respect of sexual harassment without first considering the Australian Human Rights Commission's broader function and roles with respect to other forms of discrimination and harassment, as well as the roles of other regulators that can already inquire into such conduct. More work is therefore required to consider the practical requirements of implementation, including funding requirements, evidence gathering, procedural fairness, privacy and penalties for non-compliance. In respect of amending the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to allow representative groups to bring representative claims to court, I note that there is already an existing mechanism to enable representative proceedings in the federal court under Part 1VA of the Federal Court of Australia Act 1976. In respect of amending the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to insert a cost protection provision consistent with the Fair Work Act, further consideration is required in light of the broad discretion already available with respect to costs in section, section 43 of the Federal Court of Australia Act 1976 and section 79 of the Federal Circuit Court of Australia Act 1999, which could include, for example, ordering parties to bear their own costs or pay another party's costs. I have also written to the Federal Courts to commend the report for their consideration, in particular the impact different cost orders may have on victims of sexual harassment. In respect of including gender identity and sex characteristics as protected attributes under the Fair Work Act, I note that this was not recommended in the Respect at Work report and would require further consideration, noting that the Fair Work Act already provides protections against unlawful termination and adverse action against action on certain discriminatory grounds, and the Sex Discrimination Act already provides protections against discrimination on other grounds of gender identity and intersex status. In respect of, a, of including a clear prohibition on sexual harassment in the Fair Work Act and a new complaints process in the Fair Work Commission for workers who experience current or historical sexual harassment, I note the government outlined in the roadmap that it will review the Fair Work system once the amendments in the bill have been implemented and their impact assessed. In respect of providing 10 days paid family and domestic leave in the national employment standards under the Fair Work Act, this bill is not the appropriate legislative vehicle to consider broad reforms to family and domestic violence leave. The Fair Work Commission is currently reviewing the family and domestic leave clause in modern awards. Further consideration of the issues of paid leave by the government will be appropriately informed by the Commission's consideration of the issue. Employers, of course, remain free to provide entitlements that suit their workplaces. In respect of implementing ILO Convention C190, the government supports the underlying principles in the convention and is considering implementation as part of the usual treaty processes, including by assessing the extent to which Australia's existing frameworks already give effect to the convention. 
In respect of implementing any further recommendations, the government will continue to act in line with its commitments in the roadmap for respect. The committee report also contains a number of dissenting recommendations and comments which relate to amendments to the bill. In respect of the requirement that conduct be seriously demeaning, among other things, to meet the new definition of sex-based harassment that would be inserted into the Sex Discrimination Act by the bill, I note that this requirement was chosen to reflect the case law on sex-based harassment and following stakeholder consultation to ensure the provision only captures conduct that is more serious or repetitive. The government's view is that there is a need for clarity about the level of conduct that should be prohibited and made unlawful in federal anti-discrimination law. In respect of the language of the new objects clause for the Sex Discrimination Act that would be implemented by the bill, this drafting reflects the government's commitment in the roadmap for respect that equality of opportunity between men and women, in addition to the elimination of discrimination, underpins the operation of the Sex Discrimination Act. This language acknowledges that more affirmative actions, in addition to the elimination of discrimination and harassment, are required to achieve substantive equality. In respect of broadening stop sexual harassment orders to cover sex-based harassment, I note that under the Fair Work Commission's anti-bullying jurisdictions, the definitions of bullying and sexual harassment are canvassed broadly enough to capture sex-based harassment. Where sex-based harassment constitutes sex discrimination and is not otherwise captured as bullying or sexual harassment, there are existing anti-discrimination mechanisms in Australia that provide a right of recourse to individuals who have been subject to discriminatory behaviour. In clarifying that sex-based harassment can amount to a valid reason for dismissal, under the Fair Work Act, the bill implements recommendation 30 of the report, which is to clarify that sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to a valid reason for dismissal. In summary, the bill will ensure all Australians are protected from workplace sexual harassment by expanding the scope of existing sexual harassment prohibitions, promoting clarity for employers and workers, and reducing procedural barriers for sexual harassment complaints. And on that basis, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Senator McAllister. Uh, I understand that there is not support for this across the chamber, and Labor won't be call calling a division. But I do wish, obviously, to record our support for the second reading amendment, and others may wish to do the same. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seward. Thank you. That's exactly what I would like to do. I indicate the green support for this amendment. Thank you very much, Senator Seward. I am not seeing anybody else trying, seeking to clarify their positions on the screens. Um, I understand a uh, Senator Seward. I rise to move on behalf of Central uh, Alliance the, sorry, their amendment on sheet 1360. As a second reading amendment. As a second Senator reading Seawitt. amendment. Sorry. Thank you. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt on behalf of Centre Alliance be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. <laughs> Senator Seawitt. Could you, uh, could hands up please record the green support for this amendment? Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator McAllister. I wish to register that Labor support for the amendment. Thank you, Senator McAllister. I, uh, the question is rather that the qu bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Deputy President. Oh, um, apologies, Senator Griff. You're seeking the um, Senator Patrick. You're seeking the call. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Mac and Deputy President. I just want to have my uh, support recorded for that second reading amendment. Thank you. It is so recorded. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 and for other purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. And Minister. Uh, thank you very much. In the first instance, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum la relating to the government amendment to be moved by this bill. And uh, I also therefore seek leave to move government amendments on sheet QL 186. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. 
Uh, in relation to this amendment on sheet QL186, what it does, I have already articulated uh, in my summing up speech, is it gives effect to the recommendation uh, of the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee report on the bill by delaying applications being made under the changes to the bullying provisions in the Fair Work Act until two months after the bill commences. Uh, this recommendation was in response to concerns raised by the Fair Work Commission in its submission to the Senate Committee about its capacity to successfully implement the changes to its anti-bullying jurisdiction, uh, given it anticipates an increase in applications when the changes make effect. The committee obviously took on board uh, that feedback from the Fair Work Commission, made the recommendation, uh, and the government is more than happy to move that. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, Look, I note that this is in fact the only amendment that the government will be seeking to move during this period of committee consideration. And I think that's just worth reflecting on for a moment. Because the sorry history of this legislation is this. The government sat on a report that it had commissioned into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. It commissioned this report and then it sat on it for a full year, at least a year in fact, because all the indications are that an early draft was given to them even months before it was formally tabled. Now, Mr Porter, for reasons he's never bothered to explain, didn't think that this was a matter worthy of his attention. And in fact, when I asked questions about this in Senate estimates of the department, they rather shamefacedly revealed, and I, I, I feel for the department actually, that in an entire year, an entire year, the person that Mr Morrison thought suitable to be the Attorney General had not bothered to speak to Commissioner Jenkins about her work. Now, Mr Porter has never actually explained why it was that he took so little interest in sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. Never bothered. Never put that on the record. But I think many of us would have our own theories about why this was of so little interest to Mr Porter. Finally, scandal after scandal after scandal has forced this government to engage with the questions that face Australian women. Tens of thousands of women mobilised around the country to demand that their interests be observed, to demand that the government start to engage with the reality that every woman in this country understands, that Australian women's working lives are not equal, that Australian women are subject to too much violence at home and at work, that there is too much discrimination and people have had enough. Well, what was Mr Morrison's response to all of this? It was to hide inside. It was to refuse to engage with the thousands of women who made their way to the grounds of this place to voice their consent, their dissent and their concern that the government does not respond to their interests. Scandal after scandal after scandal and we finally get a response to the Respect at Work Act. The government's response Claimed. Their headline claim was to have accepted all 55 recommendations. But when we actually go through the implementation roadmap, that's not what's there. That's not what is there at all. We see merely mouth responses, except in principle. Note, note, but insert caveat, which in fact negates the substance of the recommendation from Commissioner Jenkins. And then the legislation before us does not even fulfil the promises that are made in the roadmap. So my question to the minister is this. Why have so few of Commissioner Jenkins' recommendations actually been reflected in this legislation? Why do Australian women have to wait? Senator Cash, the Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the government agreed in full in principle or in part 
um, or noted all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report in the roadmap for Respect. Uh, only 15 of the 55 recommendations propose specific amendments to federal legislation. Many of the remaining recommendations were directed to state and territory governments, independent agencies, regulators and the private sector, recognising the whole of community approach required for real change outlined in the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins' Respect at Work report. In addition to developing this bill, the Commonwealth or the Morrison government has already taken significant steps to implement other recommendations from the Respect at Work report. Uh, these include establishing the Respect at Work Council to improve coordination, consistency and clarity across the legal and regulatory frameworks, progressing work on recommendations requiring joint action through intergovernmental meetings such as National Cabinet, the meetings of Attorney General, the Women's Safety Task Force and the Work Health and Safety Ministers. Uh, in the 2021-22 budget, we've committed over $20.5 million to implementing the roadmap for respect. Uh, we're also, as you'd be aware, amending the Fair Work regulations in response to Recommendation 31 of the Respect at Work report. The bill itself makes key amendments that would immediately strengthen the overarching legal framework with respect to sex discrimination and harassment. The government has prioritised those reforms which could be implemented quickly and easily. More complex forms, as I've already articulated in my summing up speech, will require additional consideration and consultation. This was actually recognised by the committee, uh, who recommended that the bill be passed. The amendments in the bill are informed by extensive consultation, including targeted consultation on a draft version of the bill prior to its introduction, public consultation by the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee, and extensive public consultation undertaken by the Australian Human Rights Commission in developing the Respect at Work report. Senator McAllister. Oh, please. Oh, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm sorry that I need to make this kind of a contribution at, at this point of time because I think there was so much promise, so much hope, and so much uh, passion and energy for a wholesale change to the outcomes for Australian women at work that was possible. And I stand as a member, a, a female member of the great Australian Labor Party on the back of the history of this great party to make safe workplaces a reality in this country. The Australian Labor Party, for its ent entire 120-year history, has been about the life of workers and their protection in the workplace. Now, it might have been shearers and miners who gave breath to our extraordinary political force so long ago, and I dare say they could scarcely imagine the kind of society successive generations have created. But they could see the common strong thread of workers' rights that links us back to those who sat under that tree of knowledge. And I want to point <clears throat> to a very important, relatively short document that sits at the back of the report from the Senate Committee, the Education and Employment Legislation Committee, Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill of 2021. It's a shorter document than I hoped it might be, but the fact is the inquiry into this very important bill was unbelievably short. After the government under Christian Porter delayed any response to this remarkable report here, hundreds and hundreds of pages with thousands of consultations clearly setting out a roadmap of a kind that was indicated to this government, <clears throat> we had no action. And when we finally got to the point where something was to be done, and I will acknowledge uh, Senator Cash in her new role actually you know, blew the dust off the, the government's copy of this and got on with the job of doing something. When it finally got to the moment of action, this government have been found wanting. 
The short inquiry forced contributors to provide their response to this parliament in the shortest of time. The short inquiry truncated two days, drew from witnesses evidence that indicated that they had barely had time to provide a response to the government's legislation. In fact, the government prompted action where we received, after the inquiry, confidential and I won't reveal them, but confidential reports from people who wanted to participate, peak bodies that wanted to participate, that were so caught, cut short in their capacity to respond that they ended up not being able to fully interrogate the piece of legislation that the government is advancing. So we have to characterise what's happened here as the do-nothing response and then let's get this sorted in a hurry response. Now, neither of those actually lead to proper, careful legislation. And Labor, in the course of this debate this morning, are going to move a significant number of amendments that I encourage the crossbench, the Greens and the senators on the crossbench to really have a good look at and support, because this moment's not going to come again. The report, the no action, the legislation, and the fanfare that's going to go with this that says basically the government accepted all 55 recommendations, it's all good here. We've sorted the problem of the issue of sexual discrimination and harassment at work. That's what the headline takeaway is going to be. The government did this. But they didn't. They haven't. At the back of the report that I'm referring to, there is, of equal length, the Labor senator's dissenting report. And for people who really want to know what the government are doing or, lack, or, or the lack of what they're doing, that dissenting report will give you the outline of what's missing. What's missing? Senator Cash, in her contribution. Uh, in response to Senator McAllister's question, indicated, again, support for 55 recommendations. But Senator McAllister has already well, well articulated the reality that it was a mealy-mouthed uh, response to those 55 recommendations. And participants in the inquiry made it very, very clear that the government is not accepting all 55 recommendations. So let that, let that be very clear. This document so carefully constructed by Kate Jenkins, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, this document that tells the stories of Australians who have experienced sexual harassment, who came forward, re-traumatised themselves in many occasions to retell their stories, this document is not being given full voice and full response by this government. Senator Cash has indicated in her defence, that there were 16 legislative actions that were recommended. But this government's only taking six of those. That's not a pass in anyone's book. So let's be clear about where we are today with regard to this particular matter. So I, my question to Senator Cash is that I'm sure she can see, as Labor senators see and as ordinary Australians see, that sexual harassment in the workplace is a very significant hazard. There is not only the personal suffering and pain, the cost of sexual harassment in the workplace hurts productivity in this nation. It hurts lives, it hurts productivity, it impacts negatively on businesses, it costs the Australian, a huge, Australian people a huge amount in terms of mental health and damage. Now, Labor says enough is enough. This bill would be a game changer if it had actually taken the task that was served up by Commissioner Jenkins and properly legislated this with all the resources it has as a government to create great legislation to give protection in the workplace. 
but the government seems to have squibbed it here. So my question, Senator Cash, is: <clears throat> 15 legislative actions were recommended. Why did the government only have enough courage, or give itself enough time, to get up six? Minister. Uh, well, thank you, Senator O'Neill, and I completely reject the assertions uh, that you have made in the statement uh, to the Senate. I have already articulated uh, that the government has agreed in full in principle or in part or noted all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report in the roadmap for respect. I have also articulated that only 15 of the 55 recommendations propose specific amendments to federal legislation. Um, if you've read the report, and I know that you have, uh, you would also understand that many of the remaining recommendations were directed to state and territory governments, to independent agencies, uh, to regulators, uh, to the private sector. Uh, and the reason that uh, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner uh, did this was because she recognised, as we do, and I'm sure you do as well, the whole of community approach required for real change, uh, as she has clearly articulated are in her respect for work report. As I've also already articulated, both in my summing up speech uh, and in uh, response to questions raised by Senator McAllister, uh, in addition to developing the bill, the Commonwealth has already taken significant steps to implement other recommendations from the Respect at Work report. Uh, again, as I've already articulated, but I'm happy to articulate it again, this includes establishing the Respect at Work Council to improve coordination, consistency and clarity across the legal and regulatory frameworks, uh, progressing work on recommendations requiring joint action, because many of them do uh, require joint action, uh, through intergovernmental meetings such as the National Cabinet, uh, the meeting of his, uh, meetings of attorneys general, the Women's Safety Task Force and the Work Health and Safety Ministers. Uh, I think I've already advised as well that in the 2021-22 budget uh, we've committed funding uh, to implementing the roadmap for respect and we're also amending the Fair Work regulations in response to recommendation 31 uh, of the Fair Work report. Uh, what I also presented uh, when we actually uh, provided the government's response was, as I said at the time with the Prime Minister, the bill makes key amendments that would immediately strengthen the overarching legal framework uh, with respect to sex discrimination and harassment. The government has prioritised those reforms which could be implemented quickly and easily. Uh, and in my summing up speech, I did go through a number of the amendments uh, that you proposed to move, uh, which are in relation to uh, a number of the recommendations in the Respect at Work report. And, uh, the comment that I made was more complex reforms will require additional consideration and consultation, uh, and that this was, uh, this was recognised uh, by the committee uh, who recommended that the bill be passed. Senator Seward. I draw attention to the fact Senator Waters has been wants to make a contribution. Oh, thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, this government is botching up this legislation. They botched the response to the rape of Brittany Higgins in the building uh, that you folk are now sitting. I'm, of course, remoting in. Uh, they botched up the response to the allegations of rape against a sitting cabinet member. And now they're botching. Um, a report which made very clear recommendations that were meant to be taken as a package to protect workers in their workplace. And the fact that this government is doing half the job and trying to pretend that they're doing the full job is just reprehensible. And I hope nobody is fooled by this. I think the government thinks that they want to be seen to be tackling this issue because they know they have a political problem with women. Well, is it any wonder that you have a political problem with women because you're not taking these issues seriously? Commissioner Jenkins did a comprehensive and detailed report. The key centrepiece recommendation of that report was for a positive duty on employers to provide a safe workplace for workers. It's not an outrageous concept. We have workplace health and safety laws to deliver the physical safety of workers uh, in that traditional context. 
Uh, but this recommendation shows that actually that's not working for sexual harassment. So we need an obligation on employers to provide a safe workplace. And it cited statistics that 40% of women in the workplace are being sexually harassed, 40%. And what's worse, the figures for young female workers is more than half of them have reported that they're experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace. Many of us have children in this place and many of our kids will soon be old enough to, to get their first jobs. How on earth on our consciences can we live with sending them into workplaces where more than half of them will be sexually harassed in their place of work as juniors, where they have no idea what the unwritten rules of the workplace are um, and where the burden on them to raise this issue uh, would be on their own shoulders. That's, of course, why we'll be moving amendments um, once we come to them for representative actions so that the burden isn't on one individual worker, one lone woman um, in a workplace to tackle the entire establishment within which she works. But that's another matter. If we had that obligation on employers to provide a safe workplace, many of these issues could in fact be tackled and it would drive that cultural shift. It would send that message to colleagues, to bosses, uh, to workplaces everywhere that it's not okay to sexually harass anybody at work. I mean, it's, it's frankly, it's just appalling that you've even got to make that point. Surely that should be understood. But the fact is it's not. And the rates of harassment are off the charts. And this government has the chance to fix that. And they're choosing to ignore that key recommendation. I just genuinely don't understand how they think they can get away with this. And we keep asking, uh, the opposition keeps asking, the media keep asking, why aren't you acting on this key recommendation? And yesterday we heard from, I think it was Senator Henderson, who said, oh, oh we, haven't, we haven't not acted on that recommendation, we just haven't done it yet. I think that was the, the, the nub of her contribution. And we just had Minister Cash um, again run the line that, well, they're agreed in part or in full to all of the recommendations. Well, I'm sorry, it's Coswallop. Where is the amendment to say that employers have to provide a safe workplace? Why is it the Greens and the opposition who are in fact moving that amendment jointly today? Because we understand that this isn't about politics, this is about the safety of workers and of the 51% of the population who deserve to be not harassed in their place of work. Why is it taking uh, the chamber to do the government's job for it? And why on earth is the government gonna vote against that amendment? Senator Henderson yesterday seemed to imply that you needed more time to consider that recommendation. So my question, uh, Minister, to you is, are you, really going to con uh, are you really going to draft an amendment to provide a safe workplace? Do you really, are you really asking for more time uh, after 17 months of having had this report, for more than a year of which it gathered dust in the drawer of Christian Porter? Are you really trying to tell us that you might do this in future? Because uh, frankly, we don't believe you because you've got the chance to do it today. You should have done it yourself. This should have been in your own bill. It's not. The Greens and the opposition are, are moving an amendment to say you should provide a safe workplace, that employers everywhere should have that positive duty to provide a safe workplace. Is the government really gonna vote against that? Like these issues are actually real. This is actually about making people safe right across the country. This is an issue that shouldn't be about whether or not you think this is a good political move for you in the lead up to the election. This shouldn't be about whether um, you need to win back women voters because your prime minister is so out of touch, he lives in the 1950s and think, thinks women belong in the kitchen. This is actually real. This will affect people's real lives and it will keep people safe. How can you possibly not be moving this amendment? And how can you possibly not support it when the Greens and Labor move for it to be added? We've collaborated on that amendment um, and there would be a six month period for businesses to have time to come to grips with this new requirement. There would be supporting material 
uh, drafted by the Human Rights Commission to assist employers to understand this new obligation on them and to work out what it meant for them in the range of different sized workplaces. Obviously, it would mean a lot more for a very large and well-resourced workplace than it would for a much smaller workplace. And perhaps different levels of things would have to be done uh, to provide that safe workplace, but there would be that transition period. So there's no excuse to not support the obligation to have a safe workplace and for employers to provide that for, for their staff. So my question to you is, are you really going to do more amendments? Can we, can we really believe you that you're going to tackle this at some point in future? Because you've had enough time. You haven't done the main thing that this report called on you to do to provide that safety for the 40 per cent of women who are sexually harassed in their place of work. How, how can you live with yourselves? I guess that is, in fact, my question. How can you live with yourselves knowing you've got the chance to fix this and you're going to actively block it? Probably with one nation in tow, like they always are. And we heard Senator Hanson um, describe this issue as a virtual, virtue signalling witch hunt. I mean, I, I just I had to turn my camera off because I was actually in peals of laughter at Senator Hanson's contribution. Um, it, it was just so unhinged and so straight from the playbook of the Men's Rights Association that um, it, it just beggars belief. Are you really going to gang up with One Nation to deny protection for the 40% of women in workplaces who are being sexually harassed? Minister. Uh, thank you. And I believe, Senator Waters, I've already articulated my answer uh, to many of the propositions that you've put uh, in responding to other questions uh, that have been uh, raised in the chamber in relation to what other parties do on amendments that are put forward. That is a decision for the other parties. The government has its position. Uh, what other parties do, other parties do. Um, would it assist, and I'll, I'll look to Senator McAllister for some direction, given we're going to be talking through specific amendments, if we put the government's amendment and then turn to the specific amendments so then we know exactly what we're addressing at a particular point in time, just um, would that assist? Senator McAllister. Senator Cash, I think it would, although I do believe that Senator Pratt has a more general proposition that she'd like to speak to before we do so. Senator Pratt, is that correct? <laughs> Senator Pratt. My anger at the government in relation to what's been dished up in this legislation is palpable. Minister Cash has just told this chamber that the bill represents what they could pull together quickly and easily, even though the report was handed down by Commissioner Jenkins the beginning of last year and the government had an early copy of it, over a year without responding. Now, I feel like I'm truly between a rock and a hard place today in contributing to this debate because I want to interrogate all of the outstanding issues in Commissioner Jenkins' uh, report and those recommendations in this place. However, we know we have a timetable in this place that we need to meet. We have other issues in other legislation before the parliament this week that we also need to complete in a timely way because it affects women's lives. And it's at the convenience of the government in terms of which legislation they choose to put up first as to whether we could get, for example, paid parental leave fixed, which we are again needing to fix in this place uh, later this week because this government botched that legislation by not leaving us the flexibility, leaving themselves the flexibility to fix it because of the coronavirus pandemic. They didn't leave themselves the flexibility to fix it, even though we in this place told them they should. So I know there are other important issues that affect women's lives that we need to get to to debate, which means I feel terribly, terribly truncated in all of the very substantive issues that should be able to be interrogated in a detailed way during this committee discussion. And it is entirely on the head of this government's incompetence in managing 
paid parental leave, but also in how it has handled this set of issues from the outset. When the Attorney General, Christian Porter, sat on this report so that Minister Cash is left with what can be implemented quickly and easily. There was no need for the government to treat this as an exercise in dishing up to the Senate what could be done quickly and easily. And frankly, there's an opportunity to accept amendments that could fix the bill now in line with Commissioner Jenkins' recommendations. The bill in its current form does not come even close to the comprehensive package that Commissioner Jenkins put forward. There's no positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act, and I'll frame my first question to Senator Cash now in relation to that. The government said over and over again that work, health and safety was the positive duty. Commissioner Jenkins said the onus of the Work, Health and Safety Act was not an effectively framed positive duty. The government then talked about, well, it's covered in psychosocial hazards and we'll know they need to get reformed. And then Commissioner Jenkins said, well, that's not good enough. It's not like other hazards in the workplace where you've got, for example, a positive duty to ensure that someone you've got mops up a wet floor. You know, in the workplace, wet floors will get created and you need to mop them up. But in the case of sexual harassment, it is not something that should be happening in Australia's workplaces. It is indecent behaviour. And yet, Minister Cash, the Fair Work Act, in these amendments, you do not expressly prohibit sexual harassment. I don't see why it should be framed as a positive duty when it is not something that should be occurring in Australian workplaces. Positive duties are about the course of business that you undertake in the, uh, in the case of the Work Health and Safety Act and the way it frames its positive duties. That is about getting the actual job done. It's about how you go about your main course of business and doing it safely. But sexual harassment is not something that should be occurring in Australian workplaces as a matter of course. And if you can't distinguish between how the Work Health and Safety Act should operate and how duties within the Sex Discrimination Act should operate, then heaven help us with you as the Attorney General, Minister Cash. Women in Australia, as raised by um, Commissioner Jenkins and many others, have a terrible time bringing these cases to court. And yet, you in this legislation do not allow representative groups to bring representative claims to court. You do not insert a cost protection provision consistent with Section 570 of the Fair Work Act. And you do not provide a broadened stop sexual harassment order to cover sex-based harassment extending to any circumstances connected to work. Now, in Commissioner Jenkins' report, these were well articulated as to why they need to be done. And I don't believe you've got any excuse for continuing to sit on these things as things that could not be done quickly and easily. The legislation before us does not prevent the creation of hostile work environments. And I find that incredible when you look at, frankly, what the Work Health and Safety Act and what the Fair Work Act and what our Sex Discrimination Act should be there to provide. So in relation to the positive duty, even the Minerals Council agreed. Tanya Constable of the MCA said, given the significance of the issue and the failure of existing laws to adequately address the problem, 
they would support there being a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act. So, Minister, I've got a technical question now to ask you. There are workplaces in Australia that are not covered by work health and safety laws, and so even your minimalistic argument that they're covered by the Work Health and Safety Act and the model laws is completely void. And some of that includes the workplaces where we have had sexual assault and sexual harassment in mine camps in Western Australia. So please explain to me how you are going to protect women, especially women, all Australians, but especially women, from sexual harassment in mine camps in Western Australia, in Queensland and right around the country when they're not currently covered by the Work Health and Safety Act. Minister. Thank you. And again, I will seek guidance from Senator McAllister. If it might be more appropriate, I'm happy to put the government's amendment, have that voted on, and then if you wanted to move your amendment with the Greens on the positive duty, because I think we are now, and that way then I will be able to properly respond to those questions, and then we have an amendment before the chair if that assists. Senator McAllister. Uh, Senator Cash, I'm happy for you to proceed either way. I, I, I think Senator uh, Pratt has a very specific question. You may wish to answer it now, but I would in general agree with your strategy that we want to move through the amendments. Minister. Addressing the amendment when it's put, because they will directly go to your amendment. There being no other senators contributing to debate on this question, I will put it. The question is that government amendments on sheet QL186 be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much. Chair. Um, uh, as Senator Waters has indicated in her earlier contribution, um, the Greens and Labor have separately concluded that this bill requires substantial amendment. Um, certainly from a Labor perspective, we recognise that there is only so much that can be done in a chamber when a bill with as many deficiencies as these, as this one, is presented to us. Uh, the Labor approach has been to try and move amendments which remedy the worst of the omissions and which try and deal as best we can with the recommendations made by Commissioner Jenkins in her very substantive and very significant report. One of those is the positive duty, and indeed this is at the heart of the report that was brought forward by Commissioner Jenkins. Just to put it really plainly for people who are listening at home, right now the tool we rely on to get workplaces to become safer is an individual making a complaint. Well, when surveyed, Australian women overwhelmingly say yes, they have been sexually harassed at work, often in the last 12 months. The numbers are extraordinary. And most of them don't make a complaint. Most of them don't ever tell anyone about it at all. Unfortunately, even in this building, we have stories about the consequences for women who make complaints. Women correctly apprehend that their careers, their livelihoods, their reputations are at stake when they are the complainant. And most women choose to remain silent. And the conclusion we should draw from all of those data points is that this is not an effective mechanism to make our workplaces safer. Yeah. It won't be an effective mechanism to make this parliament safer. It won't be an effective mechanism to make any of the workplaces around the country where women are seeking our support and seeking protection in this place. And so it's on that basis that 
Labor has concluded that we do wish to move here an amendment to insert a positive duty obligation onto employers, consistent with the recommendation made by Commissioner Jenkins. And, uh, Senator Waters has spoken already in her contribution so far uh, about her views on this, and this is a movement that will be moved uh, jointly by the Greens and by Labor. I want to make a few remarks um, about the drafting approach that we've taken. We are aware that we need to make sure that a positive duty does not create an unreasonable burden on employers. And so the way our amendment is drafted will ensure that, consistent with recommendation 17, the measures required to fill a positive duty must be reasonable and proportionate, taking into account factors that include the size of the person's business or operations, the nature and circumstances of the business and operations, the person's resources, the person's business and operational priorities, the practicability and cost of the measures, and all other relevant facts and circumstances. We also recognise that it will take time for employers to respond to a new obligation. And so, uh, the amendment circulated indicates that the duty would not commence for six months following the passage of the bill. That would allow employers time to ensure that they are aware of and able to comply with a new obligation to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate discrimination, sexual harassment, harassment on the ground of sex or victimisation in their workplace prior to the formal commencement of the duty. The amendment would also require the Human Rights Commission to develop guidance material for employers. This is because Labor wants to make it as easy as possible for employers to understand their obligations. The purpose of introducing a positive duty is not to make life difficult for Australian businesses. It is to make life better for Australian women. Of course, many employers across Australia are already doing the right thing. And in some parts of Australia, similar duties already exist in law. And let me tell you, these duties in those places have not brought the economy crashing to its knees. Commissioner Jenkins herself responded to concerns that the introduction of a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act could create further complexity, uncertainty and duplication by saying this. The new duty would not impose an undue regulatory burden and would have a greater chance of reducing the cost of sexual harassment to business. Similar duties have been on the books in Victoria for a decade without any adverse impact on business, and the Respect at Work Council would work to ensure the duties are clear, streamlined and easy to implement. This amendment would also implement Recommendation 18 of the Respect at Work report, which called for the Sex Discrimination Commission to be given the function of assessing compliance with the new duty and for enforcement. These powers are self-evidently necessary. They will, amongst other things, empower the Commission to inquire into an organisation's compliance with the positive duty in a prescribed range of circumstances, such as where the Commission is satisfied that there are reasonable grounds to suspect that a contravention of the duty has occurred. And the Commission would be empowered to issue compliance notices if it considers an organisation has failed to comply with the positive duty, enter into agreements or voluntary undertakings with an organisation, and make an application to the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court for an order requiring compliance with the duty. Chair, I want to acknowledge um, Senator Waters uh, for her willingness to collaborate this and again note that this is an amendment that has been circulated jointly in our names. Uh, and I seek leave now to move uh, together items one to four on sheet 1369. Uh, yes, thank you. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Now, I'll make some comments on this amendment. As Senator McAllister, this is um, an amendment that's been circulated in both of our names. And just for context, um, when the government originally said that they were going to implement all of the 55 recommendations, um, that we initially took them at their word, but frankly thought it was too good to be true, and have for months been drafting amendments to give effect to the full suite of the 55 recommendations. Uh, thankfully, uh, that meant that much of the drafting work was already done some weeks ago. Um, unfortunate that the government didn't actually do that work themselves. Uh, so I want to uh, just place on record that we um, 
have in recent times uh, on this bill uh, worked collaboratively with the opposition. Um, there's been some amendments that we thought our drafting was better, some amendments um, we thought their drafting was better. Um, we've come to the view that this is a bill that needs improvement uh, and uh, we'll be uh, collegiately moving amendments to try to fix the bill today. The most important one, though, is this one um, that Senator McAllister uh, has just moved. It stands in my name and also in hers. Um, so I also, also now move it. Uh, is to create that positive duty. Now, we've spoken a lot about this topic already because it was the key point of Commissioner Jenkins' Respect at Work report, and the government has bizarrely introduced a bill that leaves it out. Um, its absence from the bill has been described by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner herself as a missed opportunity, and the vast majority of submitters to the Senate inquiry emphasised that the positive duty was critical to achieving the objectives of the Respect at Work report. Eliminating workplace sexual harassment will take a big cultural shift and a positive duty to create and maintain a safe workplace is the best way to achieve that cultural shift. Without this positive duty, the other changes that are affected by this bill, which are, which are important improvements, albeit small ones, without this positive duty, those amendments are undermined and that it will reinforce uh, the the approach as is the case at the minute where there's a reactive um, adversarial victim complaint approach. Now, it shouldn't all be on the shoulders of one person to take on their whole workplace. It should be on the shoulders of the workplace to make sure that its workers are safe. Uh, the government has insisted all throughout the way that um, it's not necessary to have a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act because they say workplace health and safety laws already have positive duties to ensure workplace safety, but it's clearly not working. And even some of the government's own stakeholders, including the Minerals Council, pointed out that they thought those existing rules in um, workplace health and safety laws are not working for sexual harassment. It's not stemming the tide where 40% of women are being harassed sexually at work. So that's why we need um, to have a positive duty. And I want to um, just mention that uh, the importance of this, I'm sure many officers have had contact about this bill from, from young workers, from young women in particular. So many um, women contact my office with stories of workplace harassment, and I'm sure that that's, that's not just my office. The scale of the problem is undeniable and there is a need for significant change for how we tackle this problem. One of the stories that I heard recently really emphasises and underscores why we need this positive duty. A young woman um, reached out to me and I, I had a, a very heartfelt meeting with her. She started work as a casual at a large retail music chain while she was still at high school. She was 15. She would arrive at work wearing her school uniform so people knew that she was young. Um, and she'd talk about things happen, happening at school. Um, but her team leader, which was a man in his 20s, took advantage of his position and made moves on her. Uh, and they then ultimately began a secret relationship, which he, of course, urged her not to tell the boss about. Uh, she was young, it was her first job, and he was her supervisor, her much older supervisor. And when she later told management about the relationship, they didn't take the complaint seriously and they tried to tell her that she'd consented to the relationship. She became isolated at work, she lost confidence and she wondered if she'd done the wrong thing by making the complaint. Well, she hadn't done the wrong thing by making the complaint and that is an, a story that illustrates perfectly why we need a positive duty that puts the onus on employers to proactively create a safe workplace. We need that duty on employers to set clear expectations, to check in with staff and to foster an environment where young workers feel comfortable to ask questions about what's happening or to raise concerns and know that they will be listened to and believed. Employers shouldn't be able to just overlook or dismiss inappropriate behaviour and hope that no formal complaint is lodged. Um, and I might add at this point that Respect at Work uh, report also recommends more comprehensive training for young people about their workplace rights and about what they can expect in their first job and what they don't have to put up with and what behaviour is unlawful. Um, this is essential and the government should fund the development and delivery um, of such uh, training. And I, and I might add that's 
part of the reason why we supported Senator Griff's uh, second reading amendment, which calls on um, uh, working with children checks for employers who employ minors. Um, it's a shame that that, um, that amendment did not pass. Um, I'll just continue on and then I'll, and then I'll commend the amendment uh, to the chamber. The, the government seems to say that it's all too complicated to do this amendment, um, that after the report gathering dust for a year, they've somehow hastily tried to get this bill done and it's just all a bit too tricky and boy, this is a big issue and you know they just can't do it justice. Well, um, the respect at work recommendations were made after extensive consultation with business, with government, with practitioners, with unions, with workers. Commissioner Jenkins understood the complexity and indeed the complexity of the current system was one of the problems and she recommended a positive duty. The government got her report nearly 18 months ago. The time for thinking about it and hand-wringing is over. We need action. The government should support this amendment and show the women of Australia that they take their safety seriously. Any vote otherwise will be very telling. Um, these amendments uh, allow the Commission to undertake an investigation where a workplace is suspected of not meeting its positive duties. And the Commission has broad investigative powers um, and investigation powers. Employers uh, can be issued with a show cause notice. Um, they're provided advice about what is needed to meet the duty, and they're given an opportunity to set out a plan for what they would do. Uh, the Commission can accept voluntary enforceable undertakings from businesses that commit them to, to, um, to undertake improvements. And this is an approach that's worked well for other offences in the Human uh, Rights Commission Act. So where an employer's response is inadequate, if these amendments pass, the Commission could seek orders requiring certain actions to be taken by the employer, such as introducing training or implementing a clearer complaints procedure. The emphasis is supporting employers to be better employers, but with a compliance and enforcement framework that allows strong action to be taken where employers don't lift their game. This is an amendment that strikes the balance appropriately. It's an amendment that the government should have included as the centrepiece of their own bill. Um, it's an amendment that, yes, was a bit complex to draft, but after some fair consultation, it was able to be done, even in the condensed uh, time frame that the government is now working to. So I really hope that the government supports this amendment. You can't do half the job with sexual harassment. The report says you need to do all of these things to make women workers safe. The Australian public won't accept you just doing some of them and leaving out the main point. You're not going to get away with this politically and you're underselling the need for women workers to be safe in their workplace. So I, I beg the government to please do the right thing and vote for these amendments. Yes, it's got the name of the Greens and the opposition on it, but this should be above politics. We should be addressing uh, this issue to keep women safe in their workplace. This shouldn't be about whose name is on the amendment. And we urge you to please do the right thing by women in this nation and support this amendment. Senator O'Neill. Um, I just want to make a very brief contribution. I think this is a particularly important amendment. And um, I see Senator Cash nodding her head. I hope that's indicating a change of heart and a support for this positive, positive duty. For, for people who for people who don't understand the parliamentary process, the language we speak in is sometimes entirely inaccessible. But for me, this is the prevention clause. This is the prevention action to make sure that what we know that's happening in places around workplaces around this country is actually prevented by changing the cultural practices and the fulsome of a discussion that can happen if this piece, this particular amendment passes today. And I, again, I urge the crossbenchers to, to sit with us and support the amendment, because in the absence of the support for this positive duty, for the enactment of a prevention um, incentive for workplaces, we're going to continue to hear reports. And today I rise to acknowledge previous uh, evidence that I've put on the record here in the parliament. I'm particularly speaking for a young woman anonymously known as AMP Annie, who documented for me, and I read her statement into this place, about the sort of harassment that she suffered needing to change her entire career 
the, the terrible mental health journey that she is on to this day, more than a decade after her harassment. She's like so many who gave evidence to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, to the Commissioner um, Jenkins. And it's reported here on page 263 of this 900-page report, entirely accessible to the government and to the Attorney General, who, who documented here that misconduct was reported to senior management who did nothing. Reporting it to a World Health and Safety Regulator and anti-discrimination agency actually made it worse, causing more stress to me, culminating in my being forced out of my job under horrendous circumstances. The outcome of all of this for me was catastrophic. I lost my job and my income and everything I ever studied and worked for. My family was greatly affected and my life has never recovered. That could be prevented if this amendment goes through this parliament today. That is exactly the sort of thing we should be preventing, and I wholly endorse the remarks of Senator McAllister and also of Senator Waters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Minister. Thank you very much. And in relation to the amendment, the government won't be supporting the amendment. Implementing Recommendation 17 of the Respect at Work report, which very much this amendment goes towards, requires further policy consideration and consultation to examine the merits and to ensure that such a duty would operate effectively alongside existing duties that it has been acknowledged already exist under work health and safety laws and the Sex Discrimination Act, including to ensure, and this is something that Commissioner Jenkins did refer to in her report, additional complexity is not created for those seeking to use the protections. This includes an assessment against the model work health and safety laws, which already impose a positive duty on employers to protect workers, workers from health and safety risks, including psychosocial risks such as sexual harassment, so far as reasonably practicable. Work health and safety laws also provide for compliance, enforcement and inquiry functions to be exercised by work health and safety regulators. Employers that fail to meet obligations under work health and safety laws can be subject to prosecution and severe penalties. Many of the concerns outlined in the Respect at Work report were in relation to the implementation of the work health and safety framework rather than the effectiveness of the framework itself. Since the Respect at Work report was released, there has been a focus by the government and its agencies on further improving the work health and safety framework and its implementation. Key measures that we've been looking at to date include Work Health and Safety Ministers, and I have met with them and I've discussed this with them, have agreed to progress amendments to the model work health and safety regulations to deal with how to identify psychosocial risks, including sexual harassment, associated with psychological injury. A model code of practice is also being developed by Safe Work Australia to cover psychosocial health, uh, including sexual harassment. Um, as part of the budget uh, recently, ComCare uh, will deliver national forums for Commonwealth, state and territory work health and safety inspectors on sexual harassment and training for employers and managed, covered by the Commonwealth work health and safety laws, to better understand and meet their obligations in relation to sexual harassment laws. This also includes consideration of the existing vicarious liability provision in the Sex Discrimination Act, which ensures that if a worker engages in unlawful conduct, such as sex discrimination or harassment, their employers can also be held liable for sexual harassment if the employer did not take reasonable steps to prevent the conduct from occurring. This existing mechanism means that employers must take reasonable and preventative steps, such as implementing policies and providing training to minimise their potential liability should an incident occur. And just in relation to some of the issues that Senator Pratt has raised, uh, recently in May 2021, Work Health and Safety Ministers agreed to progress amendments to model work health and safety regulations to um, deal with how to identify the psychosocial risks associated with psychological injury, including sexual harassment. This was a recommendation, you'd probably be aware, uh, of the Boland Review and also the Kate Jenkins Review, and it's now been progressed by Safe Work Australia. Uh, both Safe Work Australia and Comcare have published guidance on workplace sexual harassment. Safe Work Australia has published national guidance material for persons conducting a business or undertaking, including specific guidance uh, for small business 
and advice for workers on preventing and dealing with workplace sexual harassment under the model work health and safety laws. Comcare has published guidance for employers, managers, supervisors and workers on meeting work health and safety responsibilities in relation to sexual harassment in the Commonwealth uh, jurisdiction. And as I said, uh, one of the issues that um, did arise uh, in the report uh, was in relation to actually ensuring that people understand uh, what their obligations are. And so Comcare itself, um, which as you know is the Government Work Health and Safety Regulator, uh, is now going to deliver national forums for Commonwealth, State and Territory Work Health and Safety inspectors on sexual harassment and training for employers and managers covered by Commonwealth Work Health and Safety laws to better understand and meet their obligations in relation to sexual harassment um, under the laws. Just in terms of also the complexity uh, of this particular amendment, uh, the proposed amendment does raise a number uh, of complex policy implementation and legal issues that require further consideration and consultation. Uh, and as I've already said, this includes an assessment against the model work health and safety laws which, and people have articulated this in the chamber and acknowledged this, already impose a positive duty on employers to protect workers from health and safety risks, including, as I've already referred to uh, and was picked up in both the Boland Review and the Kate Jenkins Review, uh, the psychosocial risks, uh, such as sexual harassment so far as is reasonably practicable. Um, and as I've also stated in terms of the complex policy and the implementation, um, it includes consideration of the existing vicarious liability provisions in the Sex Discrimination Act, which ensures that if a worker engages in unlawful conduct, such as sex discrimination or harassment, their employer can also be held liable if the employer did not take those reasonable steps to prevent the conduct from occurring. Significant thought also uh, does need to be given before providing the Australian Human Rights Commission with the additional inquiry and regulatory powers for discrimination and harassment in addition to its existing dispute resolution uh, function. Just in relation to this, numerous uh, issues do require consideration. Uh, there are potential legal issues uh, relating to the separation of powers, regulatory enforcement powers and functions, the complaints handling and dispute resolution of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Uh, we also need to provide further consideration to the potential alignment with the Regulatory Powers Act and other administrative law issues such as appropriate review and enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and a proper assessment does need to be undertaken to ensure powers and penalties are proportionate and appropriate and appropriately trigger uh, the Regulatory Powers Act. Uh, and a proper review and appeal mechanisms uh, will need to be put in place. Thank you, Minister. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, I've listened carefully to your answer. And if I understand it, your argument about why you're not implementing a positive duty today goes something like this. We don't need to because really it's already a workplace health and safety obligation. And even if we did do it, it would be very complicated and it would take a lot of time. I want to make a few comments about both of those arguments because I don't think either of them stand up. In Commissioner Jenkins' report, she talks about her attempts and the Commission's attempts to engage with the workplace health and safety regulators. And she says this, the Commission sought to engage with all Commonwealth state and territory workplace health and safety regulators within the framework, both individually and together as part of the heads of the workplace safety authorities. And get this, and this is a direct quote from the report. The heads of the workplace safety authorities informed the Commission that it would not provide a joint submission to the inquiry and that heads of the workplace safety authorities would provide any submissions they have through other government agencies in their jurisdiction or directly to the Commission. Well, what then happened? Were there any direct submissions to the Commission? Just one. Just one from WA. The only workplace health and safety regulator to make a submission was WorkSafe WA. And what did they say in their submission? They said, in Western Australia, the EOC has specific legislation to address complaints of sexual harassment. As a safety regulator, WorkSafe is not sufficiently resourced and does not have the expertise to adequately address sexual harassment matters. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
And the thing is that that is the experience of everyone who works at the coalface of representing women in workplaces who experience harassment. Yeah. Here's a quote from the report again from one of the submitters. Australian workplace health and safety agencies have shown remarkable blindness or reluctance to acknowledge harassment as a workplace hazard that warrants their attention. Unless and until workplace health and safety agencies acknowledge and address this gap, this whole system that is explicitly designed to protect workers from harm will continue to fail to protect workers from sexual harassment. It's a pretty clear warning. But there's no indication in this bill that it's a warning that's been heeded by the government. And so I do have some questions for you, Minister. Do you consider that the workplace health and safety arrangements at the moment are adequate and are being used appropriately to protect women in Australian workplaces from harassment? In your response to the report, you indicated that the government will assess whether amendments would create further complexity, uncertainty or duplication in the overarching legal framework. How long do you expect this assessment to take? Will you be assessing whether such amendments would increase the level of protection for Australian women? Or are you just assessing whether or not it's too much of a burden for employers? Who is undertaking this assessment? And when will it be made public? Minister? Uh, thank you, Senator McAllister. And I believe I've articulated um, the reasons that the government is not at this point in time implementing recommendation 17 of the Respect at Work report, uh, and in particular the work uh, that we are doing, and myself with the Work Health and Safety uh, Ministers, uh, in terms of strengthening those laws, the positive duty and the understanding on both employers and regulators of their role under the positive duty uh, in relation to the Work Health and Safety Act. Uh, one of the issues that I've also raised and I've already discussed uh, with the Work Health and Safety Ministers uh, is in relation to, and it was both the Boland Review uh, and the Kate Jenkins Review, in terms of the psychosocial risks uh, such as sexual harassment. What we've already agreed to do to date, and this is the work that we're progressing uh, to go to uh, the question that you raised, uh, in terms of strengthening the work health and safety elements, is when I met with the work health and safety ministers, and I did raise this with them, they have already agreed uh, to progress amendments to the model work health and safety regulations uh, to deal with how to identify the psychosocial risks, including sexual harassment, associated with the psychological injury that can be suffered. So that is already something that I've met with the work health and safety ministers on, and they have already agreed, and in fact they unanimously agreed, uh, to commence in progressing uh, this work. Uh, Safe Work Australia has already commenced its preparation in terms of the model code of practice uh, being developed to cover the psychosocial health, including sexual harassment. Uh, and as also, I have indicated uh, that as part of the recent budget, uh, one of the issues that was raised, um, and you've actually gone there yourself in relation to the understanding of, in particular, uh, work health and safety inspectors and employers and manage, uh, managers, their actual understanding of what their role is under the work health and safety law. So in terms of what the federal government is able to do, Comcare will now deliver the national uh, forums for Commonwealth, state and territory work health and safety inspectors on sexual harassment and training for employers and managers covered by the Commonwealth work health and safety laws uh, to ensure they have that better understanding uh, of what their obligations are and meet their obligations. And that's the key thing. They need to be able to meet their obligations uh, in relation to sexual harassment uh, under the laws. Uh, so at this point in time, I have already commenced work in relation to that better understanding of the Work Health and Safety um, Act and the obligations under it that go directly to what Kate Jenkins had referred to in her report. Thank you, Minister. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Minister, 
In that answer, you indicated that you're undertaking work to improve the workplace health and safety framework. I understand that. That is not what Kate Jenkins recommended. I think you understand that also. In your response to the report, uh, the Respect at Work report, you noted um, that a positive duty already exists. I think that's disputed by the evidence that was before uh, the Commissioner. But you did say that you would assess whether amendments would create further complexity, uncertainty or duplication. Uh, might I conclude from your answer that that assessment is completed, that you've got no intention at all of creating a positive duty, that you're just kicking it off into the long grass. You've already made a decision that these issues are to be dealt with through workplace health and safety arrangements and you, you have no interest in progressing this at all, because I think it would be better to be upfront about that. Minister? No, Senator McAllister, that is not what I said. Senator McAllister. Minister, when then will you be in a position to inform the public and the parliament about whether or not a positive duty will be legislated by your government? Minister. Well, as I've already stated, I've already outlined the work that we are doing in relation to the positive duty and the better understanding of it in relation to the Work Health and Safety Act. I've already met with the relevant ministers and we are already progressing that work. Uh, we need to see today whether or not this bill passes, in what form that this bill passes, and then we then need to understand the impact of the amendments that we are making today. So this is an evolving process. As I've already stated, this is the government's first response to uh, the Kate Jenkins report, and there is other work that is ongoing. I, I think I've been very upfront about that. Senator McAllister. Uh, Minister, you say there's work ongoing. Do you have any sense of the timetable? Minister. Well, again, uh, we need to progress the work that we're already progressing in relation to the Work Health and Safety Act. We need to see if this bill passes today and in what form it passes. We need to understand then the impact of the amendments that we are making on both the Work Health and Safety Act and the Sex Discrimination Act. What we need to do is ensure we get this right. If we create more confusion for employers or for regulators, we actually will not be doing justice to the Kate Jenkins report. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I appreciate the need for careful consideration of a big piece of policy reform. It would have been better, I think we can all agree, had such careful consideration commenced on 29 January 2020, which is, of course, when this was submitted to government. Um, I'm asking you, though, for some sort of work plan, some sort of timetable. Your department, on your own account and perhaps other departments in government, are doing some work on workplace health and safety issues. There will be an internal work plan. There will be a process of consultation. There will be a series of internal milestones and there will be a completion date. This bill, I imagine, will pass through this chamber, at least, this week. All of the things that you say will have been concluded. You'll, you, you'll have a piece of legislation. Perhaps it will be amended. Perhaps it will be not. But you'll be in a position to make that assessment and continue that work. When will it be finished? Minister? Well, again, Senator McAllister, I've addressed the question. Senator Pratt. Minister Cash, um, you haven't... I need to ask you again about the Work Health and Safety Act and its application over all workplaces because it doesn't cover everyone currently. I know, for example, uh, that mine sites uh, and in production in, in Queensland and WA aren't currently covered, and they have had some significant incidents of rape and sexual harassment take place. In the meantime, Minister McGurk from Western Australia submitted to our committee inquiry that she supported very strongly a positive duty as outlined by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. It is not mutually exclusive to making progress with the state governments on improving the work, health and safety 
regime. So first of all, I want to ask you, Minister, specifically about the application of the Work Health and Safety Act to accommodation existing in remote mine sites, Queensland, WA and in other jurisdictions. Minister. Senator Pratt, they leave the BA specific industry model code that they adhere to. We also then have the model laws, as you know, at a Commonwealth level agreed with the varying states and territories, and it's up to them whether or not they themselves then implement uh, the model laws. Senator Pratt. Okay, so, Minister, as you've just highlighted, the model laws are not binding. Each state has to decide what they implement. And, in effect, there are parts of the country that sit entirely outside those model laws currently. There are industries that sit outside those model laws. And, as a result, there is absolutely no overarching positive duty to prevent sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. Minister? No. Sandra O'Neill, do you still want the call? Thank you very much. I just, um, I just draw the senator attention, attention to um, a comment by Senator McAllister about the work capacity of the agencies that are supposed to be creating safe workplaces. And uh, I know that Senator Pratt and I sit for many, many hours in estimates uh, with Safe Work Australia, asking questions about what's going on. Um, we hear particularly from culturally and linguistic diverse communities and their representatives, predominantly unions, coming forward to say, uh, to say that people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are not getting information, uh, they are not being supported, they are often in insecure and vulnerable work, uh, and they are not getting the support that they need to understand what a safe workplace in Australia looks like and are particularly subject to uh, cultural intimidation when they shift from another context to Australia and they don't understand what's going on in their workplaces. So in terms of financial support for the agencies to do the kind of work that you say is somewhere in a work plan somewhere that we need to trust, what increased capacity can Australians be confident of, of occurring to back up the claims that you're making here with regard to this piece of legislation today? Minister. Thank you. And as I said in relation to the recent budget, Comkey will deliver national forums uh, for Commonwealth, State and Territory Work Health and Safety Inspectors on Sexual Harassment and Training for employers and managers covered by the Commonwealth Work Health and Safety Laws to better understand and meet their obligations uh, in relation to sexual harassment um, under the laws. In relation to the point that Senator Pratt was making, I'd also just say to Senator Pratt, just for her consideration, um, there is an existing vicarious liability provision, as she would know, in the Sex Discrimination Act, uh, which ensures that if a worker engages in unlawful conduct such as sex discrimination or harassment, their employer can also be held liable if the employer did not take reasonable steps uh, to prevent the conduct from occurring. And I have some more information that I can provide with you. Just in terms of, again, going to what Senator Pratt was saying, what the bill also will do is clarify that a complaint of victimisation under the Sex Discrimination Act can also form the basis of a civil action as well as a criminal action uh, in response to Recommendation 21 uh, of the Respect at Work report. And I think that does assist Senator Pratt in the issue she was raising. Senator McAllister. Uh, I just have one final question, and this will, from the Labor perspective, I think we'd be ready to move on. Um, I understand that Senator Hanson has given an indication that she'll be voting with the government on this amendment and indeed all of the amendments. Senator Hanson's contribution in the second reading speech was to indicate that she thought we were raising a nation of sooks. She characterised women who experience violence and raise their voice about it as people who enjoy victimhood. And she said that this was an emerging criteria on a professional woman's CV. 
to indicate the status of victim that they actually are. On each of those points, a nation of sooks, victimisation and victimhood on CVs, will the minister repudiate Senator Hanson's views? Minister? Well, Senator McAllister, Senator Hanson's views are just that. Senator Hanson's views, I've clearly articulated the government's views uh, in relation to both the second reading speech and the summing up speech. Any further questions? Senator Walters, are you wishing to make a comment? No? In that case, we have before us um, Amendment 1 to 4, Sheet 1369, revised by leave together, that, that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the no's have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Bells. So the question is that uh, amendments one to four on sheet one three six nine. So the question is that sheets one, uh, amendments one to four on sheet one three six nine, uh, moved together by leave, standing in the name of the Australian Greens and the opposition. The question is the amendments be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order, there being 12 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Oh, Senator Seawitt. I think Senator Waters seeks leave to or wants to move her next set of amendments. Thank you. Senator Waters. Senator Waters, you've uh, got the call. Yes, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I was happy to proceed in the order of the grey. I know we've jumped about a bit so far. Um, and I might just clarify that in the spirit of collaboration, given that uh, the Greens had amendments drafted to give effect to the full suite of the 55 recommendations of the Respect to Work report, um, but uh, the opposition also subsequently had some drafted also. I think this has been done procedurally, but I'll just flag that we will not be moving uh, Greens amendments on sheets 1370. 1368, 1372, um, not because we don't think those things anymore, uh, just because the opposition will be moving amendments uh, to very similar effect, um, either with tweaks that we support or just in the same form as we were going to anyway. So for, uh, for cleanness and consistency in the eternal hope that the crossbench will uh, support the amendments. We wanted to have a less confusing approach. So uh, if I can uh, action those things, and I might then take the opportunity to then move uh, the first of our amendments, which is uh, on sh uh, one to four on sheets 1371 revised um, by leave together. Now, these pertain uh, oh, this, to costs. This leave is granted, Senator Waters. This leave granted. Leave is granted, Senator Waters. Thanks very much. Um, so these amendments pertain to costs and providing costs protections for complainants. Uh, as we all know, financial risks are a significant barrier to seeking justice, uh, in particular to workers making complaints. Uh, and I note that in the Senate inquiry into this bill, rushed though it may have been, the Women's Legal Centre ACT said uh, we're disappointed that the bill fails to provide a cost protection provision for complainants. Many women worry that they will not be believed and that they'll be forced to pay the other side's legal fees. In the case of large businesses and government departments, these fees can be so significant that the average person would face financial ruin. It's no surprise that many women decide not to take this gamble." End quote. Uh, the recommendation in the Respect at Work bill to provide cost protection was justified. It was unequivoc unequivocal um, and it was very sensible. Uh, the government's response was to say that they would review cost procedures in sexual harassment matters to ensure they're fit for purpose. 
But as the Human Rights Law Centre's Kieran Pender said, we don't need more reviews. We need to make sexual harassment litigation a viable remedy for targets of harassment. Um, they continue, the Respect at Work report offered a simple technical measure that would materially improve the Sex Discrimination Act, and the government said, we'll think about it. Well, had 17 months to be thinking about it. They thought a long time about the uh, positive duty, and they're not going to do that either. So, um, you know, it, frankly, I wish they'd just be honest about saying they don't actually care about fixing this issue. They just want to look like they're fixing some of it because there's an election coming. Um, but honesty is sadly too much to ask for in Parliament, it seems. Anyway, coming back to the substance of this particular amendment, the decision to make a complaint against someone in your workplace will always be difficult and costs should not be a factor in that difficult decision. Um, our amendment would uh, prevent costs being awarded as a matter of course, but it would still leave it open for the Commission to make cost orders if they're satisfied that the complaints were frivolous or vexatious. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a theme here by uh, the likes of the Pauline Hanson One Nation Party that women make this stuff up. Well, in fact, the reality is, is that so many more women who are uh, sexually harassed in their workplace don't make complaints precisely because they fear they won't be believed um, and because they fear they'll end up having to pay enormous costs. So they just suck it up, uh, put up with it, um, or decide to move on and seek other work. And inevitably, the harasser continues on to the next person or gets a, gets a promotion. Um, so that's why we have a, a whole bevy of amendments to this bill. This one in particular is about cost protection. It's an important amendment, um, and I commend it to the chamber. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, Labor is supporting this amendment, um, and indeed, uh, as Senator Waters has indicated, this is also an area where Labor sought to have changes made to the bill. Um, Commissioner Jenkins couldn't have been clearer. She said, in Recommendation 25, amend the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to insert a cost protection provision consistent with Section 570 of the Fair Work Act 2009. That's what the amendment does. Now, this recommendation was endorsed by a number of submitters to the bill um, and to the submitters to the inquiry, including the ACTU and the Law Council. Now, the government's response to the Respect at Work report says this is agreed in principle. And it's typical of the weaselly approach that was adopted in responding to the report, because there's pretense, a total pretense that all 55 recommendations are accepted, because the government accepted this in principle and then went on to explain all the ways where it actually considers that it is not necessary. This government is so arrogant that it thinks it knows better. It knows better than the people that Kate Jenkins spoke to when she conducted this piece of work, which everybody likes to describe as a landmark piece of work. Knows better than the people who submitted to the Senate inquiry that said cost orders were ab cost protection was absolutely critical, so that people weren't frightened by bankruptcy from pursuing their claim, from pursuing justice. Why this can't be pursued now immediately has never been made clear. This recommendation and the amendment before us is based on an existing provision in the Fair Work Act. It's not complicated. The government could have drafted this amendment in an hour. But instead they're squirming away from it, squirming away from it, kicking it into the long grass for some review at some future time. Maybe later is not an answer. It is not an answer for the women who deserve access to justice who deserve to have their claims heard and to deserve to do so free from fear that they will be financially persecuted and ruined if they dare to raise their voice and dare to see the, seek the protection of the court. I ask the government to think about this, to reconsider their position and to consider voting in support of this amendment today to ensure that Recommendation 25, sitting there in the report, is implemented. Thank you, Senator McAllister.
Minister. Uh, thank you. And I'll be brief. Um, in the interest of time, the government acknowledges that the courts already have a broad discretion to award costs under their own legislation. Uh, this could include, for example, ordering parties to bear their own costs or pay another party's costs. There are actually mixed views on whether the model recommended by the Respect at Work report and adopted by this proposed amendment, uh, based on section 570 of the Fair Work Act, will actually address the issues identified with the current model. Uh, for example, as part of the consultation process uh, for the Respect at Work report, Victoria Legal Aid outlined their um, view that this model will still provide a disincentive for applicants, given it would not enable them to recover their costs, even if they're successful. Um, as outlined in the government's response, the government will review cost procedures in sexual harassment matters to ensure they're fit for purpose, taking into account the issues raised by the report. Um, as I've already articulated, my department does already liaise uh, with the courts in consideration of this matter, and it will continue to do so. I have also written to the federal courts uh, to commend the uh, report for their consideration, and in particular, the impact different cost orders may have on victims of sexual harassment. I intend to put the motion. So the question is <clears throat> that uh, Amendment 1371, 1 to 4, is moved by Senator Waters by leave together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required? No. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat>
stop the bells. So the question is that <coughs> amendments one to four on sheet 1371, as moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 12 ayes and 14 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Seward. President, I think Senator Waters wishes to move on to her next amendment. Thank you. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, um, Deputy President. Um, I now wish to move uh, Green's Amendment 1 on sheet 1367. Um, now this, in a, this is an amendment that amends the objectives of the Sex Discrimination Act to include substantive gender equality. Now, recommendation 16 of the Jenkins report says uh, that the objects of the act should be amended to achieve substantive equality between men and women. But what the government did when they allegedly implemented this recommendation was actually change the wording and they've massively watered it down. The government's version in the current bill um, says that the new objective should be to achieve substantive equality of opportunity between men and women so far as is practicable. So it's watered down not just on one level, but on two. So it's no longer substantive equality. It's just equality of opportunity. And it's only so far as is practicable. What an absolute crock. I mean, you might as well have not bothered to move this amendment and, or, at all, because you've watered down the recommendation so much that it's essentially meaningless. Uh, but I suppose that's what we've come to expect, uh, expect from this government. Many uh, submitters to the inquiry, including the Human Rights Commission themselves, were concerned that this uh, drafting, the government's drafting, does not reflect the intent of the Respect at Work recommendations, recommendation 16. Um, the Law Council uh, recommended deleting the qualification of so far as is practicable. I strongly support that. Uh, the department's explanation for why they'd changed the wording was that it was beyond the scope of the Sex Discrimination Act to fix structural inequality. I mean, it frankly leaves me speechless. And like so much about this bill, it just entirely misses the point. Objectives don't create positive duties to deliver on aspirational goals, but they do require decision makers to consider those objects um, when they're exercising discretion uh, and taking decisions made under the Act. They need to make sure that the decision that they're taking under the Act will, um, will further uh, the objects of that Act, or at least not hinder the achievement um, of that goal. But this government just can't come at saying the words, achieve substantive equality between men and women. Maybe they just don't think that that's what society should be aspiring to do. Um, they just want equality of opportunity so far as is practicable. I mean, honestly, you just, <laughs> it just typifies this government. This sexism is so ingrained in this government, in this 1950s Morrison government, that they can't even cope with the concept of substantive equality. Structural gender equality is not simply about denial of opportunity 
It reflects how discrimination and stereotypes and other factors can affect people's ability and capacity to take up opportunities. A goal of substantive equality recognises that opportunities might need to be offered differently in some circumstances in order to overcome structural barriers and to achieve substantive equality. Um, but I think this government just doesn't understand structural inequality. As far as they're concerned, uh, you know, it's all up to the individual and you know, if you work hard enough, you can overcome anything. They are so imbued with privilege that they just can't even fathom the concept of structural inequality. Uh, and they've made that abundantly clear in the drafting of this objects clause. So um, we'll be moving, I, I now move that amendment to uh, restore the wording that the Human Rights Commission initially proposed, that this government has sought to water down on not one but two turns. Um, it's, it's, their version is an absolute crock. So I, I move Greens Amendment 1367 to fix up the wording so that it does what the Human Rights Commission report recommended, which is the whole point of having this bill that the government keeps trying to wreck. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And Labor supports this amendment and indeed uh, it is one of the many questions where Labor had also drafted amendments and uh, we agreed to proceed with the Greens moving it on this in this occasion. Some months ago, I listened with interest to what most people described as a train crash of an interview where the Prime Minister uh, had a very long interview on a current affair where he explained his shock and surprise to learn that Australian women were subject to discrimination and indeed some very frustrating experiences at work. Um, that was galling enough. But the thing I observed in this extended interview that the Prime Minister offered to a current affair was the Prime Minister is willing to say the word respect some 14 times. 14 times. But in an interview that was ostensibly about the interests of Australian women, he could not bring himself to mention the word equality once. Not once. And I have a real question, actually, about the Prime Minister's commitment to equality for Australian women, because it rarely features in anything that he says. He's comfortable with respect, and I can see why that might be. It's possible to be perfectly polite, to be respectful to a person that you do not consider your equal at all. If you're a very powerful man, indeed, it's quite possible to do so. Ask Julia Banks how the Prime Minister treated her. So I'm not surprised that this government, which has had eight long years to think about what it might do for women, balks at the possibility of inserting an object of true equality between men and women into one of its acts. Because the recommendation in the Respect at Work report, which again the government pretends to accept, is very, very clear. It says amend the Sex Discrimination Act to include the objects include to achieve substantive equality between men and women. Pretty straightforward. And what do we get instead? This mealy mouthed thing to achieve so far as practicable equality of opportunity between men and women. We used to tell a joke, you know, about you know, a moderate's you know, chant at a rally. What do we want? Gradual reform in due course. This couldn't be sillier. This couldn't be a sillier amendment. We'll go for equality but only a quality of opportunity, as far as is practicable. What does that mean? That is actually my question to the minister. Why do we need to insert that qualification? Is it to reflect the view put by the Prime Minister some time ago on an International Women's Day, that he wants men to, women to rise, but not if it's at the expense of men? Is that what this qualification actually means? Why is it in here? Why is it necessary to insert into a piece of legislation something as mealy-mouthed as this? 
Because, as Senator Waters has explained, the objects of the Act don't require a positive duty to absolutely obtain those objects in every decision. They are really, merely a guiding factor in interpreting what the provisions of the Act require of the decision maker. So, Minister, two things. Why is the qualification, so far as practicable, necessary in this context? And what does the government consider to be the difference between substantive equality and equality of opportunity? Thank you, Senator McAllister. Minister. Uh, and, and thank you. And the term equality of, op equality of opportunity was used because it better aligns with the existing approach of Australia's anti-discrimination law frameworks. Uh, and in particular, it means that every opportunity that is afforded has to be won on an equal basis. Substantive equality, on the other hand, requires affirmative actions by workplaces and is actually a departure from the complaints-based model that currently exists. The drafting is comparable to existing objects clauses in other anti-discrimination legislation. Thank you, uh, Minister. So the question is that uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1367, as moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. <coughs> Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1367 is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order. There being 12 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator McAllister, are you seeking the call? Deputy President, I am seeking uh, to. Oh, my apologies. I'm seeking to move the items uh, on 1405, items one to six, by leave together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, the amendments on sheet 1405 implement an important but, of course, again ignored recommendation of the Respect to Work report. They create expressly a prohibition of sexual harassment in the Fair Work Act. For clarity, the Act which governs the workplaces of Australians. And it strikes me it is extremely strange but perhaps not surprising that the government has failed to accept or implement this very important recommendation. The Act confers functions and powers on the Commission, including the power to conciliate sexual harassment complaints. However, the ACTU highlighted in their submission to the Senate inquiry sexual harassment is undeniably a workplace issue which must be expressly prohibited and addressed through our workplace laws. Now, the Australian Human Rights Commission statistics show that in 2018-19, the majority, almost 70 per cent, of complaints made under the Sex Discrimination Act related to employment, and almost a quarter of those related to sexual harassment specifically. It's happening in Australian workplaces, but the Fair Work Act does not expressly prohibit sexual harassment. Now, there's an argument that it can be indirectly addressed through a number of provisions, including the general protections against adverse action on the basis of a workplace right, general protections against adverse action on the basis of sex, the anti-bullying jurisdiction, unfair dismissal and unlawful termination on the ground of sex. But the Respect at Work report stated that the absence of any express prohibition under the main legis legislation that governs workplaces created, and I'll quote, ambiguities and gaps in how sexual harassment was handled under the Fair Work Act. It's a pretty conclusive conclusion. And the Commissioner went on to say, it is clear from the many submissions and consultations recommending reform that the current framework under Part 3.1 of the Fair Work Act does not provide the clarity and coverage needed for victims of sexual harassment in the workplace. The lack of an express pro prohibition against sexual harassment within the Fair Work Act means that in practice sexual harassment matters are raised using provisions under this part, under Part 3.1, but they're not designed to address sexual harassment. The ACTU has said this, a worker may have a claim under section 340 of the Fair Work Act if they are victimised for making a complaint about sexual harassment, but no right of action for the sexual harassment itself. It's ludicrous. But the government's weak response 
and it is characteristically weak. This very sensible and clear recommendation was only agreed in principle, stating that the government will review the fair work system once the amendments proposed under Recommendation 16 have been implemented and their impact assessed. Well, unfortunately for this weak argument, which fails on almost every measure, Recommendation 16 isn't relevant to this recommendation. Recommendation 16 relates to proposed amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act, which in any case the government has only agreed to implement part of and has no bearing, no bearing whatsoever as to whether sexual harassment is expressly prohibited in the Fair Work Act. Kate Jenkins' report was all about looking at the big systems which legally govern sexual harassment and are presently failing to prevent it. She made a comprehensive recommendation about how to address that, but this is another part of her recommendations that are being ignored. It could be argued that while adopting a measure that could help stop sexual harassment in the workplace after it has occurred, the Stop Sexual Harassment Orders, the government has failed to implement a regulatory change that could help prevent sexual harassment in the workplace from occurring in the first place. The introduction to the government's response explicitly states that prevention must be our focus. Well, that's why we're moving this amendment, to ensure that our workplace laws explicitly state that sexual harassment and sex-based harassment are prohibited, as all sensible people would agree they should be. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, Senator Waters, are you seeking the call? No? Yes, I am. Yes. Thanks so much. You're Good. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I'll just rise briefly to note that the Greens will be supporting uh, this amendment on sheet 1405. And once again, it's farcical of this government to claim that they're supporting uh, recommendations in the Jenkins report in principle and then ask for more time when they've had 17 months. They should just be honest about saying they don't want to fix this problem. They don't want to have a prohibition against sexual harassment because probably many of the people in their ministry would be in trouble. Thank you, um, Senator Waters. So the question is that amendments one to six on sheet 1405, as moved by Senator McAllister, be agreed to. The, uh, those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. <clears throat> I believe the noes have it. Aye. Have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that uh, <coughs> amendment number sheet 1405, uh, 1 to 6 is moved by Senator McAllis to be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 12 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I think if we're super quick, we might get one more at least started. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Um, I seek leave to move uh, the items one and two together on sheet 1382. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McAllister. These provisions reflect a long-standing Labor position that paid domestic and family violence leave would make an enormous difference in the lives of Australian women. Uh, and it's on that basis that I commend this amendment to the Senate. Uh, I think it now being 12.15, I'll report progress. Um, the committee reports progress. Pursuant to order, I shall now call upon Senator's statement, and I call Senator Bragg. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, I rise to make some remarks about a defamation matter that uh, I am dealing with um, in my role as a senator. Um, and on the 18th of May, I received a letter and a concerns notice from Rebecca Sanford, Special Counsel of H. W. L. Ebsworth Lawyers in Adelaide which was marked urgent and confidential and sent on behalf of the New Daily Proprietary Limited. Um, the letter alleges that um, I have made uh, grossly defamatory uh, remarks and uh, the lawyers said that they expected the award of substantial damages and costs. Uh, their claim effectively is that I have uh, defamed the New Daily Proprietary Limited by penning an article in The Australian in March entitled, Lucky the ABC Finally Came to Its Senses. Now, this is quite a good article, and I commend this article to the Senate and anyone else who wants to read it. And in that article, I said that the New Daily is a superannuation sinkhole where $12 million of worker savings have disappeared. It is a loss-making business which calls into question the legal basis of the entity, given super funds have a fiduciary responsibility. Um, so, um, I mean, this article was written um, following the cancellation of a deal between the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and the New Daily, uh, which is frankly a deal that the ABC should never have entertained, uh, given its status as a national broadcaster. I mean, why on earth the ABC would be in bed uh, with lobbyists? Uh, really, I think, uh, shows you a significant cultural problem inside the organisation. Um, and, and so, but having had some experience of uh, legal matters in my life, I was surprised to discover that um, it was possible, in fact, to defame a company. I thought this was something that generally was uh, something that could only be done to individuals. But uh, no, there are, there are some uh, arrangements in the Model Defamation Code and in the, in the state of New South Wales. Uh, there are corporations uh, which are excluded corporations which can bring a defamation action. Uh, really, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, if the corporation, uh, a corporation is an excluded corporation if the objects for which it is formed do not include obtaining financial gain for its members, um, or it has fewer than 10 employees. Now, um, on these two tests, uh, it would appear that this new daily organisation significantly fails uh, both of the tests. On the first test, which goes to the question of uh, it being established for non-financial gain, 
Um, I uh, received a letter on the 20th of August 2021 from the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, or APRA, which is the prudential regulator that, which looks after superannuation funds, governance and risk management. And APRA explained to me that uh, there were six superannuation funds which provided capital to the New Delhi when it was founded between 2013 and 2016. Five of these funds treated it as an investment. Treated it as an investment. One treated it as an expense. As we have previously advised, APRA say, New Delhi is no longer owned directly by the super funds. It is now owned by Industry Super Holdings. Now, Industry Super Holdings, um, according to APRA, is owned by 20 superannuation funds, all of which, I'm quoting APRA directly here, all of which treat their holding as an investment. As an investment. So if the, if the superannuation funds are treating their money in the industry super holdings and the New Daily as an investment, then it cannot be, by definition, an organisation set up for non-financial purposes, because that's not how the superannuation laws work in this country. Now, on the second test, um, whether or not it um, could satisfy this under 10-person test, which I think is rather um, hilarious when you consider that the uh, parent company here, the industry super holdings company, has a billion-dollar balance sheet. Um, I would imagine that a billion-dollar company employs more than 10 people. So, um, on that basis, we have to assume that the New Daily is not capable of suing for defamation. Um, and this letter that I have received from Ms. Sanford from HWL Ebsworth in Adelaide um, is a, a, certainly a strange event. Trying to intimidate you. I think that's right. I'll take the interjection. So, um, because I'm a proper person, of course, my lawyers responded back in the usual way and said, well, please um, show cause. Um, and so far, crickets, nothing. So um, an organisation has wanted to commence a legal proceeding with me. Um, my lawyers have done, done the right thing and engaged properly and provided back the information, and we've heard nothing, nothing since May. So you, so you have to think, uh, why would an organisation do this? I think there's probably three reasons. Firstly, they want to silence a critic. Um, secondly, they want to stop anyone else from raising these issues. And thirdly, perhaps they like the deal so much that they've already got, uh, they want to put more money into this scheme, more money into this propaganda outfit, more money for lobbying. Now, they've already spent $30 million, according to ASIC records, on this New Daily product. $30 million of workers' money has already been wasted. So we have to assume they want to keep on doing this. Uh, and I think it is, uh, as uh, the good Senator Scar uh, just interjected, that it is a classic case, I think, here of trying to secure silence uh, by bullying. Uh, and these sort of tactics, I think, are totally out of step with a modern society. Now, now, the reason that I'm making these comments about this particular scheme, I think, are very important for the Senate to reflect upon. Um, the superannuation guarantee is a government program. This is a government program established under law for various purposes. So, as a senator, um, if I was precluded from making statements about a government program, what sort of a democracy would we have? So I think it's a very important line in the sand here. Uh, we, we cannot have a situation where elected officials can't opine about the progress and capacity and success of government programs. It's very important that people are able to raise matters in the public interest. And I would say that it is a matter of great public interest that an organisation has been set up with $30 million of workers' capital to go and smear um, and engage in all sorts of underhanded behaviour uh, through its websites and various parties, people that they don't like. I mean, that's not what super is for. Now, there are many different views about superannuation in this chamber. Um, some I agree with, others I don't. I mean, I think most fair-minded people would say it's a good idea, it's an idea that should be made to work, and the people that are pursuing these these propaganda outfits through workers' capital uh, really should hang their heads, heads in shame, especially when they're seeking to, to silence elected officials. If this defamation action was allowed to proceed, it would have a chilling effect on the capacity of members of parliament to make statements about government programs, and it should not be allowed to stand, and that's why I will not be bullied by these particular uh, organisations and people. And I'd have to say that uh, having conducted an ASIC search of these two companies, because you can't find out who's actually uh, behind these organisations through the usual way, um, they should all 
seriously consider their positions and seriously consider why, uh, how they can justify the expenses here that these lawyers um, have been required to uh, undertake. So, I mean, the directors of the um, industry super holdings are just three people. I mean, there's Michael Murgo, Linda Rubenstein, and Gregory <laughs> Combe. And then at the New Daily, there's nine people: Jared Noonan, Glenn Thompson, Tessa Heard Court, Christopher Walton, Catherine Ivan Smith, William Watson, Catherine Botel, Brad Crofts, and Susie Allison. So my my message to these uh, these 12 people is, um, who, who on earth is paying for these legal expenses? Who is paying for these legal expenses and how can you justify that? Now, the good news is this parliament has recently enacted a law which requires the super funds to act in the best financial interests of members. So I don't possibly see any justification for the ongoing expenditure for the New Daily or for uh, legal expenses trying to smear or trying to close down or collapse public debate about government programs. I don't think your position is attainable. Um, I look forward to receiving your proper uh, responses to my lawyers' uh, letters, given you have uh, sought to engage this matter. It would be a great shame for our democracy if people like this could lurk in the shadows, set up boondoggle propaganda outfits like the New Daily and undermine and silence public debate, legitimate public debate about a perfectly good idea. Superannuation is a good idea, but it is not working particularly well. And one of the reasons it's not working well is because people have treated the money like it is their own. It is not your money. It is the money that belongs to the workers. And I thank the Senate very much for its time. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Carr. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. We should be deeply concerned about the growth in right-wing extremism in Europe and in this country. ASIO tells us that 50 per cent of its time is now spent dealing with the threat of fascist groups. For me, this is a personal issue. Today I want to pay tribute to a great Australian, Mr Gary Fabian, who has been recently awarded the German Order of Merit by the Minister-President of Baden-Württemberg, Herr Winfried Ketchmann. Gary is a German-born Holocaust survivor who has been an Australia, Australian citizen for the past 70 years. I'm proud to be his son-in-law. Like millions of European Jews and other minorities and opponents of Germany's fascist regime during the dark years from 1933 to 1945, Gary was deprived of citizenship. His human rights were routinely violated and his boyhood was spent in a concentration camp. But unlike <laughs> the millions who died in the camps, Gary was fortunate to survive and to start a new life on the other side of the world. And since then, he has worked tirelessly to rebuild understanding and to promote reconciliation with the people of his birth country. Born Gerard Fabian in Stuttgart, Germany, on the 11th of January 1934, Gary's early years were spent moving from place to place with his family to avoid persecution under the Nuremberg laws. In 1935, the family moved to Brottenbach in Czechoslovakia and later to Prague after the German invasion in 1938. Like so many other refugees, they carried false documents and had to move every few weeks to avoid detection. Life was hard, but the worst was yet to come. In November 1942, Gary and his family were deported to Tresenstadt ghetto. Although called a ghetto, but actually it was a concentration camp, Tresenstadt was not officially a death camp like Auschwitz. But there were plenty of deaths as infectious diseases such as typhoid spread rapidly through the overcrowded barracks. The prisoners suffered malnutrition, exhaustion and harsh working conditions and brutal treatment by the guards. Most of the inmates were sent on to death camps. As a small child in these unsanitary conditions, Gary endured in succession measles, chickenpox and whooping cough, but somehow recovered from them all. Both his parents also survived, 
but his grandparents and numerous other relatives were murdered. In May 1945, Tresenstraat was liberated by the Soviet Army. Of the 150,000 children who entered that ghetto, Gary was one of the 150 who survived. By Gary's account, luck played a large part in the family's survival. Gary's father was in charge of the medical supply store and was classified as an essential worker. But other essential workers were sent to death camps despite their classification. In 1947, the Fabians were able to leave the horrors of Europe behind and emigrated to Australia. And despite huge gaps in his education and with minimal English, Gary attended school. He gained a junior technical certificate and undertook an electrical apprenticeship. And in 1952, Gary, having officially changed his name from Garrard, became an Australian citizen. And in 1956, he joined the Australian Navy to complete his national service. Now 87, Gary has contributed much to his adopted home as a proud Australian. Now, as, working, as well as working in the electrical sales services, he fulfilled his dream of tertiary education by returning to study in his 50s. He gained both a bachelor and a master's of arts degrees. He has always been active in his community. He has spent countless hours on school councils, on the committees of service organisation, like the Jewish social service organisation, Bene Brith. He continues to work as a volunteer guide at the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne, and he lectures at the University of the Third Age. He has two daughters and five grandchildren, this is particularly significant to me because I married his daughter, Carol. Gary's story of resilience and rebuilding a once shattered life is familiar among the migrant stories that make up our national narrative. What makes Gary unusual is his commitment to reconciliation. Despite the trauma uh, that he suffered under the Nazis, he has returned to Germany several times in the past 30 years. Each trip, or his early trips, in fact, were not comfortable for him. But over time, he has met many new generations of Germans who have a strong commitment to understanding their history. He developed a relationship with the foundation in his birth town of Stuttgart, known as the Geiserstrasse of Stoben, or Seven Geiser Street. The Foundation is dedicated to raising awareness of the dangers of racism and fascism. Its name comes from the address of a hostel for refugees that was burnt down in an arson attack. This Foundation has helped highlight Gary's personal story. He has appeared in a film about his experience in the German public television and he has appeared in German newspapers. His autobiography, Looking Back Over My Shoulder, was translated into German. He went on speaking to us to schools and colleges and community groups. In fact, I've had the great pleasure of being with Gary on one of his town hall meetings. In Brownswagen, he met a history professor, Dr Herbert Swiber, a former trade union official and SPD political activist with an interest in the treatment of unionists and socialists under the Nazi regime. This has led to more speaking engagements. Gary spared no detail in sharing his story of his experiences with his mostly young German audiences. His message has always been very clear. To quote him, I don't blame your generation for the crimes of another. This could have happened anywhere if the conditions were right. And he says, and we are all responsible for ensuring that hatred, racism and discrimination at its most deadly are not allowed to flourish ever again. In 2011, Gary applied to have his German citizenship re restored, and that happened within weeks. It is significant that German Jews are now accepting citizenship that was so infamously stripped from them starting from 1933. Gary's message of acceptance for all races, religions and creeds and his willingness to return to a land that has treated him so badly led to the award that he has now received. Gary's story is not only about the past. 
It is vital for all of us today. It is a warning about what can happen when both the foundations of liberal democracy and social democracy falter. In 1930s Germany, Jews and communists were blamed for all of society's ills. Now populist leaders around the world target immigrants, Muslims and others in the same way. Gary Fabian, I congratulate you on receiving this prestigious award. It honours you, your family and all who are willing to learn from the past to avoid repeating it. I wish to thank Gary's grandson, Seamus Carr, for his assistance in preparing these speaking notes. Oh, sorry, Senator Faruqi, online, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Today I want to talk about something we rarely hear in this place, animals and their well-being. Australians love animals, yet so many of our animal welfare laws lag behind other similar nations. I have heard from so many people who have related to me stories of how their companion animals have been their saviors during the isolation of COVID-19 lockdowns. My ex-racing rescue greyhound Cosmo has been a loving companion to me and my husband during the pandemic as we have been separated from our children. Yet incredible brutality is inflicted on these dogs as they are raced to death for a so-called sport. Throughout the COVID pandemic, so much has been forced to shut down. Schools are closed for classroom learning, so are universities. Business and workplaces across the country have either gone online or are barely staying afloat without daily trade. Gyms, libraries, even religious venues. But one thing that has continued on is greyhound racing. So many in our community have been alarmed over the last 18 months by the persistence and ongoing operation of, greyhound race, of the greyhound racing industry, the power and influence of the gambling lobby over politicians of both stripes has been clearly and shamefully on display. Over 200 precious dogs were killed at racetracks last year in the middle of a pandemic. So far this year, at least 111 deaths have, been, have occurred at racetracks. Racing continues, though thankfully has been suspended in some of the worst affected hotspot areas. Five years ago, in my home state of New South Wales, where I'm speaking from today, the government decided to make an important decision. It would shut down greyhound racing. Following the 2016 special commission into the New South Wales greyhound racing industry, then Premier Baird made a strong decision on the basis of animal welfare. In his report, Justice McHugh found overwhelming evidence of systemic anim animal cruelty, including mass greyhound killings and live baiting. The report said that the industry had fundamental animal welfare issues, integrity and governance failings, and cannot be remedied. It was horrific reading, but it did lead the government to take the position that it took. For those of us who had worked so hard for so long to expose the inherent cruelty of racing industry, it was an enormous vindication. But the craven political opportunism of the Labour Party and the enormous lobbying and money of the gambling fueled racing industry eventually pushed a cowardly government to do a humiliating backflip. The Greyhound racing ban was incredibly short-lived. I've said it before, but the day the ban was reversed was one of the worst days of my time in Parliament. So what has happened in five years? Let's start with the good news. The ACT government shut down greyhound racing more than three years ago. They should be proud of this. Scores of dogs have been inevitably saved from cruelty, drugging, death and injury. But everywhere else, dogs continue to die or be critically injured at tracks in their thousands. The New South Wales government is back to its old habits of propping up this cruel industry and in some ways have, has never given more full-throated support. It publicly funded $500,000 of prize money for the million dollar chase in one such brazen example. Earlier this year, the New South Wales government announced what it called a new funding model for the industry. Despite the McHugh report recommended that the industry fund its own oversight body, this will now be funded by taxpayers. Regional grants continue to be piled on 
and the public is now paying millions of dollars to boost this horrendous racing and gambling. What an absolute joke, but such a very cruel one at that. While sadly the racing continues, we have exposed this industry for what it is, dirty, toxic and abusive, and we will not stop till it is shut down. Enormous concern continues over the plight of greyhounds being exported from Australia for racing overseas. Between January 2016 and 31 July this year, at least 1,313 greyhounds were exported from Australia. Over the years, there have been horrific stories, photos and videos emerging from destinations overseas where dogs are malnourished, kept in small spaces, mistreated and gotten rid of when they are no longer turning a profit. Today, I will introduce a bill to shut down greyhound exports once and for all. The bill amends custom laws to prohibit the export and import of greyhounds for breeding, racing, or any other commercial purpose. It includes a ban on the export or import of greyhound reproductive material. There are exemptions for domestic pet greyhounds. Export of Australian greyhounds was the subject of a dedicated chapter in the Scaling McHugh Inquiry which found significant animal welfare concerns arising in connection with the export of greyhounds. An ABC 730 investigation with Animals Australia shed horrific light on the abuse and neglect of greyhounds from Australia and Macau, Vietnam, and across mainland China. It led Qantas to decide not to export any racing greyhounds to Asia, but the practice goes on. At the moment, Peak Body Greyhounds Australasia operates a greyhound passport scheme for export of greyhounds and will not grant passports to greyhounds traveling to countries of concern, including China and Vietnam, where greyhound racing has flourished on the back of exports from Australia. However, there are various significant loopholes. The passport scheme has no statutory authority and greyhounds can be exported without a so-called passport, with the only punishment for exporters resulting from contraventions of greyhound industry rules. In addition, greyhounds may be and have been exported to approved countries before being rerouted to countries of concern. Recent reports show greyhounds are being exported without Greyhounds Australasia's approval, making a mockery of this so-called enforcement system. So far this year, 87 dogs have been exported to 31st July, including four dogs to China. Commercial exports to China have been banned for some years, but loopholes still allow dogs to end up in terrible conditions at racetracks across the world. Greyhound Racing Victoria and other state authorities are reportedly currently investigating greyhounds being flown into the UK before being rerouted to China. In previous years, investigations took place into greyhound export to the United States and ending up in China. Greyhound Racing Victoria has reportedly requested the Australian government's assistance to put in place biosecurity requirements or national legislation that can prevent greyhound exports against the national rules, including via third countries. But this will not stop the export of greyhounds for racing purposes. Once greyhounds have left Australia, there's very little the Australian government can do to protect their welfare. Only a full commercial ban will work. Some of you here might know that I have been passionate about this issue for many years. In 2017, when I was state MP in New South Wales Parliament, I started a campaign for, of writing to major airlines to ask them to rule out transporting racing greyhounds internationally. Many airlines responded to the Don't Fly With Me campaign and were very happy to get on board. It's time this parliament took the same approach. Banning commercial greyhound export is supported by all key animal welfare groups, and I want to thank them and the thousands of people who oppose the cruelty of greyhound racing and greyhound export. The closure of the racetrack in Macau, which was called a death camp for dogs, has had a big impact in slowing the number of greyhounds exported, but this practice hasn't stopped. With the ongoing investigations into continued exports, we have to do the right thing and draw a line in the sand. No matter what the industry says, neither the welfare of the dogs nor where they end up can be guaranteed after they are exported. The only sensible and appropriate measure is to shut down the trade altogether. Greyhound export might make a buck for the industry in Australia, but it is un unacceptable to sacrifice the welfare of the dogs at the altar of profitability and gambling revenues. More and more people in Australia see greyhound racing for what it is, gambling-fueled animal cruelty. 
These beautiful dogs should be running for fun, not for their lives. My loving and trusting X-Racing Greyhound Cosmo, who you might see in the background, is a reminder to me every single day of the plight of the hundreds of dogs that endure the cruelty of racing. I know I have no choice but to keep pushing to end this cruelty. I am proud to be a voice of animals in this place. I really hope that more of you can join me. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to note that this Friday, the 3rd of September 2021, is Australian National Flag Day. On this day, we celebrate Australia's foremost national symbol and the most recognisable expression of Australian identity and pride. This year is a particularly special occasion as it marks the 120th anniversary of the Australian national flag and the 25th National Flag Day. When Sir Edmund Barton, Australia's first Prime Minister, revealed the national flag that was to represent Australia and its people on 3 September 1901, it was a significant event. The 5.5 by, 5 5 by 11 metre example that was flown over the dome of Melbourne's Royal Exhibition Building was a large and proud statement of a newly federated nation. And while Australian National Flag Day doesn't have a long history, only being proclaimed by the Governor-General on the 28th of August 1996, it is a day worth celebrating because of what our national flag represents and because those that designed it have a story worth sharing. At the time of Federation, when the six Australian colonies joined to form the Commonwealth, the Union Jack had been our official flag for a century. However, with the growing sense of Australian identity of a new nation entering a new century, the sentiment was well behind a new national symbol. In April 1901, an international competition to design Australia's flag was announced. It's recorded that nearly 30,000 entries were received, with five near identical designs awarded equal first place. The five winners. Annie Dorrington from Perth in Western Australia, Ivor Evans, a 14-year-old from Melbourne, Leslie Hawkins from Sydney, Bert Nuttall from Melbourne, and William Stevens from Auckland. And together they shared the £200 prize money, which today, by today's standards would be like winning almost $30,000. As a West Australian senator, it would be remiss of me not to avoid sharing a little bit about Annie Dorrington. The flag's designers are so rarely talked about and their history remains largely unknown. Annie Dorrington was an artist born at Litchfield Ash, Southampton, England in 1866. She was the second of nine children of Richard Whistler, a farmer, and his wife, Sarah Mills. Shortly after her father died, she migrated first to Victoria with her mother and siblings in 1890. And he married Charles Dorrington in St Albans Church of England in Armidale in Melbourne on the 18th of April 1892. They relocated to Western Australia in 1895, where they lived in Fremantle, moving to Perth a few years later. And he had a particular interest in painting native wildflowers, and by 1901 had a sizeable body of work that she offered to sell to Bernard Woodyard, the director of the West Australian Museum and Art Gallery. Annie's watercolours were exhibited in the West Australian Pavilion at the Paris and Glasgow International Exhibitions in 1900 and 1902, the St Louis International Exposition in Missouri in 1904 and the Franco-British Exhibition in London in 1908. Annie was the only woman and the only West Australian amongst the Flag Design Prize winners. Sadly, the later part of her life is a more tragic story. Suffering from depression, Annie was admitted to Claremont Mental Hospital over a number of years before her death in 1926. After her death, Annie was buried in an unmarked grave at Karakara Cemetery. Fortunately, her grave was eventually discovered by the Australian National Flag Association of Western Australia, which has honoured her contribution to our national story by erecting a monument in 1999. And I congratulate the Australian National Flag Association for their dedication to restoring this important part of our national history, an important part of Western Australia's history. Why do we celebrate National Flag Day? 
Events that celebrate the Australian national flag should be celebrated, for it's a symbol of our nation's values and achievements, and it belongs to every Australian. It is a symbol as relevant today as it was 120 years ago. However, every year, some members, across this chamber included, aided by activ activist groups like Ausflag, call for a change to our national flag. They allege it's a colonial flag, a divisive symbol. They claim our country needs to cut its ties with its historical influences, grow up and move forward with the times they suggest. But even former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, a former head of Ausflag, has conceded that the change the flag caused was going nowhere, noting in 2018 that younger Australians don't regard the Union Jack on our flag as a symbol alien to our history or our achievements or our values, but one very, very emblematic of them. Nevertheless, I'm sure we can expect the usual suspects to come forward loud and noisy to politicise this important celebration later this week. In contrast, I encourage senators to reflect on Prime Minister Tony Abbott's address at the first official National Flag Day event held here in Parliament in 2014. Paying tribute to a former governor of New South Wales, Sir David Martin, who was one of the early movers behind National Flag Day, the former Prime Minister, Mr Abbott, quoted Sir David and said, I can understand the wishes of many Australians to have more light-hearted symbols to wave on certain occasions, and I share their feelings. I am a happy admirer of kangaroos, koalas, wattle, waratahs, broad-brimmed hats and cans of beer. By all means, let's make happy, slick, wonderful emblems for use on particular occasions. But in the midst of such light-hearted cheering, I'm comforted to know that the Australian flag remains at the masthead, pro proclaiming our maturity, continuity and stability as a nation. In the short history of Australia, our people have been involved in many activities and events of great turmoil, anguish, strife, pressure, anxiety, unhappiness, hopelessness, but also, and most particularly, success, joy and jubilation. And on almost all of these occasions, this flag has been a rallying point. It's become associated with Australians and our great deeds, strong victories and some gallant defeats. It's become identified with our proud history and our fine traditions. A proud history indeed, one that deserves to be celebrated. And for this reason, I look forward to ce celebrating the 120th anniversary of our Australian national flag and all that it has come to represent on Friday. But while we can't mark the occasion with an official ceremony in Canberra or in this building this year, I encourage every Australian to wear an Australian flag pin, to display the flag with pride and to remember those great virtues that it has come to represent, hoping always it will be an enduring symbol that every Australian can rally behind and unite with. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Sheldon, remotely. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Senate Job Security Inquiry heard from working Australians, businesses, industry groups, academics and unions from around the country this year about the rise of insecure and precarious working conditions. In that time, we've heard time and time again from workers who have been ripped off and badly treated at insecure work. We have heard truly shocking stories of exploitation being dressed up as flexibility. Throughout the inquiry, we have heard that some employers are engaging in surveillance of their workforce to intimidate people out of speaking out about their work conditions and their pay, and to punish those who do. In this time of rising surveillance and union busting, I want to commend the bravery of workers around Australia who had spoken to the inquiry directly about their experiences. We heard evidence about blacklists, about workers being sacked for taking protected action, and casuals too, scarred to raise, too scared to raise safety concerns for fear of not being rostered on for another shift. Now, this evidence shouldn't be, should be spurring the Morrison government to action. 
but instead the Morrison government and One Nation have combined to shut down the inquiry. And to silence workers about Australia from, around Australia from having their voice heard before the Australian Senate. So I'd like to use this opportunity to put their evidence from the Job Security Committee on the official Senate record. Mel Vax is an enrolled nurse and a member of the United Workers Union. Mel revealed that the business model of many aged care homes is to be constantly understaffed. Mel said she had seen care homes cut the shifts of cleaners and laundry workers, and then asked nurses to pick up the slack on their own shifts. Mel told us about the aged care workers who are regularly expected to work the overnight shift in the dementia ward by themselves. And that in the dementia ward she manages, the workforce changes daily as nurses on low hour contracts are forced to work across several facilities. Mel often has to begin her shift by training a new group of staff and the dementia patients in her ward are often distressed at the cycle of workers coming in and out and changing every day. They're forced to manage up to three rosters, travel to three different care homes, work under three different sets of safety and workplace procedures, all on minimum hours. It's conditions like these that led to such devastating COVID outbreaks in aged care in New South Wales and Victoria. Mel told us that she often heard staff in the lunchroom talking about how their car is struggling to get on low hour, getting get on by being on low hour contracts. Ultimately, when aged care workers are forced into underpaid, understaffed and insecure work, the quality of care for aged care residents suffers as a result. The Royal Commission itself made this exact point and to quote from the Commission's final report, the bulk of the aged care workforce does not receive wages and enjoy terms and conditions of employment that adequately reflect the important caring role they play. Inadequate staffing levels, skill mix and training are principal causes of substandard care in the current system, I went to say. This is exactly the evidence that we receive from aged care workers like Mel throughout the job security inquiry. And of course now shamefully, Mr Morrison and One Nation are shutting down this inquiry to silence and stop aged care workers from speaking about, out about their conditions of work. Now evidence from Andy Davey is, who is a member of the CFMEU Mining and Energy, Energy Division and lives and works on the south coast of New South Wales. He gave shocking testimony to a forum on job security about the insidious rates of casualisation in the mining industry, where workers engaged through labour hire companies regularly earn 30% less than their directly employed colleagues, working side by side on the same site. More and more roles in the, in the mining industry every year are casual or contract positions. And he gave us the example of labour hire from work firm Workpack, which even after granting a long overdue 16% pay rise, still pays their workers $3 less an hour than the permanent mine workers they are alongside. That is a pure profit being paid by companies like BHP and Anglo-American to labour hire companies like Workpack. Money that should be going to the mine workers performing the work is instead being diverted to multinational labour hire companies. Labour hire is not only driving down paying conditions in mining, it is also being used to intimidate and silence the workforce. Andy told us about the experience of work pack workers and I quote, they're too scared to speak out, not only for themselves, but for safety concerns or for any injuries. These people are sucking the same dust their boss body is suffering as much as a permanent employee. These casual workers can't get a mortgage, they can't get sick leave, and they earn far less than their full-time colleagues. Well, this is the new standard of work in mining all across sectors of the, of the Morrison economy. And now, shamefully, Mr Morrison and One Nation are shutting down this inquiry to silence and stop mine workers from speaking out about their conditions of work. Evidence from Chris Kirby, who is an AMWU member in construction in Western Australia, he has seen the use of casual explo casuals explode in his industry since he began his career over a decade ago. 
He told us that casual employment has become the norm in construction and that casual conversion clauses are routinely ignored or removed from the enterprise agreements. He totally rejected claims that the permanent casual work he is engaged in provides flexibility. He said that we really want, want is choice. If employers care so much about flexibility, they should give workers the choice of whether they are employed as casuals or in secure employment. Chris told us this story of how he went during a period of bargaining with his employer. He and his colleagues weren't even asking for a raise. They were just asking for their paying conditions to be rolled over. I quote from Chris's testimony to the inquiry. Just before Christmas, we were told that if we didn't sign up for what was essentially a 25% wage cut, we would be getting the sack. So we had no choice but to take protected action. So we took protection, protected action and we were handed redundancy letters. They were immediately replaced by casuals. Chris and many of his workmates then had to take jobs with another contractor on the same building site, doing exactly the same job they had been before, but now for less pay and worse conditions as casuals with none of the entitlements of a permanent employee. This is disgraceful behaviour, but it isn't an isolated incident. We heard many such examples of threats, blacklisting and casual workers simply being let go for standing up for their paying conditions. It's clear by listening to these stories that our industrial relations framework is broken, which makes it all the more appalling that Mr. Morrison and One Nation have shamefully shut down this inquiry. The silence workers like Chris in speaking out about their conditions at work. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Sheldon. Uh, Senator Patrick, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about naval shipbuilding. When I was listening to the debate on Monday about the Defence Amendment parliamentary approval of overseas service bill uh, brought, by, brought forward by Senator Steelejohn, I listened carefully to coalition senators they rose on their high Senate horse, uh, stating that it is the first responsibility of government to make sure that, that uh, the people of this country live within a safety net of security. Now, they're important words, and I believe in those words, but I feel they are hollow coming from senators who are really just momentarily wrapping themselves in the Australian flag. And I say that because I haven't seen uh, these senators rolling into the chamber and using adjournment speeches or senators' statements or two-minute statements to express their concern about the naval shipbuilding program, and in particular, the submarine program and the future frigate program. Both are late, both are over budget, both have performance concerns relating to them, and both have issues uh, around Australian industry content. And this is a particularly concerning, uh, noting that we have uh, uh, changing geostrategic circumstances to our north, worrying uh, changes in our geostrategic circumstances. Enough so that our uh, formal posture in relation to defence has basically signal we can no longer rely on a 10-year warning. That uh, warning time has, in fact, uh, shortened dramatically. Now, if I go to the submarines, in terms of schedule, the project was stood up in 2009. And in fact, I had some involvement prior to that personally inside uh, CASG, inside Defence. So the project was actually being considered well before 2009, became public in 2009 uh, with a view to uh, purchasing 12 new submarines that would be brought into service by 2025. Now, that date was important because that was the date in which the Collins-class submarines were due to retire. We find ourselves now uh, with a program that has a delivery date of 2035. Now, we have some serious strategic concerns to the north, be it in relation to uh, the South China Sea with uh, 
the CCP preferring to emphasise the word China when you say South China Sea, and of course incursions uh, on Taiwan, something that we do need to have some regard to. So 2035 is simply too late. But that's where we find ourselves. We've seen the cost go from somewhere around 12 billion in 2009, they were the numbers being talked about, uh, to ASPE reports talking about 36 billion, to $50 billion, uh, it, um, uh, then moving uh, to $90 billion in outturn costs. So we've seen this massive increase in the cost of these projects. The numbers are so big, not for the program itself, but for the blowout. You know, $40 billion in blowout for the future submarine. And of course, that's been exacerbated because we now have to extend the life of the Collins-class submarines beyond their 2025 uh, ex um, retirement date to meet the new submarines in 2035. There's no guarantee that they will arrive in uh, 2035. Performance of the uh, future submarine has also been brought into question. We know from Senate estimates that uh, the batteries that we will use on our future submarines will be lead acid cell batteries. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, I can tell you that in 2025, the only place you will find a lead acid battery being used other than uh, in our future submarine will be in a museum. That's the only place. We see lithium ion batteries being used uh, in uh, Japanese submarines and planned for pretty much every brand new submarine that is uh, placed on, uh, onto the market. There's also the question of the pump jets. The pump jet propulsion on the future submarine creates a huge risk. And we ought to be concerned about that risk because it's by no uh, easy means that we will change the, prop the proposal arrangement should that not work out. That will be a catastrophic project problem uh, if the risks, the high risks associated with that, with that pump jet are realised. And of course the industry involvement has been of particular concern as well. We were po promised a project uh, that would uh, make sure that we had a sovereign industry capability. Industry are doing some work on this project but by and large they are, their, their expectations are not being met and we need to be able to make sure that when these submarines are operating beyond 2035, that we have the capacity to sustain them properly. And that means we need to have industry involvement. <laughs> I turn to the future frigates. The schedule on the future frigates, we've uh, recently learnt, has blown out by 18 months. Now, we need to understand in particular what that means. When the project was first stood up, we were supposed to have construction starting in 2022. That was subtly shifted um, uh, uh, in relation to uh, some of the blocks that are, are being built. There was some confusion around the actual start date, date but let's go with uh, 2022. We now know that that, has, that 2022 date has been shifted by 18 months as a result of delays in the future frigate program. The actual delivery of the first ship has moved from uh, December 29 to December 31. So another two years shift. It makes us think like there's nothing happening in the defence space. There's, there are no geostrategic problems. Uh, but uh, these are uh, significant issues. The cost, the cost of the future figure program has gone from $35 billion to $45 billion another $10 billion. And no one seems to bat an eyelid. And indeed, the coalition doesn't seem to think that that's a topic worthy of addressing. Just simply accepts it. Just accepts that, uh, that there is a, a blowout. We're also seeing uh, issues associated with performance in relation to that project. We know that the weight margin for that project is only 3%. Now that means over the life of the ship, there's not much scope for upgrades. It also means we're pushing a heavier ship through the water, which will put a load on the propulsion chain. And I can tell you as an acoustic specialist, we'll also make the ship uh, noisier, which is problematic, noting it is an anti-submarine warfare vessel. 
And again, industry involvement in that program is uh, falling well short. I mean, how do we get into these situations? We, set, we have um, admirals, generals, air marshals who have no little or no project experience making recommendations about ambitious and highly risk programs to cabinet ministers who have even less experience. Defence knows uh, to buy off the shelf wherever possible. It was recommended to them by Canaid uh, and also by Mortimer in reviews on our procurement strategy. That leads me to the life of type, type extension of, of the Collins class submarines. This is a program that was known about 10 years ago. I recall Cameron Stewart of the Australian reporting on uh, life of type uh, all those years ago. But it's, uh, you know, the, the, the life of type has gone from one submarine to five submarines, and now we know it's going to be basically done for all six submarines at a $10 billion cost. And I note from answers I received in the last day or so uh, th from estimates that a second pass decision on that particular program will not be made until 2022, 2023. Now, that all leads to the final problem. That is, in the meantime, we're heavily reliant on our Collins class submarines. They are maintained from a full cycle docking perspective from our Adelaide shipbuilder ASC. They are doing a fantastic job, well, uh, world benchmarks. Um, Defence are thinking about shifting this. So the government is thinking about shifting this, this role to Western Australia. Uh, they know that the people won't move and that's where all of the expertise lies. And in moving that, they will create a significant risk of non-availability of the Collins class submarine, which is totally acceptable, noting the geostrategic environment we're in and what's happening with our submarine programs. The government needs to stand up and make a decision on full cycle dockings immediately for them to be retained in South Australia. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about Jersey Day and the Nathan Gremo Community Fund. Many of my colleagues here in this chamber today, across all sides, have supported this magnificent cause. 2021 will see the seventh year of Jersey Day. Where did this all begin? I was very touched by this inspirational story. Like many good things in life, its genesis began with a small group of individuals and, sadly, following the tragic death in 2015 of Nathan Gremo. 13-year-old Nathan was critically injured while crossing the road outside his home in Glenhaven, New South Wales. The next day in Westmead Hospital, it became clear that Nathan's situation was impossible and his parents, Michael and Kylie, made the decision to donate Nathan's organs. This decision led to six other people being given the opportunity of life. Ironically, hours before his incident, Nathan had posted on his Instagram account, you only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. Nathan was a young boy, full of beans, an active sporting individual with a great sense of humour. That post of Nathan's inspired not just his family, but the wider community and ultimately a nation. Michael and Kylie wanted to honour Nathan's legacy and the Jersey Day concept was born. The Gremo Community Fund was an already established fundraising initiative in the Hills area of Sydney, led by the Honourable Alan Cadman, OAM, Dr Jim Taggart, OAM and the Gremo family. While many of the efforts of the Community Fund were focused on assisting people with disabilities, the focus of the organisation soon became Jersey Day and raising awareness about the importance of organ and tissue donation. Through Jersey Day, the Nathan Gremo Community Fund has built a vast network throughout the country which assists in the promotion of Jersey Day, including the Organ and Tissue Authority and state-based Donate Life offices. Jersey Day is traditionally held the Friday before Father's Day. This year's Jersey Day will be held Friday, September the 3rd. Jersey Day in Australia sees tens of thousands of people from schools, alongside sporting teams, through corporate Australia, wearing their favourite NRL, AFL, NBL, surf life saving netball or even fishing jerseys. Most Australians, as we know, have a sporting jersey in their wardrobe and proudly wear on such a special day as this. Not just to remember the active life that Nathan had lived, but to promote the discussion of organ and tissue donation. A jersey represents a team, and as Australia, we will require a team effort 
to help the 1,400 Australians that are currently waiting on life-saving organ and tissue donation lists. Jersey Day not only promotes organ and tissue registration, but perhaps more importantly, it encourages family to have a conversation about the topic. Instances of organ and tissue donation are extremely rare, but in the rare instance, instance where this can occur, ultimately your loved one will be asked to confirm your wishes. This is why these conversations are so important. In the words of Kerry Chikorovsky, make sure you have had the conversation with your family so they don't override your wishes. I'd like to recognise the hundreds of schools and businesses from around the country that have supported Jersey Day. And I'd like also particularly like to mention from my home state, Perth Glory football team for their support. More importantly, tens of thousands of Australians have been inspired by Jersey Day to have a chat with their families about organ and tissue donation. Of course, we need to reach even more Australians with this important message. Perhaps the most unique feature of Jersey Day is that there is no requirement to raise funds. Schools and businesses can involve their students and staff without the requirement to collect or administer donations. Jersey Day is about raising awareness. Jersey Day is part of the wider Donate Life Network. I would, I would like to recognise the Honourable Mal Washer, the National Chair of the Organ and Tissue, Tissue Authority, which is the government authority responsible for co-coordinating the Donate Life Network. And of course, uh, Dr. Washer was a uh, member of the other place for many years. In 2021, with a number of East Coast states in lockdown, Jersey Day is expanding its network thanks to the Association of Financial Advisers, who are promoting the day across Australia to its members, who are in turn able to promote Jersey Day to their staff and clients. In closing, I would just like to ask all Australians to get behind this magnificent cause, to talk to their families, to talk to their loved ones, to talk to their friends, to talk to their associates at works, work about the importance of organ and tissue registration and donation. By doing so, you do save so many other lives. I'll end with, again, those words from Nathan. You only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Deception, incompetence, neglect. Words that hollowly echo the real anguish and fear spreading through communities in regional New South Wales. The Prime Minister on so many occasions has spoken of the forgotten Australian though he's never seen their face, never caring to avail himself of the facts of their lived realities. The New South Wales Premier seems to know Manly and Rushcutters Bay well, but leaves regional Australia to her self-absorbed deputy. The people of Walgett, Wilcannia and Dubbo, Coonabarabran, Gilgandra and Orange, the people of these communities are now becoming victims of the COVID virus, illustrating for all that they have always been victims of a government ill-concerned with them. Allow me to disabuse you of any notion that the National Party actually cares for regional communities. Wilcannia is without food. In Walgett, people self-isolate in tents. In Dubbo, Close contacts are sleeping in cars. All of them have serious questions for the government. Now, they are not my words. They are very powerful words spoken from the heart of the community, constructed in Coonabarabran in the last couple of days by a good friend of mine, Jack Ayub, who is a Labor's uh, shining star, I think, in that region. He was our candidate in the last federal election for the seat of Parks, which covers western uh, New South Wales, for those who don't know it, from as far out west as Dubbo from Sydney, all the way out to Broken Hill and as far north as up to Gadooga. He's lived there all his life in Coonabarabran, and he knows a thing or two about what's going on out there. They're his words because they reflect the reality that is happening right now in western New South Wales. Wiradjuri man, 
David Towney said to the ABC News overnight, all that little political bubble that was happening in Sydney ignored us, and now we're paying the consequences. Barkindji Mann, Michael Kennedy, also told ABC News, we were trying really hard then to put changes in place to keep our community safe. Everything that we mentioned, every plan we had, got thrown out of the window. No one would listen to us. No one would listen to us. This is the truth of elders in these First Nations communities that needs to be told, because we can see day after day by the dismissive, uh, the dismissive attitude of the Minister for Health in New South Wales, Mr Hazard, and the dismissive attitude for the Minister for Health here in this place, Minister Hunt, and his representative here in, uh, in, in Senator Colback, that they just are failing to see the reality of what's happening on the ground. They come in here, refuse to answer questions with any truth or integrity, rely on speaking notes that are intended to obfuscate and to absolve them of responsibility for what's actually happening on the ground right now in my great state of New South Wales. Iolahiman Bahami Williamson summed up this government's attitude in one sentence. It's absolutely clear that we Aboriginal people are a priority group in political rhetoric only. That is the truth about this government. I've been speaking with GPs and other health professionals, nurse practitioners from across the region of Western New South Wales, and this is what they're telling me. The missions are overcrowded. They acknowledge the important presence of the RFDS, who are there to support and doing a good job, but they are totally and inadequately supported. One of them said this was so predictable and so preventable. Instead, the government is reactive only, and now it's costing lives. That is the truth of what's going on in Western New South Wales. We could all see it coming, said one. We could all see it coming, but no one would listen. And when did Pfizer, so desperately needed for this community, come through? Only in recent weeks. About a month ago was the response. Now, this government comes in here, and yesterday I took some notes from uh, the contribution of uh, Senator Colbeck when I asked questions about what was happening. And, and he talks about a plan, a plan that he got together as far back as the 5th of March 2020 and an Indigenous plan on the 26th of March 2020. Well, the plan failed. March 2020 is a pretty long time ago. They had plenty of time to get on the job. But instead of being resourceful like the people of regional and rural Australia, this government thinks it's doing a favour when it just shows up and sits here and, and tells lies to the Australian people about what they're doing. The minister yesterday spoke about the 9th of March as a day in which Indigenous vaccine programs got off the ground. The 22nd of March, he talked about Wilcania getting access to a vaccination clinic through Murramah. But a vaccination clinic that opened up in the shadow of the Prime Minister's appalling press conference on the night of the 8th of, uh, Mar uh, 8th of April, where he basically completely compromised any community confidence in AstraZeneca, is the reality into which this plan entered. And as First Nations leaders are saying from across Western, Western, Australia, Western New South Wales, there was no adequate listening from this government. They are deaf to the voices of community leaders in First Nations communities who have been trying to tell them, who have been pleading to be heard for months so that what has been unleashed could have been prevented. 
Yet here we are with COVID spreading rapidly throughout Western New South Wales. People know that when COVID got to Dubbo, it was going to get to every part of Western New South Wales. The reality is if you live in Brewarrina or Broken Hill or, or, sorry, or Burke or Wilcannia or even in Broken Hill, it's a long drive to get to Dubbo, but there are some facilities that can only get in Dubbo. People who live within four hours will be driving there to get food. Once it hit Dubbo, it was always going to go everywhere. And we have had a government that failed to act. The South Australia border being closed has forced even more people than usual to go to Dubbo, and that is where this disease is actually really being fed. I know health professionals out there are very, very concerned about the dismissive ways in which their voices are ignored. What the people of Western New South Wales really don't need is a top-down health bureaucracy. Rules poorly disseminated from Miller Street in North Sydney by people with no concept of rural and remote lives. No concern given to the insights and experience of regional medical staff who care, whose knowledge and connection to community will always prevail in the face of dysfunction, disorganised and utterly aloof government. I want to refer to a GP in Coonabarabran, Dr Ianuzzi, who has been practising in regional New South Wales for 25 years. I reckon he might know a thing or two about what needs to happen. And he gave evidence to the, the uh, Upper House Committee from New South Wales uh, State Parliament that was going around. And, and he, this is a, from a contribution he made in the City Morning Herald. I can attest to the scandals and horror stories emerging from a state parliamentary inquiry into regional country and remote health services. A teenager with an infected toenail dies of septic shock after being turned away three times from an emergency department. Tea ladies check in on newborn babies because there are not enough nurses. Doctors threaten to quit on, quit on mass because their working conditions are so dangerous. They're his words describing the reality of what it was like before COVID hit. That's the system. That's the system that is now expected to cope with this COVID infection rate growing at a massive rate. This is the system and infrastructure provided to the people by the National Party in cahoots with the government of this day. A leader should deal in hope, not flummery in fiction. People of Western New South Wales Order. need more Senator than what they're getting. They need Your Labor representatives and a Labor government. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President, and uh, thank you, Senator O'Neill, for uh, giving me a, a very good opening to what I wanted to discuss today. Because I also wanted to talk about the situation in Western New South Wales, but uh, it's not all negative in Western New South Wales. And in fact, um, where there are incidences of COVID, it is being very successfully maintained. It is unfortunate that COVID made it out to our regions, but it is being successfully maintained. And I want to give credit to the communities that are working very hard in difficult circumstances. And it is true what Senator O'Neill says that border closures are having unintended consequences and putting extra pressure on health services in our regional and remote communities. The fact that Broken Hill residents struggle to get to South Australia due to border closures means they are turning their attention, if they need health services, to Dubbo, which is already facing um, problems. But I also want to bring your attention to the case of Mungandai. Mungandai is a town on the Queensland-New South Wales border. Unlike most border communities, Mungandai has the same name regardless of which side of the border you are. It's not like Albury-Wodonga. It's not like Echuca-Moama. It is just Mungandai. The people of Mungandai live in Mungandai. They're very proud of being from Mungandai. But the people of Mungandai can't go down the road to the local shops to buy a bottle of milk or a loaf of bread without doing a 14-day quarantine at the moment. Worse still, the people of Mungandai can't go to their local health clinic because there is a border in the way, a border which is a river but a border nonetheless. And the Queensland government has decided this lockdown 
there is to be no border bubble. So the town of Mungandai has no border bubble. It has no protection, no ability to go about life as normal. The residents south of the border are in lockdown, while neighbours only a few hundred metres away, literally across a bridge, are living in relative freedom. And this is made all the harder because Mungandai is a fairly isolated community. If you can't just drive down the road from Mungandai for 45 minutes and get to the next town. In fact, I think the closest town on the, uh, the Queensland side is St George, if my memory serves me correctly, which has a fabulous hospital because my daughter was born there, thank you to Queensland Health. But that is the closest town of any significance to the Queensland side. But if you're on the New South Wales side, the closest town would be Moree. That's over an hour's drive away. So you want to hope that you don't have an accident in Mungandai anytime soon while these dreadful and draconian border closures are in place. Now we faced our first border closures last year and um, we learnt. Well, I thought we learnt from that experience. Because the early days of the border closures, there was grave confusion in border communities at both ends of New South Wales. But we learnt we developed border bubbles at both ends. We developed a permit system that allowed agricultural workers to cross. We allowed freight drivers to cross. But it seems that every time we go into a new lockdown, we face a new set of rules. Our border communities have no certainty whatsoever every single time. They don't know whether they'll be able to go to the shops. They don't know whether they'll be able to see their local doctor. Order, Senator Davey. Thank it you. being 1.30 pm, I shall now proceed to two-minute statements, and I call Senator Ayres remotely. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, what we just saw was more apologism from the National Party for the utter failures of this Prime Minister. Do you know, in regional New South Wales, the vaccine rollout, despite what the Prime Minister says, lags well behind the cities. And you know what? The Australian rollout lags well behind the rest of the developed world. And you know what it fixed border closures and lockdowns? A proper vaccine rollout would fix it. We've had a Prime Minister who's utterly failed Australians. A botched vaccine rollout, a failed national quarantine system, undermining the states at every turn, including today again threatening to take the Western Australian government to court. You know, right in this moment of national crisis, when day after day we are getting a thousand new infections in New South Wales, all at the feet of this Prime Minister's failure, what the country needed was a John Curtin. What the country needed was a Bob Hawke. What the country needed I, I, even I dare say a John Howard, but instead what we've got is a poor man's Billy McMahon. This Prime Minister is more Billy McMahon than even Billy McMahon was himself. He is more marketing than man. He is fundamentally not up to the great national task that confronts this parliament, vaccinating Australia, keeping Australians safe and actually delivering in the national interest, a concept that this Prime Minister is fundamentally incapable of understanding. It's his complacency, his vanity, his refusal to take responsibility, his complete incapacity to be able to, to distinguish between the national interest and his own narrow political interest, which has let Australia and Australians down. And the sooner that he is in the rear vision mirror, the better. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And I rise today to speak again uh, to the Intergovernment uh, Panel on Climate Change's latest release uh, just the last month. Uh, and I want to uh, talk about um, TS17, a comment they make where they go, there is a near linear relationship between cumulative CO2 emissions and the maximum global surface temperature caused by carbon dioxide. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Anyone who understands anything about mathematics or anything about science knows that the relationship, at best, is logarithmic, not linear. 
And what do I mean by that? Is ultimately all the energy in the atmosphere in the first place comes from the sun. Now, on average, across the 24 hours in the day, it hits the uh, atmosphere at about 341 watts per square metre. About half of that gets reflected from the clouds in the atmosphere back into space, and about 160 watts hits the surface. That then bounces off the, uh, off the surface back up into the greenhouse gases. Now, greenhouse gases do absorb and emit radiation. That is a one form of heat transfer. But as anyone who understands anything about physics will know that, unlike conduction and convection, um, where Newton's law of cooling applies and the difference between hot and cold is a direct uh, relationship, radiation transfers basically to the power of four. So the faster it heats, it faster it cools. So the idea that you have a linear relationship is completely wrong. The law is called the Stefan Boltzmann law, and it, you know, it's just another example of how the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change is telling FIPS. But of course, it's a lot more complex than that because the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases, only make up point carbon dioxide in particular only makes up 0.04% of the atmosphere. So even if it does absorb heat, it's then going to, through conduction, basically I'm smash thinking, into about you know billions and billions of other molecules Order, in one Senator second. Rennick, Thank you, Senator Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Like many Australians, I watched the Four Corners series on Fox News and The Big Lie over the last two Mondays. While it wasn't surprising viewing for those of us who closely monitor far-right media and politics, it certainly was highly disturbing. There is no doubt that the Murdoch media played a key role in growing and consolidating public support for Donald Trump and his right, far-right administration. There's also no doubt that the Murdoch media and Fox News in particular played a key role in fueling conspiracy theories about the 2020 US election being stolen, amplifying illegitimate claims about voting machines and voter fraud. Obsession with this conspiracy among some American voters ultimately led to the deadly Capitol riots in January that were aimed at overturning the valid result of a democratic election. Why does this matter here in Australia? Promoting the big lie was a political choice made by Fox and News Corp. Media ownership here is concentrated heavily in the hands of News Corp. Fox even has a local far-right TV outpost in Sky News. Sky was famously suspended from YouTube last month over its COVID-19 conspiracy theories and has provided racism a platform in innumerable incidents over the last few years. When people challenge News Corp, the company will try to undermine their credibility and silence them. That certainly happened with Four Corners, with the dozens of critical articles written in News Corp papers about the investigation. But these stories of rotten power and influence must be told, and critics of the Murdoch media will not be silenced. I look forward to continuing to speak out about the extremism and danger of these far-right media outlets. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to join with the Maritime Union, Union of Australia, the Maritime Industries of Australia Limited and Ports Australia in calling for greater recognition of maritime workers as essential workers during this long-running COVID pandemic. As colleagues would be aware, the Labor Party has been working as cooperatively as possible with the government to keep our community safe and our supply chains operating as efficiently and as freely as possible. However, to keep these vital transport linkages open, goods on our shelves and get Australians' exports to market, the government needs to do more to recognise and support the essential work of our seafarers and maritime workers. Labor has been calling on the government to recognise that maritime workers are essential since March of last year. As recently as the meeting of National Cabinet on Friday last week, there was an announcement of the streamlining of COVID-19 measures for land-based freight industry. However, yet again, nothing was done to recognise the vital role played by maritime transport. As Miles said last week, and I quote, planes, trains and automobiles, but no ships, end quote. Our maritime workers still face hard borders when moving from state to state, and international seafarers are often stranded working on vessels for over 20 months at a time because shore leave and crew changes are no longer facilitated. At the moment, frontline 
maritime workers in Australia are often unable to work, subjected to repeated periods in quarantine in addition to their already long stints at sea, and businesses can't plan when workers will be available and when their goods will arrive on time. The government seems to think that our shelves will remain fully stacked as if by magic. Our national and international maritime workers play a vital role in keeping our economy moving, and it's about time the government recognised that and gave them essential um, worker status. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I want to comment about the government's lack of a plan. State and federal governments lack a plan, and that's costing people enormously, sometimes costing people's livelihoods and lives. Now, I've checked with the Chief Medical Officer and Senate Estimates and the Secretary of the Health Department, Federal Health Department, and they confirmed seven strategies for a plan. Health and fitness, we've heard very little. Personal behaviour and hygiene is the second strategy, very little apart from hand washing. Number three, proven, uh, proven treatments, cures and prophylactics like ivermectin. Not only have we heard little from the government, it's been suppressed and kept from the people. Number four, vaccines. I'll come back to that in a minute. Number five, restrictions such as masks and social distancing. There is serious questioning now about the validity of these masks. Number six, testing, tracing and quarantining. Very little done properly on quarantining. Number seven, lockdowns, being used capriciously. These together show that the governments at state level are relying on lockdowns, which are capricious and ineffective. Even the World Health Organization says that. And the federal government relies on vaccines. So let's look at vaccines. The senior health officials admit and won't say that the vaccines are safe. They, ad they won't say the vaccines are safe. They admit the dosage is not known. They admit the frequency of, of uh, injections is not known. They admit the number of injections is not known. They admit that it won't stop us getting the virus and they admit it won't stop the spread. So why get it? On addition, now, we, have, we find that efficacy is plummeting dramatically. These things are basically useless after a short time. Now Pfizer itself is admitting for the thir ad ad applying for the third booster shot. How many will there be? We don't know. Both the Liberal Nationals and Labor have been pushing this. And this is the first time in history that governments are injecting healthy people with something that can kill and actually is killing some people. Parliaments have abandoned the people. We need to get Parliament back to serving the people. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Dean Smith. I rise to add my voice to that of Senate colleagues on what continues to unfold in Afghanistan. The country's collapse to the Taliban was a tragedy in itself, but to have been so quickly followed by terrorist violence is especially confronting. The American personnel targeted by the Kabul airport bombings were in harm's way because they were working to help Afghans trying to reach a better life. This evil behaviour must be strongly condemned, and of course our deepest sympathy is sent to the families and loved ones of those who have lost their lives. During the past several weeks we have seen and heard terrible things, but we have also witnessed an extraordinary evacuation effort, one of the largest humanitarian airlifts in Australia's history. Our forces evacuated more than 4,000 people in cooperation with our allies and partners. It was a dangerous mission carried out by Australian Defence Force personnel and supported by Australian Public Service civilians, who we must thank for our, their outstanding contribution. Again, Australians can be very proud of those that act in our name abroad and the professionalism they bring. Their professionalism reminds me of the impressive conduct I witnessed when I travelled to Afghanistan and met with Australian Defence Force personnel participating in our Middle East area of operations. Their commitment, professionalism, dedication and sacrifice we must continue to honour. My office, as I know is true of other parliamentarians, has received a significant influx of requests for help and information. It's an incredibly anxious time for many in Afghanistan, in Australia and around the world, with many people left vulnerable. This will only increase following the departure of the United States forces in accordance with their deadline yesterday. The past few weeks have shown us the great value of our freedom here and how vital it is that we help Afghans following the loss of theirs. Holding the Taliban to account for its behaviour and providing as much ongoing humanitarian support as we can as a generous nation. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Griff, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Yesterday, Bloomberg confirmed what many of us already knew. China was responsible for hacking the parliamentary email system last year 
and that was part of a much broader attack on Australian digital services. I condemn this attack, as I'm sure all senators do, but believe it is a mistake to focus on the perpetrators. Whenever a vulnerability exists, there will be those who will exploit it. They may be Chinese state hackers, Russian criminal gangs, Middle Eastern terrorist sects, or even a bored, very tech-savvy 12-year-old genius living in Toowoomba. It doesn't matter who they are. It is pointless to fixate on them, or even to seek some kind of digital vengeance, which some in this place have actually sought. Indeed, we need to focus on better cybersecurity, identifying and fixing the vulnerabilities that allow those attacks to occur in the first place. I do acknowledge the government's work in recent years, particularly with the cybersecurity strategy, but more absolutely needs to be done. We must ensure that public better understand the risks we face online and the importance of cybersecurity and cyber resilience. We must move faster to develop the cybersecurity workforce we are very much missing. Scarce workers and the high cost of procuring these services is a deterrent to many that wish to invest in better security. So the government must do more to develop that workforce and ensure cybersecurity skills are available to all businesses, large and small. Only then will Australia be properly protected from cyber attacks. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, happy Early Childhood Educators Day. To acknowledge, thank, celebrate and recognise the work of our incredible early learning educators and the amazing contribution they make to the lives of our kids, to families and to our communities. We know how important our educators are. They do life-changing work every single day. But we also know that for far too long their contribution has been undervalued. And during this pandemic, it took far too long for their essential work to be recognised. Acting Deputy President, I came to the Senate to do a very specific job. In my first speech, I couldn't have been clearer when I said that I came here to stand up for the children of my state of South Australia. On early childhood education, I said, we must be bold in our vision, broad in our approach, and brave in our means of delivery. And we need to do so in partnership with our early years educators, in whose hands we place our youngest and most vulnerable minds, yet whose critical work we have chosen to undervalue. Those words are just as important to me now as when I first spoke them, and the mission remains just as relevant. Today on Early Childhood Educator Day, I want to thank those caring for our kids in South Australia. And I want you to know that alongside my Labor colleagues, I am fighting for you in the Senate and I am fighting for the children you care for. Nothing will ever steer me off course from that work. Happy Early Childhood Educator Day and thank you for everything that you do. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Steele John remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We are in a climate crisis, yet the major parties are continuing to uh, approve fossil fuel projects uh, to support the corporations who donate to them instead of taking the action that our community needs. In the beautiful Kimberley here in West Australia, there is currently an application by an Australian gas corporation to establish fracking wells. Now, this application uh, Operation opening up 20 gas wells uh, in this pristine part of the country using 40 million litres of our precious water. As a community, it is clear that we fear that once this corporation gets a foot in, they will be a driving force behind more wells, more profits and more environmental destruction. The consequences, of course, of fracking are clear. It pollutes the air, contaminates our drinking water and destroys our precious places. But WA Labor are continuing, regardless, to allow uh, the Kimberley to be fracked by gas corporations and their billionaire owners. I would like to be absolutely clear. The Greens will always oppose fracking. And I would like also to take a moment to acknowledge the 
community organisations, including the Motawarra Fitzroy River Council, Environs Kimberley and Frat Free WA, for their work in making submissions to the Environmental Protection Authority and for enabling others to do so. I'd like to thank the many community members who have taken time to make a submission. The Greens in the community know that we need to stop all new gas, oil uh, and coal projects now in this critical decade if we are to stop climate change. Fracking the Kimberley will contribute to destroying our uh, climate, but it is not too late. Together, we can stop the Kimberley from being fracked. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Patrick, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Social housing was once viewed by Australian governments as an important safety net for low-income families. But over the last 30 years, this has changed and Australia is now facing a social housing time bomb with looming shortfalls of nearly 200,000 homes by 2031. A report this week, uh, released this week from Compass Housing uh, Service has outlined that across the country, there are approximately 169,000 households on social housing waiting lists. In my home state of South Australia, the current waiting list is 17,051. We're at a tipping point. We need the federal government to step in immediately with more support for social housing. This can't be like uh, the bushfires or lockdowns or hotel quarantine or many other issues that Scott Morrison has uh, tried to palm off as, st as state problems. Home ownership rates have fallen across the nation. The cost of living has gone up uh, right across Australia. Too many Australians simply cannot afford to compete uh, for housing in the uh, sales or rental market. There is a national uh, problem that requires federal leadership. What's more problematic is that uh, in the, whilst all of this is happening, we are allowing companies to funnel money by way of JobKeeper payments from the taxpayer through to the wallets of executives, uh, to the wallets of investors, billions of dollars that uh, should not have been spent on some of these companies. They didn't need it and they claimed for it uh, uh, whilst legally uh, but without uh, ethical uh, consideration. This money could go to a number of social housing Thank programs. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Pratt um, in the chamber. There are some nearly 29,000 people in Australia living with HIV, and thanks to treatment advances, it is now a treatable chronic illness. But there are still people in Australia going without treatment and potentially transmitting HIV. Some 3,000 people in 2019 were unaware they were positive. But every day there are unsung heroes making a remarkable difference to supporting people with HIV and in preventing its transmission. Behind the scenes in healthcare, support services, in positive communities and undertaking research and education. And countless allies helping to educate people and break down stigma. To help recognise and celebrate these inspiring contributors to the community, the National Association of People Living with HIV Australia NAPWA, and Gilead Sciences Australia and New Zealand are joining forces to launch this week the 2021 Community Champions Campaign. This could be someone who works in research, care, support, advocacy, policy, and I know many of these people in rural or remote communities or a much-loved ally or work colleague, a parent, a partner, people doing amazing things in this space. Champion stories are going to be brought to life through this campaign and launched uh, at an event on 25th of November, ahead of World AIDS Day on the 1st of December. We know the ongoing investment in HIV treatment and prevention can save billions of dollars and can save lives. It is why it is so important to bring to light the important work that's being done by so many in our community. I commend NAPWA and Gilead Sciences you, for launching Pratt. this campaign. Senator McKim, remotely. 
The Kaina Tarkine contains unique and precious Aboriginal heritage, spectacular wilderness and Australia's largest tract of temperate rainforest. It is deeply saddening that Environment Minister Susan Lay recently refused to list it for national heritage protection that it is so worthy of and that it is so overdue for. Now, just yesterday, the same minister amended Venture Minerals permit for their Riley mine in the Tarkine to remove a condition that ore could only be transported during daylight hours. That condition was imposed to protect threatened Tasmanian devils from becoming roadkill at night. Now, thanks to a minister in the thrall of the mining sector, it will be open slather with all laden trucks travelling 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is Tasmanian devils that will pay the price with their lives. Once again, profits take precedence over wildlife and nature. This is the very attitude that is causing our climate to break down around us and the mass extinction event that we are living through. It's no wonder that Professor Graham Samuel recently found that the EPBC Act is, and I quote Professor Samuel, not fit to address current or future environmental challenges. Obviously, given her track record, neither is the minister. I want to end by sending a massive thank you to the brave people who are working in the movement and out on the ground, putting their bodies on the line to protect Takan Tarkine from the loggers and the miners. You are the true heroes of our times, and history will record you as such. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise today to talk about our recently announced agricultural visa. This has been a long-held initiative of the country Liberal Party and the National Party, and I am very glad that it is going to come into effect from the 30th of this month. And this will complement our already existing seasonal worker program, which has been so vital and so successful in the Northern Territory. Uh, this will rely on us having bilateral agreements with the countries that we are going to invite these workers to come from. And I hope uh, that these bilateral agreements will be able to be brought into play and, uh, and nutted out and agreed to very shortly to allow territory producers and farmers to take advantage of this agricultural visa. Uh, the next part of the puzzle that we need <clears throat> is to be able to have quarantine arrangements particularly during COVID, for these workers. Now, this has been a struggle, even under the seasonal worker program, to get the Northern Territory government to agree to quarantine arrangements. I'm very, very glad to see that we have 160 people arrived from Vanuatu that have gone into quarantine for their two weeks and that will be available for the Northern Territory mango harvest. But it was disappointing that one of our biggest producers Catherine-based Nino Misaforo had to have his workers quarantine in WA because the Northern Territory would not make places available for them. We've done the heavy lifting here, the federal government. We've provided these visas, we've provided these programs, and all we ask of the states and territories is that they come to the party and they support their people in agriculture, their farmers, their producers, and support them by providing places for these workers to be able to complete their quarantine so they can go onto farms and produce Order. vital Senator food. Senator McMahon. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Well, we all know Mr Morrison is shameless when it comes to spin, but his most shameless spin yet is that he is the one who offers Australia a pathway to reopening, when he is the one most responsible for us not being open when his failure to order enough vaccines and his failure to roll out the vaccine and his failure to build fit for purpose national quarantine to stop the virus from entering the country are the very reasons we are locked down or unable to reach our loved ones. And now he has the audacity to spin himself as the saviour when the one we actually need saving from is Mr Morrison. If it weren't for him, we wouldn't be in this mess. The pattern is clear. Mr Morrison dodges responsibility, only acts when it is too late. 
blames everyone else when everything goes wrong and actually even says everything is a matter for the states. So it's only reasonable for Australians to be worried that he will do the same when it comes to reopening, which is why people are asking questions about how Mr Morrison is going to deliver reopening, contesting and tracing keep up with so many cases in the community. Can we keep vulnerable communities safe after they've been so dangerously exposed by Mr Morrison's failures? Can our hospitals cope if there are thousands of cases in the community? And how will Mr Morrison keep our children safe? Everyone knows that over time we need to be able to live with the virus. The emphasis is on living, living safely. It can't be about just casually accepting more people dying. Mr Morrison led us into lockdown. He's not the one to lead us out of it. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Queensland markets itself as the Sunshine State, but for people holed up in quarantined hotels, sunshine is just some light source they can see from behind their locked doors. Maybe under this Labor state government, it's more appropriate to put state of paralysis or state of confusion on our number plates. The Queensland government insists people must quarantine in, ho in hotels at great personal expense. Uh, but just last week it approved interstate boarding school students to quarantine at home with their families. I fully support this move, but the question must be asked why the convenience of home quarantine can't be extended to the wider population. After putting up the no vacancy sign on quarantine hotels last week and preventing people, even native Queenslanders, from coming home, Premier Palaszczuk suddenly found room for cricketers and the families of NRL players. The continual flip-flopping of COVID quarantine policy in Queensland is a direct reflection of a governing style that's based on focus groups, public relations flax and image consultants, rather than evidence-based practical action. The insistence on hotel quarantine and the resulting halt to new arrivals have presented doctors from uh, working from people attending uh, funerals and seeing Order. gravely Senator ill Macdonald, relatives. It being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Pratt. But my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. In an article this morning, Australian entitled Feds Muscle Up on Borders, the Attorney General warned state governments they may once again face high court challenges to force their borders open. Given the Morrison Joyce government has now or, spent or, 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 more than or, or, sorry, $1 Senator million. Pratt, dollars. Senator Pratt, I'm gonna, I, 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 on my right, I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions. Could you commence from the word given, Senator Pratt? I got the pre preface to the question. Thank you. Given the Morrison Joyce government has spent more than $1 million on taxpayers, of taxpayers' money supporting Clive Palmer's High Court challenge to the West Australian borders, Will the minister now guarantee that the Morrison Joyce government will not spend any more taxpayers' money on challenging Western Australia's border decisions? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, and I am so glad that Senator Pratt read that article. And Senator Pratt, can I say, uh, the journalist completely sensationalised uh, what was said. Let me Order. be very clear to you. Let Order. me be very clear, because what we have Order is Labor in Western Australia, and my Western Australian Order. Liberal colleagues Senator would understand this. These are just more Labor lies. Let me be very clear, Senator Pratt, Order. for the Channel 7, the Channel 9, the ABC Order. and the Channel 10 news tonight. The Commonwealth will not challenge Western Australia's border closures in the High Court, Order. and we will not in any way support Clive Palmer. Can I be clearer? I do not believe so. What we are doing, Order, Mr Senator President, Watt, what we are doing is working with the states and territories through the national plan. That is what we are doing working with the states and territories to implement the national plan Order. to reopen. And on any analysis, and my Western Australian colleagues would agree with me, we have actually done incredibly well in Western Australia. Mr McGowan has done incredibly well in keeping COVID-19 out 
of Western Australia. But the states and territories have now agreed to the national plan. And at 80 per cent, when 80 per cent of Australians and Western Australians are vaccinated, and I'm so pleased to see Western Australians every day, more and more of them, putting their arms out and saying, I will be vaccinated. The question becomes for Mr McGowan, if not at 80 per cent, then when? That's all it comes down to. If not at 80 per cent, then Order. when? But let me be Order clear, the Commonwealth will right. not challenge Western Australia's border closures in the high Order, court. Senator Cash. Across the chamber on my left and right, I know if I can't hear Senator Cash, it's not my hearing. It means there is too much noise. Senator Pratt. Has the Attorney General, Prime Minister or any other member of the government started discussions with Clive Palmer regarding future legal challenges? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. And let me make it clear again to Senator Pratt. The Commonwealth will not challenge Western Australia's border closures in the High Court, and we will not support any challenge to Western Australia's border closures by Clive Palmer. What we are doing, though, what we are doing is working with the states and territories, working with the states and territories in relation Order. to the implementation of the national plan. And in Western Australia, I understand, Mr President, we've now reached 50 per cent of Western Australians have had their first dose. That is actually a good thing. And very shortly you'll get to 60 per cent, then 70 per cent, and then 80 per cent. And once we're at 80 per cent, the question does become, what do we all do at 80 per cent? But we are working with the states and territories, as agreed, through the National Cabinet to implement the National Order. Plan for reopening. Order. On my left and right. Order. Senator Pratt, final supplementary question. Why is the Morrison-Joyce government more focused on attacking Premier Mark McGowan and Western Australians rather than taking responsibility for their failures on quarantine and on the rollout of the vaccines? Again, again, again. I am going to ask for silence during questions. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I certainly don't believe that I in any way knocked Mr. McGowan. In fact, what I think I said, in fact, I, what I know I said is, Mr. McGowan has done a very, very good job as the Premier of Western Australia in keeping our state relatively COVID-free. I commend Mr Gowan for the work that is undertaken, and that is why the National Cabinet has agreed to the National Plan for reopening. That is why the Prime Minister, every day, he goes out and he says to Australians, you understand that sticking to the National Plan is the key to getting back to as normal life as we can whilst living with COVID-19. And as I said, it is very pleasing, Mr President, that over 50 per cent or 50 per cent of, Austra of Western Australians have now received their first dose of the vaccine. That is a good thing. And we want to see more and more Western Australians receive that first dose so that we can eventually do what the National Plan Order. says Senator and Cash, live time with for the COVID-19. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is Senator to Watt. the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister advise the Senate what the June 2021 national accounts demonstrate about Australia's economic performance during the COVID-19 pandemic and how the Liberals and Nationals government plan continues to protect Australians and support Australian jobs and businesses in the face of current challenges? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hughes very much for her question. And well, Mr. President, although we continue to be in the middle uh, of a global pandemic, the greatest economic shock uh, that Australia and indeed the world have faced since the Great Depression, the Australian people and the Australian economy continue to show enormous levels of resilience. Uh, as we look at the recent period of time reflected in the national accounts figures released today, it shows that during that quarter, even with 29 days, of lockdown occurring across at least one part of the country, indeed including five out of eight jurisdictions across that quarter, we still saw strong economic growth. Real GDP 
growing by 0.7% in the quarter to be a record 9.6% higher throughout the year. This was clearly well above median market expectations. And this rise in GDP was broad-based, broad-based encompassing household consumption, public final demand, business investment and dwelling investment, all contributing to growth across the quarter. Our economy does, of course, continue to face significant challenges at this point in time, especially across those states still in lockdown. But it is an economy that remains bigger than it was before the lockdown. And although the Delta virus is challenging us, just as it's challenging those who struggled with COVID last year, such as the US or UK, or challenging those struggling with the Delta strain this year, such as our friends in New Zealand or others, we absolutely have the economic support in place, some $311 billion providing income support, business support and assistance, which will ensure that Australia, if we stick to the plan, getting vaccinated, reopening, is going to continue to have health and economic outcomes, very much the envy of the world through these most challenging of times. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how does Australia's economic and health performance during the COVID-19 pandemic compare internationally? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, indeed, Australia's health and economic performance have been world leading. And we were the first advanced economy in the world to see both the size of our economy, our GDP, and our employment market jobs levels surpass those pre-pandemic levels. More than one million jobs have been created across the Australian economy since May last year. And with an estimated 160,000 more Australians in work than before the pandemic, notwithstanding the current lockdown challenges and difficulties, our unemployment rate decreased for nine consecutive months, falling to 4.6% in July. And in terms of health outcomes, while we've tragically seen millions of deaths occurring overseas and still significant daily deaths around the world, in Australia, we've saved an estimated 30,000 lives as part of that health response. Tragic though the loss of life is in Australia, there is much to be proud of in terms of the way we have managed uh, this pandemic and managed to do so, saving the lives and livelihoods of so many of our fellow yeah, Australians. Uh, Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How can all Australians play their part in delivering the national plan agreed by National Cabinet and why is this critical to ensuring confidence in our recovery and securing Australia's future? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our national plan is about safely opening up, safely ensuring that Australia can return to a greater level of pre-COVID normality than was the case. It's about a plan to provide confidence for business, confidence that states doing it tough like right now, like New South Wales, can see restrictions ease as vaccination rates climb, but equally confidence that states like my own in South Australia, Western Australia or elsewhere, uh, who have continued to successfully suppress COVID in, in highly suppressive ways, are equally able to be able to see a normalisation, including ultimately a normalisation of travel arrangements, as they too hit higher and higher vaccination rates. How Australians help us to get there is to keep turning out in record numbers getting vaccinated. Yet again, we saw huge numbers of vaccinations occur across the country yesterday, more than 330,000 doses administered, running at a per capita rate in excess of what the UK or the US have achieved Order. at any point of their Senator vaccine Birmingham, rollouts. Time it's a rate we determined has expired. Continue. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Does the national plan require First Nations vaccination rates to match the rest of the Australian population before reopening? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator McCarthy, for the question. Uh, the national plan, uh, which has been publicly released for everybody to see, Mr President, contemplates uh, a number of thresholds, 70 per cent and 80 per cent vaccination rates across the country, uh, in a, to facilitate a staged process to safely open up the Australian community again, uh, to facilitate movement, uh, to reactivate our economy. Uh, in support of all Australians, Mr President. It doesn't discriminate 
against Indigenous or any other community. To, to be frank, Mr. President, we want to see vaccination rates in every single community as high as possible. We urge that, Mr. President. Uh, and with respect to Indigenous Australians uh, and their vaccination, that's why we prioritise them understanding the sensitivities that existed with respect to Indigenous communities. That's why we opened uh, vaccination to Indigenous Australians in Phase 1B uh, on the 22nd of March last year, Mr. President. That's why we did that. We made vaccines available to Indigenous Australians very early in the piece, Mr. President. Or, or very Senator early Colbeck, piece. I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Uh, on relevance. Mr. President, um, this was deliberately a very tight question about whether the plan requires First Nations vaccination rates, and we haven't had an answer on that yet. Um, well, with respect, I think um, Senator Colbeck, in, I was listening very carefully because I appreciate it was a very short, sharp question. Senator Colbeck, I believe, said, addressed that by saying the plan did not discriminate, I believe was the phrase he used. I believe if to go any further would be requiring me to instruct a minister how to answer a question, but I believe he's being directly relevant through his answer thus far. A question can be debated after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the plan seeks to see all Australians vaccinated as soon as possible. And can I, Mr President, join with Senator Dodson in his condemnation uh, over the last 24 hours or so um, in an article that I've seen today of those who are peddling anti-vaccine messages into Indigenous communities. I agree, I agree with Senator Dodson uh, fundamentally, Mr Order. President, uh, and the government will continue to work with Indigenous communities, with state governments, uh, with the Archos, in the interests of getting as many Australians, Order. including Senator Indigenous Colbeck, people, vaccinated as possible. Order. expired. Order. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Will the Morrison government guarantee First Nations vaccination rates will match those of the rest of the population before reopening at 70 and 80 per cent, Minister? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the whole concept of the plan is to ensure that we can safely open the Australian community for all Australians, including Indigenous Australians. It's very important. We understood right from the outset the importance and the vulnerability of Indigenous Australians. That's why we set up a specific task force to work with the Indigenous Australians to support them through the pandemic. That's why we prioritised Indigenous Australians in Category 1B of access to the vaccine, uh, and that access was made available immediately. Uh, 1B opened on the 22nd of March this year. So Indigenous Australians have and continue to have priority access Senator to— Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Again on relevance, Mr President, th these have been deliberately tight questions, and this one's about whether the government will guarantee First Nations vaccination rates. I won't read the entire thing no, out. I, but I appreciate that, Senator Watt, and I, I, I've been listening carefully. This would not be appropriate question to talk about a general national commentary on the national plan or vaccination, but while the minister is specifically addressing Indigenous Australians' rates of vaccinations and programs, I think that is directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate the question after question time, but I can't instruct him on a particular word in a question. But by remaining tightly relevant to the um, terms of the question and the subject matter, I believe that it qualifies as directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. So we will continue to work with the Indigenous communities to ensure that their vaccination rates are as high as possible. We have provided specific resources, uh, developed and tailored specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander audiences, to educate them and to and to mitigate Order, the Senator negative Colbeck, messages coming from the some has sources. Senator McCarthy, a Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Mr President, the Prime Minister has failed to deliver on his promise to vaccinate 1B priority groups by winter and today, on the first day of spring, less than 20 per cent of First Nations Australians have been fully vaccinated. How many First Nations Australians will be unvaccinated and at risk of COVID-19 when the targets of 70 and 80 per cent are reached? Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said, our objective is to ensure that all Australians have access to the vaccine, including Indigenous Australians, and that's why specific measures have been put in place by the government to ensure that they can. We continue to work closely with the Archos, who I have to say are doing a really good job in working with Indigenous communities. I again condemn, I again condemn the negative messages being spread into some Indigenous communities, and I'm sure, Senator McCarthy, you would join me in doing that, that are frightening Australian Indigenous people Order. off being vaccinated. Order. We are working with those communities. We are working with those communities. Uh, we are adapting specific programs that have been run for the more broader community, Order. specifically to Indigenous communities, so that they can understand the importance of vaccination uh, and they can that they then participate in the vaccination process, Mr. President. So we will, and we will continue to do that, understanding how important vaccination Order, is Senator to Indigenous Colbert, Australians. The answer has expired, Senator Bragg. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workplace, sorry, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the $311 billion in direct health and economic support? provided by the Liberal and Nationals government is continuing to protect lives and livelihoods during the pandemic, and how this support is ensuring that our economy remains resilient as we implement the national plan agreed by National Cabinet. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And, uh, certainly, with the release of today's national accounts, we continue to see the resilience of the Australian economy. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the coalition government, we have been focused on protecting the lives and the livelihoods of Australians. And as I've said in this place before, and certainly as the former small business minister, small businesses, though, as we know, they continue to do it tough. Many are in and out of lockdown. We just need to look to New South Wales, to Victoria, and here now in the ACT. And this, of course, continues to create uncertainty for them. But that is why, in terms of the policies that we are putting in place as a government, we provided in the budget this year an additional $20.7 billion in tax relief to businesses over the next four years. And this, of course, includes the extension of the immediate expensing measure, and that is helping around 99 per cent of businesses in Australia to reinvest back into their businesses. Because as Senator Bragg knows, uh, as a government, uh, we understand that there are some businesses, Senator Bragg, that have that capacity to reinvest. And we want those businesses to be able to access government policy to do exactly that. Prosper, grow, invest in their business and create more jobs for Australians. But Mr President, we also recognise that Many businesses continue to face the uncertainty, and in particular uh, in terms of lockdowns. And that is why we have worked with the states and the territories through the National Cabinet to provide temporary targeted grants to small and family businesses to assist them to get through the lockdowns and to assist them in relation to the impacts of the lockdowns. We've gone further in terms of our policies by expanding our small and medium size business loan scheme. And certainly this has been appreciated Order. by Senator the business Cash. community. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How are the government's business investment incentives helping Australian businesses to grow, prosper and create jobs for Australians? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, when you look at the business investment numbers that came out uh, for the June quarter, what they showed was business investment was actually up by 4.4 per cent. And importantly, non-mining investment was up by 6 per cent, and it's now up by 15 per cent for the year. This is actually the strongest growth in non-mining investment in more than 13 years. That is a good thing for this sector. And the significant increase is a result of our government's measures to incentivise businesses, even during these challenging times, again, to invest, to invest back into themselves through the immediate expensive expensing measure. If you look at order books across Australia, they're actually filling up. And again, that is a good thing for those businesses who have that capacity to invest. They're replacing old equipment with new equipment, utilising the government's policies. And what this does 
is assist in their efficiency and ultimately Order. their productivity. Senator, Cash, Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How is the national plan giving small and family businesses the confidence they need so we can secure Australia's future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the national plan, and as we know, this is an agreement. Uh, National Cabinet, the Commonwealth Government, agreed by all states and territories. This is our pathway forward in learning to live with COVID-19 and at the same time get back to the freedoms that we've given up in so many instances to combat COVID-19. What the National Plan is doing when you talk to businesses, and in particular small businesses around Australia, it sends them that message of hope. They know there is now a clear plan to move through various stages. It gives them that hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. This is actually giving businesses the confidence that they need. And obviously, part of that national plan is increasing vaccination rates across Australia. In the last 14 days, we've seen over 3.7 million vaccinations across our nation. That is a good thing, and Australians, they should be commended for that. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia. Three years ago, more than 100 dogs died as a result of eating a particular brand of dry dog food. Since then, no effective action has been taken. Now, in fact, in recent weeks, there's been a spate of dog deaths linked to tainted raw pet meat. Now, pet owners have been waiting for more than three years since the last Senate inquiry that I instigated to see action on pet food safety. Now, we have been advised that the report of the Minister's Pet Food Working Group would be considered by state agriculture ministers last month, and now it seems this won't happen until next month, maybe. Minister, why have agriculture ministers still not met to discuss this report? What is the delay? And why isn't there more urgency, given that we keep having more dog deaths while we wait? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff, uh, not only for his question, but for his concern on behalf of pet owners across the country. The pet food, uh, I'm advised the Pet Food Working Group was established with agreement of all agriculture ministers, is currently finalising its advice to the ministers. Uh, the report of the Pet Food Working Group will be considered by agriculture senior, senior officials in September 2021, so this month. Uh, so it has to go to those senior officials before then going to um, state and federal agricultural ministers at their MINCO, uh, which is planned to be held next month for decision. I, uh, Minister Little Proud has responded to the letter signed by the RSPCA the Australian Veterinary Association and the Pet Food Industry Association, informing them of the status of the report of the Pet Food Working Group. He's also written to agriculture ministers across the country to inform them of expected timing for advice to be received from the Pet Food Review Working Group, as implementation of any regulatory options for pet food remains a decision for state and territory governments. So it comes to the MINCO uh, next month. It will then be up to each and every state and territory to then return home to their jurisdiction and implement uh, a, any decision that that body makes. Now, some are obviously going to be quicker at doing that than others. Some will have more will at doing that than others. We're making their decision. Minister Little Proud has asked ministers to consider the working group report and the desire by many for a positive outcome for pet and pet owners when deciding on the best way forward to ensure the safety of pet food. Uh, he is also aware of the report of deaths in pet dogs linked to the consumption of raw pet meat from a knackery in Victoria. Since the end of May, it has been reported that at least 24 pet dogs have died and 68 Order. have been hospitalised in Victoria. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, the RSPCA, the Australian Veterinary Association, and the industry peak body, the Pet Food Industry Association, have also taken issue, of course, with the delayed reforms, and they are particularly calling for a mandatory standard and mandatory recalls, as the Senate inquiry recommended. Will the states entertain these particular recommendations, or are they doomed? 
Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Griff. Well, as I um, outlined in my previous answer, these, this will be a decision for state and territory ministers whether to adopt a uh, mandatory or voluntary regulatory framework. Uh, so that decision obviously isn't going to be made till next month. So it's a bit premature um, to be making a call on that. That's obviously a decision for those ministers in that forum. But the bodies you spoke about, the RSPCA, the Australian Veterinary Association and the Pet Food Industry Association's concerns uh, have been made clear, not just to the Federal Agriculture Minister, but I imagine uh, to jurisdictional ministers as well. Um, Agriculture Victoria and Prime Safe, as the responsible regulatory agencies in Victoria, led the investigation to um, the dog deaths that I, and hospitalisations I mentioned in my earlier answer. Um, and they found that there was a toxin found in native plants in northern Australia has been com confirmed Order, as the cause. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Yes, Minister, I, I appreciate what you're saying and the fact that the states uh, do have the final say, but a key issue has been uh, no proper mechanism on a national basis for mandatory recalls. Should the states opt not to uh, uh, do what the industry associations wish to do, would you or would the minister consider uh, dealing and working out some format that could work on a national basis? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Well, there are strong food safety regulatory controls in place to prevent pet meat entering the human food supply chain, but I do appreciate you are speaking uh, about the animal uh, food supply chain. Responsibility uh, for the domestic oversight of raw pet meat and processed pet food sits with the states and territories. The Commonwealth's responsibilities extend to regulation and certification of exported pet food and addressing the biosecurity risks of imported pet food. Um, as I said, the minister has welcomed uh, the parliamentary inquiry into pet food industry and our government's response to the recommendations was tabled in parliament on the 18th of June. Um, and your report considers recommend that the report that is coming before senior officials and um, the agriculture ministers over coming months considers the recommendations of your Senate uh, committee report and will include regulatory and non-regulatory options to manage the health Order, and safety Senator of pet McKenzie. food in Senator Australia. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister inform the Senate of the ongoing investment by the Liberal and Nationals government into water infrastructure projects in Queensland? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Canavan, for your question and your continuing champion of critical water projects for Queensland. Providing vital infrastructure to regional Australia is key to our nation's recovery from COVID-19, and getting water out infrastructure out into regional Australia will provide them for a great platform to grow and prosper. We need it for the businesses that underpin our regional communities, create local jobs and support the way of life of thousands of regional Australians who wouldn't want to live anywhere else other than, I would say, Senator Canavan in central Queensland, with uh, respect to you and your colleague. The Liberal National Government is getting on with the job of building new water infrastructure to meet the needs of regional Australia. Projects such as Rookwood Weir and the proposed Urana Dam are key elements to delivering for regional Australians who rely on vital water infrastructure. Since the establishment of the National Water Grid Fund in 2015, the Australian Government has committed $1.9 billion towards water infrastructure projects in Australia, 30 construction projects, eight of which are complete, six are underway and a further eight are expected to start construction uh, in this financial year. Major projects under construction include the Rookwood Weir, a $183.6 million Australian government commitment that will support 200, 200 jobs during construction, and the Mariba Dimbula water supply scheme, an $11.6 million Australian government commitment due for completion in early 2022. And when we come to the Emu Swamp Dam, project near Stanhope, constructing a 12 gigalitre dam on the uh, Severn Seven? Seven Seven, uh, River. The dam will increase water security and provide growers with the confidence and certainty to expand agriculture production. 
Further, we've committed $4.8 million in Queensland through the grid uh, connections funding pathway. This is an initiative about driving the construction of smaller scale projects to improve water security and reliability right across the nation. Order. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What are the benefits of projects such as Rookwood Weir and the proposed Urana Dam, especially in terms of supporting reliable power and jobs in North Queensland? Senator McKenzie. I want to acknowledge the efforts of my National Party colleagues in the other place, the member for Dawson, George Christensen, and the member for Capricornia, Michelle Landry, who have been both uh, very, very strong advocates for the Rookwood Weir and the Urana Dam project. The proposed Urana Dam project will be transformational as it will open up vast tracts of high-use agricultural land and create more than 1,800 jobs during construction and in operation. It will provide vital water security to the region and additional water storage of up to 1.5 million megalitres and facilitate an irrigation project of up to 25,000 hectares. Water for the project will underpin the need of the Burdekin's beef, sugar, fruit and vegetable industries, keeping our farmers producing the top quality foods they're renowned for. The planned Urana Dam will also be a hydro power station that will help back up the solar power and renewables in the regions, and it will back up the power needs of North Queensland for approximately eight hours. We've also committed an additional $7.5 million to the Wookwood Weir Senator project. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, how is the development of water infrastructure more broadly enabling growth in regional Australia? And why is this important to unlocking the value of our regions to help secure a recovery from COVID-19? Senator McKenzie. Well, we are growing regional Australia by adding the one ingredient you must have to grow anything, and that's water. In the 2021 budget, the Liberal and Nationals government invested a further $258 million from the $3.5 billion National Water Grid Fund. This includes funding towards 12 new priority water infrastructure projects. And since 2015, our government has committed $1.8 billion for 30 projects. Our investments will provide water into the future and unlock the economic potential for new and expanded agriculture. New or augmented projects include the Urella Urella Badella Southern Storage Project in New South Wales, the Werribee Irrigation District modernisation and recycled water on the Bellarine, the project in Victoria, the Warwick Recycled Water for Agriculture Recycled Water Treatment Upgrade Project in Queensland. And we've also delivered eight projects that are fully operational in South Australia and the Scottsdale Irrigation Scheme in Tasmania. Our investments will secure Order, the future Senator of the regions. McKenzie. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Morrison government MPs have asked the Prime Minister to fund chaplains in every school to allay young people's concerns about climate change. Minister, does your government seriously believe it's climate experts and activists that are robbing children of hope? Is it your government's view that the best way of dealing with climate concerns is with religion and prayer? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for the question. As far as I'm aware, Senator Hanson Young was not in the Coalition Party room yesterday, did not hear uh, the type of comments that were being made, and I can tell her through you, Mr. President, that she is completely misguided in the way in which she is characterising those remarks. It is certainly true uh, that Coalition members and senators have expressed their strong support for a program that provides assistance to young people. Uh, in terms of navigating the many challenges of life, but particularly at these times where we see enormous additional stresses as a result of COVID-19 being placed on many young people in the environments in which they're studying and seeking to move ahead. So many young Australians have missed out on the traditional rites of passage or normal activities they go through in their schooling lives. Uh, and this has created enormous additional stresses and pressures and the work indeed of teachers, of educators, of school chaplains, of psychologists, of all of those who are supporting young Australians through these challenging and difficult times is to be commended uh, and indeed to be supported in terms of the assistance they're providing. Now, young Australians know that there are many different challenges they face in the world, uh, but of course, for them individually to get ahead, what's most important is for them to receive the opportunities of education and the opportunities of employment. And as a government, our focus very clearly is on delivering 
those opportunities. And when it comes to tackling climate change that you raised, Senator, it's about making sure that we tackle it in ways that don't hurt the opportunities for young Australians to get a job. Our technology, not taxes, approach to tackling climate change is about ensuring Australia's economy transitions, transitions in ways that give young Australians the best possible opportunity to still get a job, to still live in a country with one of the best living standards in the world, but to do so while we drive ourselves towards uh, the ambition of net zero emissions. That's the best pathway forward to give hope and opportunity to young Australians, to give them a job, to give them the support that can give them confidence to succeed. Order. And we're the government time to for have created so many expired. jobs. Senator Hanson Young, a uh, supplementary you. question. Thank you, Mr. President. The US, UK, and the world's leading scientists are pleading with the Australian government to commit to a stronger 2030 target ahead of the COP summit in Glasgow in November. Will you be sending chaplains to Glasgow to allay the concerns of world leaders? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, you know, the Greens come in and pretend that they want us to take issues seriously and then feed up drivel like that. And the reality is we're going to go to Glasgow with some very strong messages, some very strong messages. We'll go to Glasgow with the strong message that Australia, in terms of our Kyoto 1 target and our Kyoto 2 target, has met and exceeded those targets. And unlike many countries in the world, when we've made a commitment, we've delivered upon it. We'll go to Kyoto with firm policies that we've outlined in terms of our investment in renewable energies, our investment in other technologies, but crucially, the stretch goals we've outlined that don't just talk about how to get to net zero or don't just talk about achieving net zero, but talk about how to get to net zero, how to get to net zero through investment in hydrogen, how to get to net zero through investment in low emission steel, in low emissions aluminium, how to get to net zero through investment in soil carbon, We'll be going to Glasgow with very clear policies, very clear plans, and a track record that frankly Order. exceeds Senator that of Birmingham. the other countries. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary. Thank you, question. Mr. President. Will the government rule out funding more chaplains as a way of dealing with young people's legitimate climate concerns and instead put a halt to the expand of fossil fuels and a proper 2030 target? Or is your government's new policy on climate change thoughts and prayers? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, a uh, pre scripted question there from Senator Hanson Young, no doubt designed to be able to distribute it on, uh, on social media platforms, but not listening at all to the answers that I've given today. The answers I've given today are outlining exactly what we intend to take to Glasgow in terms of our ambitions to drive towards net zero, but more importantly, our plans, our track record, plans and track record that show Australia doesn't just make vague promises, Australia delivers on our promises. Australia is investing as a nation in terms of investment that sees us have investment in renewable and rooftop solar at rates far and above much of the rest of the world. In terms of investment by government in the technology changes that will drive us forward as a country while preserving the job opportunities for young Australians. That is what the Greens should be caring about, getting that mix right that gives us a low emissions pathway, but also ensures young Australians can still have the job opportunities that our government has delivered in record numbers. And we have seen, as I said Order. in the answer today, Senator million jobs generated recently and our aim is for many inspired. more. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence. It's almost two years since the then Defence Minister, Senator Reynolds, advised on 6PR radio that a decision would be made on the location of the Collins full cycle dockings by December 2019. Another Christmas has passed. It looks like a third Christmas will pass without a decision being made. What is standing in the way of a decision being made and when will the uncertainty associated with the Collins workforce down in Adelaide uh, be resolved. The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question and some advance notice uh, of the topic. Uh, may I say, uh, in response, uh, Mr President, uh, I disagree with the, uh, the point Senator Patrick made at the end of his question. Uh, the government's been very clear in relation to uh, the activities uh, both in, uh, in South Australia and Western Australia, which are vital uh, to the sustainment of the, uh, the submarine fleet. 
the decision has not been made in relation to the future location for Collins class submarine full cycle docking, uh, and it is the view of the government that uh, we should consider the options uh, that are put to government after full examination uh, by the appropriate uh, agencies uh, in due course, and we will do that, as we have consistently said. Uh, and I want to assure the Senate and assure Senator Patrick that a decision on Collins class submarine full cycle docking location doesn't impact. Uh, on the currently planned work on the life of type extension activities for uh, the Collins class submarine. It is important that the process that is underway is allowed to conclude uh, and uh, when an announcement is ready to be made, it will be made. It will be made about, uh, based on what is in our national interests after the proper consideration of all of the relevant information and advice that is brought to government. Senator Patrick, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, it's not, it's not in dispute that the government intends to conduct the life of type extension during the full cycle documents. It's a significant body of work involving the change out of the submarine's main motor. It involves the change out of the submarine's diesels and significant electrical switchboard work. Does the minister agree that shifting full cycle dockings whilst at the same time embarking on a significant life of type extension will simply alter the risk profile too far uh, for the shift to occur. Senator Payne. Uh, no, Mr President. Um, the, in response to Senator Patrick's supplementary question, that is not the view uh, of the government. Uh, we've been obviously planning the extension of the service life of the Collins-class submarines uh, for some time. In fact, the planning commenced in uh, 2011. Uh, this government is actually uh, progressing the work itself. Uh, both defence and industry are continuing to progress the Collins-class submarine life of, of type extension work on schedule. Uh, to support the first boat that will need an extension, that's HMAS Farncombe, uh, and commencing in mid-2026. Uh, all six submarines will undergo life of type extension within the budget uh, that is uh, currently allocated, extending the life of each submarine by 10 years. And we are engaging uh, all of the expertise that we need to progress that life of type extension program uh, successfully. Uh, that includes support from sub, sub cockums to de-risk the delivery of the life of type uh, extension activities. But I don't agree Order. with the proposition Senator, Senator Patrick put Time. at the beginning of his question. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, I've been contacted by businesses uh, that are involved in the full cycle dockings here in South Australia, and there can be no question that the uncertainty of the future location of full cycle dockings is having an impact on business investment and uh, things like training of workforces and long term planning. Does the minister concede that the delays in the decision-making process is affecting business decisions? Order, Senator Patrick. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I, I note the observations that, uh, that Senator Patrick uh, has made, but I would also note uh, that this government's commitment to shipbuilding in South Australia is frankly unparalleled, and that includes the sort of work that uh, Senator Patrick is referring to. Our commitment is to building up to 23 vessels at Osborne, which totals over $120 billion out to the 2050s. Uh, it, uh, it sees the offshore patrol vessels uh, being built at Osborne by Lurson Australia, which is directly employing up to 400 workers. That includes some transitions from the um, Air Warf Warfare Destroyer program that uh, we successfully reformed and delivered. It includes the work of BAE Systems Maritime Australia, which is ramping up its production efforts with prototyping for the Hunter-class frigates. Uh, it includes the transformation of the Osborne Naval Shipyard itself into the national hub for advanced manufacturing of the most complex vessels uh, for the Royal Australian Navy. Order, uh, Senator the Payne. Time for the answer has expired. Sen Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. When did the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Joyce, make the final decision on the inland rail alignment in Queensland? When did Mr. Joyce advise Mr. Littleproud and Senator Macdonald of his decision? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the Inland Rail Project is one of the most iconic nation-building projects this Australia, that Australia has ever seen, and it has been delivered by the National Party in a Liberal National Government. Warren Truss announced the project as Infrastructure Minister, and since then it is uh, a, a very proud government that has stood by and watched this project proceed through the various iterations to see its fulfilment. We've now got track uh, being laid out right through uh, northwest New South Wales as it makes its way uh, north and south between um, Brisbane and Melbourne. It's a once-in-a-lifetime investment in uh, regional Australia, and as the current Deputy Prime Minister calls it, it will be absolutely a corridor of commerce. And I know some of senators uh, who take an interest in regional Australia's growth and development will have seen a fantastic— um, Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Keneally on a point of order. It is relevance, and I, I, I know the minister is speaking to something important, but it is a very tightly worded question. It just seeks to know when did the deputy prime minister make the final decision, and when did he advise Mr. Little Proud and Senator Macdonald? Yeah, There's I, no embroidery. It is just a simple I, factual question. I think the question goes to decision making, the alignment, and passing on of that to others. Like there are multiple elements of the question, but it goes to that. And I have been listening, but I'm going to ask you to turn to those elements of the question, Senator McKenzie, having been speaking for a minute, rather than a general description of the project. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. Well, in terms of the route decision, uh, there has been no change to where that has been planned through a whole variety of infrastructure ministers. Uh, over many, many years. There have been many studies and plans done, uh, on, particularly on the border to Gowrie route. Cabinet have agreed to a, a route, and uh, we as a government are sticking to that. I don't know, we, we don't need more reviews into this. The local community has been consulted, uh, the local MPs have been consulted. And my understanding is that Senator, uh, Senator McKenzie, I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Again, rather Vince, it was a very specific question. When did the Deputy Prime Minister make the final decision? Um, I, I think, with respect, the question re, um, did ask that. Um, it asked about the alignment and it asked about whether others were advised. I do believe the minister is being directly relevant when she was speaking about the route. I can't instruct them how to answer a question. The minister referred to decision-making upon a route by the cabinet. I, I, I can't rule that as not directly relevant to the question being asked. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. Well, um, I'm very happy to table the alignment of the inland rail route that's been agreed, that's been agreed for a long period of time. Uh, and that is actually cabinet has re-examined that and absolutely backs the decision of infrastructure ministers and the current route as it stands, and that will not be changing. Order. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, it's been reported that, along with Senator Macdonald, Mr Joyce recently met with community groups who felt misled by him over the inland rail route. Did Mr Joyce indicate at this meeting with community groups in Mr Littleproud's electorate or to his Nationals colleagues that he would consider an alternate route? Senator McKenzie. Oh, well, Senator Watt, I've been very clear, as has the Deputy Prime Minister, as has uh, the Deputy Leader of the Nationals. All National Party Cabinet Ministers support the decision of Cabinet, support the current route of the inland rail, uh, and they've been very, very clear about that. We want to go to one, what is clear also is that Labor has opposed the inland rail order. from the Senator McKenzie, start. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'll leave aside the misrepresentation uh, Senator McKenzie just made, given Labor started this Senator whole project. Watt, please come to uh, a point of order. The point of order is relevance. The point of order is relevance. The question is about the meeting that Mr. Joyce had with Senator Macdonald and community groups, and what was said to those community groups in that meeting. Um, the minister answered that part of the question, or was answering that part of the question, by um, um, if I could rule, Senator Watt, please. Um, 
I will let that glancing comment by Senator Mackenzie pass, as you said you would in your point of order. But the minister was answering the question by talking about the decision-making of the route and who supported it, it being a decision of the government. I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question, and there is a time to debate them in 10 minutes. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Now, this might come because uh, I just will read to the Senate the statement um, from the DPM. I made on the 25th of August 2021. The inland rail alignment is settled. It has been refined over a number of years and delivery is well underway. As I mentioned in my uh, first answer to you, the border to Gowrie section that includes the Condamine crossing has been developed by world-leading rail engineers experts and enhanced through community consultation. ARTC's flood modelling and the reference design for the crossing of the Condamine floodplain has been thoroughly Order. reviewed. Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. A private text message from Mr. Littleproud to Mr. Joyce, which happened to be published in The Australian, reads, and I quote, The Milmerran guys you spoke to on Friday would have preferred you either told them on Friday this or told them before a public statement from you. Why did Mr Joyce refuse to listen to Mr Littleproud's constituents and to his Nationals colleagues and instead announce publicly that the inland rail line was settled and well underway? Senator McKenzie. Uh, because, because, Senator Watt, that's exactly what the inland rail project is about. We have decided a route. The government has, as I've said, reviewed it. We've got the environmental impact statement. We've got Route reviews, multiple studies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different reviews. The government is very committed to the current alignment. That is what we're committed to delivering on. That is absolutely what the Deputy Prime Minister wants to see happen and uh, what the local community wants to see happen. I'm very happy to table third party endorsements from the community uh, affected. As I was saying, the panel's draft report. Uh, that's the panel of experts on flood studies in Queensland, found that the work undertaken by the ARTC would to be predominantly in accordance with national guidelines and current industry best practice. The border to Gowrie section has been subject to multiple studies and reviews. In 2020, a further independent Order. assessment Senator confirmed— Senator McKenzie, time for the answers expired. Senator Scar. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Here, here, indeed. Can the Minister advise the Senate how Australia is working with partners in our region to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic and how to support our region's economic recovery as soon as possible, helping to ensure that we can all recover stronger together? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Scar for his question and for his deep and abiding interest in uh, the neighbourhood and the Pacific. Our neighbourhood uh, continues to face unprecedented challenges from COVID, and no nation is immune from the virus, but we must tackle it together. And this government's getting on with the job of shaping a region which is safer healthier and more prosperous for all of us. Uh, we've now gifted over 2.1 million life-saving vaccines to our neighbourhood, because until everyone is safe from COVID, nobody is safe. And similarly, hundreds of thousands of Australian jobs depend on strong economic growth across our region. To support that growth, in 2021, we delivered a record $1.7 billion in support to the Pacific over 50 per cent higher than when Labor were last in office. And we've delivered over $1 billion in support to Southeast Asia. Together with a $1.5 billion loan to Indonesia, this represents our largest funding to Southeast Asia since the 2004 tsunami. Beyond our existing aid program, we've already delivered uh, nearly $200 million in emergency economic support to the Pacific. In Fiji, this funding is supporting social protection payments to the most vulnerable benefiting more than 100,000 Fijians. In Timor-Leste, we are supporting new infrastructure projects in more than half the nation's 450 villages, directly benefiting communities and economic recovery. 
In Solomon Islands, we're improving water supplies for more than 4,000 households and sanitation facilities for over 2,000 households. And we're rolling out critical infrastructure support in the region that support Pacific nations' long-term economic aspirations. We're investing in ports, roads, airports, energy generation and transmission and telecommunications. Our high-quality loan financing is in high demand. These are projects that will create jobs and unlock new opportunities, ushering an even stronger era of growth growth and partnership Order, between Senator Australia Selger. and the Pacific. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm pleased the minister touched on uh, assistance to Fiji in particular, and I note Queensland has a wonderful Fijian diaspora. Could the minister provide further detail with respect to how Australia is working with Fiji in their fight against COVID-19, and what support is Australia providing to the people of Fiji at this critical time? Senator Selger. Uh, well, thank you. And Senator Scar, you're right to reference the outstanding uh, diaspora here in Australia, and including in Brisbane. Fiji is one of Australia's closest partners in the region. Uh, the pandemic is having a grave impact on Fiji's people. Uh, but we're proud to be supporting our Fiji and Vivali at this time of need. Uh, in addition to our long-standing development program, we've provided over $80 million in emergency budget support to Fiji. We are directly funding doctors and nurses in the Fijian health system, and we've donated over 860,000 Australian vaccines. Now, with our support and our vaccines, Fiji is delivering a world-leading vaccine rollout with first-dose coverage of over 95 per cent of their target population and incredible performance. And we now have dispatched three Australian and New Zealand medical teams to Fiji. These teams have helped to save countless Fijian lives. Their efforts and their sacrifices will not be forgotten. As Fiji sent its military to help Australia rebuild from the 2020 bushfires, Order. we too Senator are standing Selger. by our partners the in their inspired. time of need. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr President. If I could lift the focus perhaps to uh, the Pacific more generally, noting the outstanding contribution of Pacific workers to the Queensland economy, could I ask the minister how is the Liberal and National Government assisting regional Australian businesses to access more Pacific workers as part of the national plan agreed by National Cabinet? And why is this important to securing our recovery from the pandemic, including in my home state of Queensland? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, and it's an outstanding question. Since our Pacific Labor initiatives recommenced in September last year, more than 10,600 Pacific workers have arrived from seven participating Pacific nations and Timor-Leste. In the next few weeks, another 1,000 Pacific workers will arrive, with a further 27,000 Pacific workers ready and waiting to come to Australia. Now, this is immediate action to address workforce shortages in regional Australia as part of the PM's commitment to double Pacific workers in Australia by March of 2022. We'll shortly announce practical improvements to these programs to offer greater flexibility and less red tape for Australian employers. These changes will boost uh, welfare, worker welfare and deliver Pacific workers who, throughout COVID-19, have proven themselves to be the lifeblood of regional business, ensuring meat could be processed and crops could be harvested. Uh, these programs are a win-win for Australia and our Pacific family. We look forward to welcoming more Pacific workers and to the invaluable Order, contribution Senator, they make to Australia the at this challenging expired. time. Senator Cash. The President, and uh, I would now ask that all further questions be placed on notice, and I would also seek leave to move a motion to provide for the consideration of a motion. Is leave granted? It is. No. Senator Cash. Thank you. I move that a, a motion relating to the 70th anniversary of the security treaty between Australia, New Zealand and the United States of America may be moved immediately by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne and b the time limit for the debate be 45 minutes after which the question be put and senators may speak to the motion for not more than 10 minutes each the question is that motion be agreed to those of that opinion say aye aye contrary no the ayes have it senator payne the minister for foreign affairs mr president i move that the senate a notes that today marks the 70th anniversary of the alliance between australia and the United States of America under the ANZUS Treaty. B reaffirms the commitment of Australia to that alliance, recognising its fundamental importance to our nation's security, sovereignty and prosperity, and to meeting the opportunities and challenges of our time. 
C acknowledges that the alliance has underpinned peace, stability and freedom in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond, and that American leadership remains indispensable to the rules-based order. D acknowledges that next week marks the 20th anniversary of the September 11 terrorist attacks, in response to which the ANZUS Treaty was invoked. E places on record its profound gratitude to the servicemen and women of both our nations who have served together over more than a century. And F acknowledges that the enduring friendship between our nations is underpinned by shared liberal democratic values and principles, and these have been embraced by our peoples across generations. Today, Mr. President and colleagues, marks, of course, the 70th anniversary of the signing of the ANZUS Treaty between Australia, New Zealand and the United States. In 1951, the world was still recovering from the horrors of World War II, and Australia's foreign policy was driven by a need to safeguard peace and security in our region. What Australia sought and what we found in the United States was a partner with whom we could work to build a better future. As he signed the ANZUS Treaty in 1951, Australia's then ambassador to the United States, Sir Percy Spender, said the treaty marked, and I quote, the first step in the building of the ramparts of freedom in the vast and increasingly important area of the Pacific Ocean. He described how the alliance was conceived not in hostility to any country, but in a devout dedication to the cause of peace. The truth of this description has never been more relevant than it is today. Over 70 years, ANZUS has helped us to achieve this goal. It continues to do so today, and we're determined that as our region faces new challenges, it will do so in the future. The treaty is more than just a collective defence agreement. It provides a framework for how our two countries have worked and continue to work together to foster and sustain a region that benefits all countries. It is an alliance based on shared values and principles, reflecting our commitment to international peace, democracy, freedom and the rule of law. It remains a cornerstone of Australian foreign policy, just as US leadership remains indispensable to stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Australia and the United States have been reliable and steadfast allies, standing shoulder to shoulder during our darkest days. For over 100 years, our troops have fought side by side, from World War I to World War II, from Korea to Vietnam, from Iraq to Afghanistan. And then, 20 years ago, this month, Australians watched some of the most distressing scenes imaginable playing out on their television screens. As the 9-11 attacks unfolded in the United States, Australians felt a deep sense of shock and horror at the events that had taken place. In the days that followed, then Prime Minister Howard invoked the ANZUS Treaty, a step no Australian Prime Minister or US President had taken before. Prime Minister Howard's decision reflected the gravity of the situation, the scale of the attack and Australia's unwavering commitment to the alliance. Following this invocation of ANZUS, Australia, along with the United States and many other forces, many other nations, committed forces to Afghanistan, where our men and women have had each other's backs for the last 20 years. There will be time, Mr President, to debate the military mission in Afghanistan, but for today, let me pay tribute to the 41 Australians and the more than 2,400 American military personnel who lost their lives in Afghanistan, including the 13 US service members killed last week, helping others to seek safety. In my roles as Foreign Minister and as Minister for Women, I am focused on ensuring the gains made particularly for women and girls in Afghanistan are not eroded. Mr President, our alliance finds strength not just in its endurance, but in how it's evolved to meet the challenges of our times, including the global pandemic with which we are dealing now, with wide-reaching health, economic and social implications. The pressure on the international rules, norms and institutions that underpin the sovereignty of nations and the peace and trade between them. A changing climate that is impacting our environment, economies and way of life 
Malicious cyber activity that is growing in frequency and sophistication, and the emergence of new and evolving threats, such as foreign interference and disinformation, that are being used to manipulate open societies. The partnership today between Australia and the United States is one of trust, grown through decades of cooperation and burden sharing, and recognition that each partner brings our own perspective. We are working more closely than ever with regional partners, including Japan and India, the Pacific and ASEAN, to address the key health, economic and security challenges of our time. We are modernising our militaries, including through cooperation in guided missile technology, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and hypersonics, for example. We are collaborating on world-class science, technology and innovation, from the latest medical advances to new forms of renewable energy to the Moon to Mars initiative. We're strengthening the resilience of supply chains, including for critical minerals and rare earths. We're working together to deliver COVID-19 vaccines across the Pacific. We're driving a positive and proactive agenda to foster a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. Our partnership today goes beyond collective defence and security agreements. It touches the lives of every Australian in a multitude of ways. The United States is Australia's biggest source of foreign investment. More than 320,000 Australians are employed by majority-owned US companies in Australia. When I visited the United States in May this year, Secretary of State Antony Blinken pledged to me that the United States would not leave Australia alone on the field. His commitment embodies the spirit of ANZUS. Neither of our two countries stands alone. Across the three US administrations with which I have worked, I can, I can sincerely say that the shared commitment to the alliance has been constant and enduring. The ANZUS Treaty has provided the unbreakable foundation for our alliance to mature and prosper for 70 years. In 1951, Sir Percy Spender recognised only too well the dangers inherent in division. But in our alliance with the United States, he saw a commitment to, and again I quote, constantly labour to reduce the unhappy tension which today plagues mankind. Unquote. Mr President, I can say emphatically that for 70 years we have indeed strived together to build peace and stability for our region. We have stood together in the face of wars, threats of terrorism and great power rivalry. Despite the uncertain times in which we live, our relationship with the United States, with the ANZUS Treaty at its heart, will continue to meet the challenges ahead. We look forward to continuing our work with President Biden and his administration to work for a better, healthier, safer and more prosperous future for all. Senator, Senator Wong? Sorry, I don't, have, you, a, I don't have a list. My apologies. Senator Wong. Yes, thank you, Mr President. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the opposition to join with uh, Minister Payne. Uh, in supporting this motion to celebrate and commemorate the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty. Mr President, in the days ahead, much attention will be focused on what conclusions are to be drawn from the 20-year war in Afghanistan, which came to an end this week. But whatever may be said in that debate, what is beyond dispute is the constancy of the bond between the United States and Australia through the struggles in Afghanistan and beyond. And throughout the final days in Kabul, America was steadfast as an ally and a dependable friend. Because if it weren't for the presence and courage of our American allies, efforts to evacuate thousands of Australians and visa holders in the past weeks would have never been possible. And that presence came at great cost, losing 13 of their own as they sought to help others. Their ultimate sacrifice reflects the heavy duty of leadership. And it is a weight that America has carried since World War II, 
where the origins of ANZUS are to be found in the war in the Pacific and, of course, Prime Minister Curtin's turn to America. In late December 1941, three weeks after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Curtin declared, without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear that Amer Australia looks to America free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. Curtin was attacked by those who would become today's Liberal Party. And the American President Franklin Roosevelt was astonished because Curtin was ahead of the US in thinking about strategy and priorities for the war in the Pacific. The US 7th Fleet was formed in Brisbane in 1943 and Australia fought with the US in major sea battles of the Pacific. And General Douglas MacArthur used Australia as his launching pad for the Pacific land battles, which eventually saw the defeat of Japan. In armed conflicts over more than a century, the military forces of Australia and the United States have worked together to secure our shared strategic interests. And the vehicle that gives principal expression to our sense of common security purpose is the ANZUS Treaty, whose 70th anniversary we mark today. ANZUS arose in the broader context of the post-war settlement and the Cold War, the Korean War to our north, and provided the strategic framework for dealing with the re-emergent militarism as a possible threat to security in the Pacific. The treaty underwent a fundamental transformation at the hands of Bob Hawke's Defence Minister, my friend Kim Beasley, and his US counterpart, Casper Weinberger, in the mid-1980s. They reoriented ANZUS from a threat-based agreement to one that focused on the strategic aspirations and purposes of both parties. Of course, thankfully, our partnership with the US is not as controversial today, and it has enduring bipartisan support, and much strategic cooperation has happened since. Looking forward, Australia's alliance with the United States sits at the centre of the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. With the US again engaged in a global force, force posture review, it is time for Australia to look again at our own posture to ensure that it fully meets the times, the last one having been conducted by the most recent Labor government in which I was minister. So I reiterate to the Senate Mr Albanese's announcement today that a federal Albanese Labor government will initiate a new force posture review upon coming to office. The Indo-Pacific would remain a key focus and the review would ensure that the government is considering both long-term strategic posture and, given the fast-moving events in the region, short-term imperatives. And the review would also respond to the continued emergence of cyber security as a central challenge to Australia's strategic positioning in the coming decade. The relationship with the US is far deeper than a security alliance alone. The United States has been a core economic partner of Australia and its importance only continues to grow. It remains our key capital investor, underpinning Australian innovation and driving both our countries to take advantage of emerging technologies. At the foundation of our shared economic prosperity is the global rules-based order, the systems, norms and institutions that guide the world's interactions and govern disputes. These are the rules of the road and they are being tested in new ways. A global pandemic that continues to wreak havoc, terrorism and extremism that continue to find safe haven, the return of great power competition, the undermining of rules-based trade, the use and the use of economic coercion for strategic ends. The US and Australia have been close allies in building and strengthening these rules of the road, including in our region, but we need to do more and we can only do more with friends and partners. So we welcome the return of American leadership in the rules-based order under President Biden and his dedicated effort to repair alliances. I've said before that Australia's partnerships and leadership in the Indo-Pacific is our pr principal value add to the alliance. And we have an opportunity and responsibility to work closely with this, the administration as it develops its Indo-Pacific strategy, including building its economic footprint, particularly in Southeast Asia. We must work with key partners such as India, Japan, Indonesia and other ASEAN nations, South Korea, the EU and others to strengthen both economic engagement and to uphold the rules of the road. This is because as much as America's role has changed, its unique capacity to offer balance in the region and leadership in the international order means it remains the indispensable power. Many of our neighbours want the balance that will come from greater US engagement, and they are clear that must be economic engagement as well as security partnerships. 
So we should be doing all we can to encourage the US to support Indo-Pacific regional pandemic recovery, reinforce ASEAN centrality, and strengthen regional architecture. So we welcome the recent visits by Vice President Harris and Defence Secretary Austin to Southeast Asia and see these as important first steps in the US step up in the region. We hope to see this grow rapidly in recognition of the vital strategic importance of this region. And we must be prepared to step up our own engagement to support it. At a time when regional uncertainty is high, a deeper US commitment to ensuring all states have the capacity to protect their sovereignty is vitally important. And President Biden's early embrace of the Quad was a welcome development, and there will be much opportunity for further US-Australia cooperation in that context as well. While so much of the region's immediate focus is the response to COVID, its more profound concern is climate change, and how we address climate change demonstrates our engagement and alignment with our neighbours. It is, of course, in Australia's interests, as a continent highly vulnerable to the worst impacts of climate change, that we urgently apply ourselves to the task of reducing emissions. Not only because the costs of climate change are so great for us, but because also because the world's climate emergency is Australia's job opportunity. And because anything less would undermine Australian leadership in the region, leave vacuums for others to fill, and abandon those most vulnerable to the worst impacts of a changing climate. In the United States, senior leaders have talked for years about the security implications of climate change. We know it is having geostrategic and regional impacts, as well as direct impacts on defence systems, infrastructure and operations. Secretary of Defence Austin has already identified climate change as a top priority for the US military. At his Fullerton address in July this year, he described climate change as an existential threat and a challenge we must meet together, echoing what Pacific Island leaders have been saying for decades. The US military has, has acknowledged that climate change is not a future defence problem, but an immediate challenge. And it is time that the Australia-US alliance reflected this reality. We should deepen our cooperation on climate change security issues. We should develop capabilities and shared responsibility to respond to natural disasters, address humanitarian needs, and mitigate the impacts of rising temperatures, particularly in our region. And we should cooperate on technological development to take advantage of the economic opportunity that comes from the shift to clean energy to deliver cheaper energy prices and facilitate an expansion of high value manufacturing capability. This helps build economic resilience in the event of future shocks. So an Albanese Labor government would make comprehensive cooperation on climate change a hallmark of alliance cooperation, because we recognise that Australia's own action on climate change will shape our capacity to live in a region where our interests prosper in partnership with our neighbours and our American ally. And we recognise that this is central to the next phase of an alliance with the United States, that Labor has always innovated, and that reflects the abiding friendship trust and affection between our peoples. Senator Steele John, then I'll come to you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The government has brought this motion here to the chamber today, uh, a day after the last uh, American force left Afghanistan and about a week from uh, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks in the United States. They ask us today to unquestioning, unquestioningly endorse the American alliance and to recommit ourselves to a relationship that we have had militarily with the United States for uh, 70 years. To do this would be easy uh, politically. It is the united view of the major parties, that a military relationship such as we currently have with the United States is uh, a good thing for Australia. Certainly a good thing for them. It's given them many opportunities to stand yet next to US military equipment and to go on fancy visits overseas and meet with defense secretaries and secretaries of state and feel like significant global actors. To do so though, in the closing days of 20 years of conflict and war across the world, it was unleashed by the 9-11 attacks, would be, however, to do a great disservice to the Australian community and to those peoples and nations that were so savagely harmed 
in the aftermath of that event. It is time, 20 years on, for us to speak truth about exactly what happened in the aftermath of 9-11. To speak the truth that America, that the United States, entered into a blood rage induced, vengeful series of exercises whereby they set two nations ablaze and precipitated the loss of some 350,000 civilian lives in a desperate attempt to reclaim what they felt was a bruised national honor and to reassert themselves in the new century, they took nations across the world to wage war in the Middle East based on upon lies. And when they were caught out upon those lies, they invented new reasons for a maintenance of conflict and a maintenance of occupation. Now at that critical moment 20 years ago, Australia's political leadership had a choice. It could either engage with the United States and seek, and seek to de-escalate the crisis unfolding in the aftermath of 9-11, seek to work with the international community to bring the individual perpetrators to justice and maintain the so-called global rules-based order, which has so much been vaunted and celebrated during the course of this debate. Or they could validate that period of vengeful blood rage, validate the conflicts that were carried out in the aftermath, participate in them, justify them, attempt to lend them moral support. And that is the choice that they made. John Howard took us into Iraq, took us into Afghanistan, and Prime Minister after Prime Minister kept us there because it was in their political interest to do so. Now we today are discussing the mechanism by which that decision was played out, the ANZUS Treaty, this year 70 years old. And as we do so, we also need to speak the truth about what that treaty is and where it comes from. There has been much spoken about ANZUS as a defence treaty that guarantees Australia a level of mutual protection. This is the myth of ANZUS, the treaty of the mind, the treaty that exists only when Australian diplomats and Australian politicians look at that piece of paper. The reality of the wording of the treaty is that it says no such thing. It offers no such guarantee. The wording of the treaty simply states that if there should be some kind of a shared a, a, a moment of a, a conflict or concern, that where they will, the parties to the treaty will act with concern to each other. It gives no guarantee of any kind of mutual protection. Below that, though, sits an even more insidious reality, which is the context in which it was conceived. This treaty was signed in 1951, and upon its signing, the relevant Australian ambassador called it a bulwark, again, the beginning of a bulwark in the defence of freedom. Now, in that context, the meaning was clear. The meaning was, this will offer Australia protection against the enemies in its region, and the enemies were the people of the Asia Pacific region. It was the beginning of a narrative of fear against the Asian people of the Asia Pacific region, a legitimation of the idea that there was something to be fearful of, of those across our sea borders. It saw us enter into that horrific conflict, the Vietnam War. And it used to be, it used to be the case 
that the Labour Party understood the dangers of following along in the wake of the United States. It used to be the case that those like Gough Whitlam and Jim Cairns were on the streets with the community as they protested against these violent imperial wars. It is to be noted that Gough Whitlam removed Australian troops from Vietnam as one of his first acts of Prime Minister, as Prime Minister. And yet all of these years on, we see a Labour Party which has given up in relation to criticism of the United States, is in fact now in lockstep with the Liberal Party, ready to go all the way with the USA once again. The uncritical, unflinching nature with which the Labour Party now position itself in relation to the American alliance does a huge disservice to the community. And it fails to reflect all of those in our community who want peace, who saw through the lies of George Bush and the complicity of John Howard, who understood that there were no WMDs in Iraq, that there was no need to knock over the government of an entire nation to try to, to, try to bring to justice a single individual who by then was most likely within the borders of Pakistan. The community have always understood that when it comes to war, the number one thing on the mind of a politician is how to make electoral benefit out of it. And hard truth for the major parties is that in the aftermath of 9-11, as America and its blood haze descend, and decided to line people up on the board to take its anger out at, Australian politicians sought political opportunity. Political opportunity to bind themselves closer to an ally which in response could deliver them many more opportunities to fancy weaponry with whom they are able then to take pictures. And an opportunity to secure their electoral base here in Australia. It is very telling that in a moment of general global crisis, genuine global crisis, when Australia could have benefited greatly from the supply of something as simple as a vaccine, the special relationship was not strong enough to enable that to occur. It has also been commented upon that we are now seeking to engage ourselves in the hosting of missiles upon the Northern Territory. And it once again is another example of how the major parties are so willing as the United States most significant and well-armed aircraft carrier in the Asia Pacific, regardless of the views of the Northern Territory, which so wholeheartedly oppose it. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Nationals uh, would seek to associate our party with the comments particularly of the Foreign Minister but uh, also that of the Opposition in uh, supporting wholeheartedly the ANZUS uh, relationship and treaty. Today we mark the 70th uh, anniversary of the alliance between Australia and the United States of America. This anniversary comes after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and ahead of the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks. First signed in San Francisco in 1951, the treaty confirmed both the United States and Australia's commitment to a shared vision for an Indo-Pacific that is secure, stable and prosperous. The treaty reaffirmed Australia's unwavering commitment to our alliance, recognising its fundamental importance to our nation's security and sovereignty. At the time, Australia's then ambassador to the United States, one of the architects of the treaty, Percy Spender, said, this day we declare to the world that our three peoples share a common destiny. This treaty takes the first step towards what we hope will prove to be an ever-widening system of peaceful security in this vital area. And that it has done and will continue to do so. As a nation, we've been incredibly well served in both peacetime and war by an alliance that has been a testament to our common values and deep mutual trust. 
This alliance and our bond with the United States is stronger, broader and more vital today than it was 70 years ago. Few countries in the world enjoy such a close relationship built upon our mutual support for democracy and shared respect for the rule of law. Our shared commitment to deterring aggression has seen us fight together in every major conflict uh, since World War I. From Lee Hamill all the way through to the evacuation we saw in Kabul last week, we've stood side by side with our mates, the United States of America and New Zealand. On 14 September 2001, we saw Prime Minister John Howard formally evoke the treaty for the first time in response to the September 11 terrorist attacks. And he said at the time, in every way, the attack on New York and Washington and the circumstances surrounding it did constitute an attack on the metropolitan territory of the United States of America within the provisions of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. If that treaty means anything, if our debts as a nation to the people of the United States in the darkest days of World War II means anything, if the comradeship, the friendship and the common bonds of democracy and a belief in liberty, fraternity and justice means anything, it means that the ANZUS Treaty applies and that the ANZUS Treaty is properly invoked. Australia therefore joined the coalition forces in Afghanistan, contributing to the war on terror and ensured a safer Australia, a safer world. And as it has been for the last 70 years, our alliance is set to remain indispensable from our future. The Indo-Pacific has become a focal point of our alliance, benefiting our partners throughout this region and underpinning the strong relationships we already have with these nations. Our commitment to keeping the alliance strong is shown through Australia's 2020 Defence Strategic Update, as set out in the 2024 Structure Plan, Australia's $270 billion investment in new ADF capabilities will enable Australia to be a more effective and capable alliance partner. The investment also strengthens our industrial-based collaboration to further bolster alliance interoperability and the supply chain resilience. Australia's force po posture cooperation with the US, including the Marine Rotational Force in Darwin, is a tangible demonstration of the deep engagement in the region by both Australia and the United States. As we look to the future, let us be reminded of the values and freedoms the ANZUS Treaty has secured for us as a nation. Let us commit to continuing to be vigilant and strong, to build the economic strength for the peace and prosperity of all, and for a world that is free. Let us reflect on the sacrifices of all who have served under the flags of all three of our great nations, who will never forget and continue to honour each and every day. And let us be reminded that whatever lies ahead, Australia, New Zealand and the United States' unbreakable friendship will continue to prosper. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move on to. Oh, sorry, Senator Seward. But I record the Greens' opposition to the motion, other than for section E. Thank okay, you. So recorded. Thank you, Senator Seward. So we'll now move on to motions to take note of answers. I believe I'm not all here for this. So, Senator Pratt. Mr. President, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Cash to questions asked by myself. Yesterday, and indeed confirmed today in the chamber, we yep. have heard Attorney General Senator Cash, herself a West Australian, saying that the legal pathways that led to the High Court determining that it was reasonable for WA to have closed its borders to stop the spread of COVID-19 may have a different outcome should those same policies be tested again. Things have changed, Senator Cash has said. And when is Mark McGowan going to open Western Australia up to the rest of the country? Well, I am exceedingly alarmed at these remarks. I, like Premier McGowan, and he put it best, he said, when the Morrison government went through the Clive Palmer experience last year, and that now they want to do exactly the same thing again. What kind of message is Senator Cash trying to send to Western Australians? Well, Senator Cash must take us for mugs. 
Of course Western Australia can't live in a bubble forever. But to open up at 80 per cent and invite the virus in when this government has not provided enough vaccines for the other 20 per cent of Western Australians who might want to get be vaccinated to get vaccinated? What a ridiculous proposition. So if Mark McGowan rightly says, I'm not going to open up the borders automatically at 80 per cent, I'm very grateful and thankful for him saying that. And in fact, he fought in the negotiations in the National Cabinet to ensure that Western Australia, as part of agreeing to the plan, is able to keep its border protection system in place as part of agreeing to that plan. It is a ridiculous notion that Western Australia should just allow, should just allow COVID into the state when there are people who want to be vaccinated who will not be vaccinated by that point in time, including very vulnerable members of the community, older people, First Nations Australians and, indeed, children. It is this government's failure to roll out the vaccine and secure enough supply. So this government is instead focused on attacking premiers and chief ministers and drawing up legal schemes to force the pandemic into places where it doesn't exist already. For the Attorney General, the chief law officer in this country, to be openly advocating for future challenges to Western Australia's border um, closures is absolutely farcical. The Morrison government has spent more than a million dollars supporting Clive Palmer's failed High Court challenge. It failed, and I call on the government to move on. And yet we've heard Attorney General saying out of one side of her mouth that the government won't support a challenge led by Clive Palmer, but on the other hand, essentially saying that the laws are now ripe for challenging. Why won't the Attorney General pay money to support Mark McGowan and the state government against a future High Court challenge if business wants to challenge those laws? Essentially, again, the, uh, the Attorney General is siding against the state of Western Australia. And it's all very well for those opposite to say, no, she didn't. No, she didn't. That's not what she said. She said, it is open for challenge. And, and why then shouldn't the Attorney General say it is in the best interests of Western Australia for its borders to remain protected for the time being until every West Australian, every single West Australian has had an opportunity to get vaccinated if they want to be. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Askew. Well, Madam President, Deputy President, I think Senator Cash was pretty clear when she spoke earlier today. I'm not sure if Senator Pratt actually had, was in the chamber at the time. She did state that the government will not challenge state border closures in the High Court. That's pretty clear. Throughout this pandemic, the federal government has worked with premiers and chief ministers through the national cabinet process constructively to ensure the safety of all Australians. The government has a solid four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response. Um, just a moment, Senator Askew. I'm just going to check your mic is working. Is that what you were asking? The microphone's turned on. <clears throat> Do you want to start again? It's up to you. I could hear you, but I'm not sure it was. It probably wasn't being recorded, so perhaps start again. Okay, thank you. Well, Madam Deputy President, I think Senator Cash was pretty clear when she spoke earlier this afternoon, and I wasn't sure if Senator Pratt was actually in the chamber at the time because she did say very clearly that the government will not challenge state border closures in the High Court. 
Throughout this pandemic, the federal government has worked with premiers and chief ministers through the national cabinet process very constructively to ensure the safety of all Australians. The government has a solid four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response. That plan is based on the Doherty Institute's COVID-19 modelling, along utilising the economic analysis conducted by the Commonwealth Department of Treasury. The national plan is supported by an overwhelming majority of the states and territories and has been agreed to at National Cabinet on more than one occasion. The government is clear we will not do anything to jeopardise the staged national plan to get us out of this pandemic. What I would like to know is what is opposition leaders Mr Albanese's and the Labor Party's position. Mr Albanese has at times backed the national plan and at other times well a different timeline for opening borders and ultimately Australia. Mr Albanese continues to have that each way bet on the future of Australians. Instead, he should wholeheartedly support and get behind the national plan. Madam Deputy President, as I mentioned earlier, the Doherty Institute examined COVID-19 infection and vaccination rates in order to determine the targets required for the National Plan's stage pathway to living with COVID. The plan was put in place to provide assurance and comfort to all Australians that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and the plan was agreed by National Cabinet. They sought the research from the Doherty Institute and have since agreed to the way forward. So imagine the disappointment of the Australian public that we now, that we now have some premiers hesitating, stepping back from that commitment. The open letter from the business community in national papers today really says it all. The full-page advertisement signed by the heads of 81 of Australia's largest businesses calls on governments across the country to work together to deliver on the plan. And I quote, as vaccination rates increase, it will become necessary to open up society and live with the virus, in the same way that other countries have done. The National Cabinet has agreed to a roadmap which provides a path out of lockdowns, with an easing of restrictions from 70 per cent and 80 per cent vaccination rates. We need to stay the course." End quote. CEOs and managing directors such as Stephen Kane from Coles Group, Steve Johnson from Suncorp, Taryn Gupta from Stockland, Peter King from Westpac, Jean Jones from Insitec Pivot Limited, Tom Seymour from PwC, and the extensive and very impressive list goes on. Madam Deputy President, they all understand the importance of sticking to the plan. My hope is that their plea is heard and all governments can work together to stick to the plan to enable our country to regain some semblance of normality, albeit a new norm, and allow businesses and the borders to reopen as planned. If not, jobs and businesses will be lost. Madam Deputy President, on the vaccine rollout, which has also been raised, the rollout is increasing progressively each and every month. 7.3 million vaccinations were delivered in August, 4.5 million vaccinations in July, 3.4 in June and 2.1 in May. That is a massive increase. We're administering more than 1.9 million doses every week. Last week alone, 1,929,000 doses were made up of 841,000 by state and territory health clinics, 50,362 in aged care and disability clinics, and 1,037,000 in primary care clinics. Throughout this pandemic, we have saved more than 30,000 lives, supported more than 3 million Australians through JobKeeper and got 1 million Australians back into work. And with around 1 million Pfizer doses arriving every week, plus the additional half a million Pfizer doses that have been secured through the doses swap in Sing through Singapore and the 1 million doses from Poland, our health and economic recovery is well and truly on track. Madam Deputy President, we need all states and territories to come online and to make sure that we are delivering for the national plan that has been agreed and that we see a way out of this pandemic into Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And, um, you know, the country is yearning, yearning for a man with a plan. But there's only one plan for Mr Morrison, and it's all about him only a plan for himself and his survival. Everybody else is a casualty in Mr Morrison's plan. And 
we have to acknowledge that what he actually said, despite a national plan, yesterday he said, ultimately everything is a state matter. Under the leadership of this man with many plans and no conviction, Australia has never been more divided. States that once had open borders and open commerce have had to resort to their own powers in order to protect their people. The only interventions the Prime Minister has seen fit to make in this debate are to undermine the Atagi advice, attack some of the premiers for taking action when he does nothing, and to constantly blame everyone else for his colossal policy failures. And then, of course, he has the, the singular version of his interaction with New South Wales, encouraging Premier Gladys Berejiklian not to stick with a plan of a rapid lockdown and encouraging her not to do that. And the Bondi failure is now spreading. The, the consequence of that Bondi failure is spreading right across the country. There's one reason that all of this chaos is happening. And that is because Mr Morrison refuses all accountability. He shirks all the tough decisions and he thinks only about his personal short-term political gain and not the benefit of the country. Uh, for the first time in Federation, we have a head of government where the buck doesn't stop with them. As inept as Mr Abbott was and as aloof as Mr Turnbull was, can we really imagine that either of them would completely abdicate national leadership and stand up and say, Ultimately, everything is a state matter. Despite the constant leaks from hotel quarantine sites, Mr Morrison's failed to build a national quarantine facility, forcing Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk, Anastasia Palaszczuk to build her own. Despite promising that all Australians would be able to return from overseas for Christmas, the Prime Minister has failed by the end of July this year, and there's still 38,000 Australians waiting to get back into the country. Despite section 51 of the Constitution explicitly stating that the quarantine is a federal responsibility, Mr Morrison continues to do nothing to build a safe and secure facility for Australians. I have to wonder what this national cabinet he talks about really is. If this was a man with a plan for the country that we could trust, surely he would have created a national cabinet with the leader of the government and the leader of the opposition. He would have encouraged premiers and leaders of the opposition to come to the table and work in the national interest. Yet he couldn't wait to establish a, a, a form of cabinet, a national cabinet that's actually being critiqued as not being a cabinet and not having its uh, documents worthy of protection. But this show of a group of people across the country, a select group of people, not bipartisan, in a way that is just not delivering for the country. Nowhere has Mr Morrison's failure been more absolute than in Western Australia, uh, Western New South Wales. The Delta variant has ravaged Indigenous communities from Wilcannia to Walgett to Dubbo, and tragically, last week it claimed its first Aboriginal victim. Last week, only 6.3 per cent of the Indigenous population in Western New South Wales was vaccinated, despite repeated warnings of the government from myself and Aboriginal health leaders. And it's a long way from 6.3 per cent to the 70 and 80 per cent that this government keeps talking about. The Prime Minister's failure to secure an adequate supply of Pfizer for the disproportionately young Aboriginal populations of Western New South Wales has condemned them to lockdown in their homes isolation in tents, trying to find refuge in their own cars separate from their family, while the deadly virus is alive and moving around their community. Mr Morrison's plan for Indigenous people was announced in March of 2020. He announced that there were going to be vaccines. Here we are in September 2021 with only 6.3 per cent of the population of Western New South Wales who are Indigenous people vaccinated. That's how useless Mr Morrison's plans are. The goal he articulates might be what Australians want to hear, but the man it is incapable of delivering it. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, in rising to take note of answers provided by um, Minister Cash in question time today, there's, there's one point that 
I want to start with, and it's a point that I have made a number of times coming into this place, contributing <clears throat> in debates such as these um, in this chamber, and, and that is that there is not a single nation, Madam Deputy President, in the world, um, not a single government that I think would claim to have made all the right decisions when dealing with this pandemic and to have dealt with the situation absolutely superbly and perfectly. But what is important is that we learn about what works with this virus and what doesn't. We adapt and we move forward to counter the challenges that it provides to us. And, Madam Deputy President, we have learned, we are adapting and we are moving forward. What doesn't do us any good, though, during a pandemic, Madam Deputy President, um, is partisan politicking. Um, and quite frankly, that is what we have seen here from the Labor Party today. They have not listened to the responses provided by ministers in this place. I've been here two years and now. I've come to get used to that. They are not listening to what is being told to them in question time. They are manipulating uh, the words of Senator Cash and turning it into something that, quite frankly, uh, it isn't. But should I be surprised, Madam Deputy President, we tend, to get, uh, we tend to get that from them every day. This pandemic is fast moving and constantly evolving. And like I said, no government um, has got it exactly right or, th or claims to have got it exactly right. And it makes you ask, why is it that all Labor has to offer to go, um, at this point is to go back in time to 12 months ago, 18 months ago, um, instead of working to ensure that everyone is on the same page and everyone is working to the national plan that was agreed by all states and territories at the national cabinet. The coalition government, Madam Deputy President, is continuing with the critical work to get Australians vaccinated to keep us safe, get us back into work, keep the economy turning over, end the lockdowns and ensure that people can cross borders unrestricted. Millions of Australians are struggling with community lockdowns, border closures that prevent them from seeing their friends and their family. And it is just heartbreaking, Madam Deputy President. I hear each and every day from people, whether it's in my home state of Tasmania or across the country, that are frustrated with the lockdowns. They are frustrated with the, the restrictions. They want to be able to see their family and their friends face to face. And sadly, that is not possible at the moment. But that is why we have the national plan to get vaccination rates to 70 or 80 per cent so that we can open up safely, get our kids back into school, get Australians back to work, get our economy moving again and give people the opportunity to reunite with their loved ones who they haven't been able to see for so long. The national plan shifts the focus from continued suppression of community transmission to post-vaccination settings focused on preventing serious illness and fatalities where the public health management of COVID-19 becomes consistent with other infectious diseases. I think I said this close to 18 months ago in this place, Madam Deputy President, we need to learn to live with the virus. We absolutely need to learn to live with the virus, and vaccinating Australians is a really key part of learning to live with the virus. Once we have Australians vaccinated, we will be able to get back to living our lives closer to what we all remember as being normal. Uh, currently, over 19 million doses have been administered across the country, and if we continue on the rates that we have been on, Madam Deputy President, we should hit the 20 million mark by the end of the week, and that is incredibly uh, exciting. I'm also advised that 60 per cent of eligible Tasmanians in my home state are now protect protected with at least one dose, um, while more than 42 per cent are fully vaccinated, which is fantastic news for my home state of Tasmania and certainly a testament to the hard work of the state Liberal government led by Peter Gutwin there, of course supported by the Morrison Liberal team um, in ensuring that we are rolling out the vaccination program locally. Uh, Importantly, the government continues to make new arrangements and deals to secure additional dosages for the nation so that we can continue with this rollout to ensure that we can get back to normal. Make no mistake, we as a government are doing everything in our power to expedite the vaccination program and progress the national plan so we can reach a point where extended lockdowns and border restrictions you, are a Senator thing of the Sandra, past. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, well, it was indeed 
Um, very refreshing to hear a member of the government benches congratulate a Labor state premier uh, for doing a good job in this pandemic today. Uh, it was very refreshing to hear Senator Cash acknowledge Mr McGowan uh, and his incredible hard work to keep the people of his home state, Western Australia, safe. Uh, and it was as refreshing as a cool change in a heat wave because the members of this government have done nothing but pile heat onto Labor state premiers during this pandemic. They have done nothing but pile on to Labor state premiers uh, and to the people that they represent. Uh, they've done nothing but pile on to Labor state premiers who have been doing everything that they can to keep Australians safe, making the tough decisions, making the difficult calls, uh, making those calls to keep all of us safe. Uh, and right now, Victorians who are locked down, well, we can only imagine what our lives would be like if Mr Morrison had spent last year doing his job uh, instead of attacking Victorians, instead of attacking our state premier, instead of attacking the measures that were put in place in Victoria to keep us all safe. Because Victorians know that we would not be in this situation, we would not be locked down yet again if the Prime Minister had only done his two jobs. His two jobs of rolling out the vaccine and of establishing federal uh, dedicated open air quarantine facilities. Um, if only he had secured those vaccines for the start of this year, uh, instead of saying that it's how you end the race at the end of the year that matters. Um, if only he had understood the whole time that it was always a race. It was always a race. If only he had fronted up to his two jobs, the two jobs that Australians needed him to do. Speedy rollout of the vaccinations and purpose-built quarantine. If only the Prime Minister had spent his time on that instead of spending his time on attacking Victorians, uh, instead of spending his time funding Clive Palmer's attack on the WA government and on the WA government's health response. Uh, instead, what we have seen from this Prime Minister is 18 months of a Prime Minister avoiding his responsibility, looking for others to blame, blaming states for lockdowns caused by his failure to build purpose-built quarantine facilities, um, caused by his failure in relying on leaky hotel quarantine, uh, hotels that were built for tourists not to keep a virus from entering the community. Um, if only the Prime Minister hadn't spent his time um, blaming the very people who really need to be vaccinated for not being able to access the vaccines, um, blaming essential workers, blaming Indigenous people for his failure to vaccinate those vulnerable populations. Uh, and now this week, the Prime Minister doesn't even try to hide his aversion, his extreme aversion, to taking responsibility in this crisis, uh, saying this week that ultimately everything is a state matter. Um, well, we know what the Prime Minister's responsibilities are. We know who is ultimately responsible. We know who has ultimately failed on vaccines and on quarantine, uh, and that is Prime Minister Morrison. He failed to heed the advice of his own health advisers and invest in fit for purpose quarantine facilities. Uh, instead, claiming again and again and again that the hotel quarantine system was effective, that it was 99.9% .9 effective. Well, tell that to the 60% of Australians who were locked down today. Um, tell that to the children who are missing school. Tell that to all of the people who have lost their jobs. Tell that to all of the people who are relying on disaster payments. Uh, and what Australians want from the Prime Minister right now is leadership. They want him to do his job. They want him to take responsibility. They want him to bring people together, not to divide us, not to shift blame, to take responsibility. Thank you, Senator Walsh. 
So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given to me by Senator Birmingham in relation to the reports that there is a new push on inside the government uh, to fund chaplains to deal with the young people of Australia's concern about climate change. Sending a chaplain into every school to allay their fears in relation to the state of the planet, the environment and the state of our climate. Well, what, I mean, this is bonkers. This is crazy. You couldn't make this stuff up. Rather than dealing with the reality of climate change and what we have to do, which is reduce pollution, we've got Prime Minister Scott Morrison and members of his government wanting to send in the chaplains to tell the kids it's all going to be OK. The last thing we need is to send more chaplains into schools at a time when young people actually need the government to show leadership. The only people robbing young people of a future and hope in this country is the members of the Prime Minister's government who continue to delay and deny the action needed for climate change. The only people in this country, those within the government who delay and deny, and their mates in the fossil fuel industry who continue to want to pollute putting the profits, their profits, their mega profits, ahead of the future of our planet and the future of our young people. It is just unthinkable that this government, rather than doing what they are required to do, they want to blame young people's anxiety and concern about the state of our environment on climate activists and scientists. Is there, any, is there anything that this Prime Minister won't try and shift the blame on? The Prime Minister is off to oh, he's going to be sending delegates to Glasgow ahead of uh, the World Climate Summit in November. I mean, how is this going to go down there? Are we going to send the chaplains to represent Australia at the Global Summit to allay the fears of the rest of the world's leaders and scientists that we have indeed? hit code red when it comes to our climate. We need science-led solutions, not religious chaplains in schools. And let me say, I know that young people in this country are finding it really tough. They are worried about the, their future. They are anxious about the state of the environment. They are worried about the stresses and the threats of COVID-19. The last thing we should be doing is palming off this concern to religious chaplains in schools. If we want to look after the mental health of our young people, we should be putting in qualified counsellors and social workers, people who will be there to listen to our young people, not to push religion and ideology. I mean, this is just crazy stuff. You didn't think this government could get much worse. And the Prime Minister can have whatever beliefs he wants, but to pretend that the genuine concerns of Australia's young people and children in relation to climate change is simply alarmist and not based on reality is negligent. It is absolutely negligent. We need a government who will be prepared to take climate change seriously, reduce pollution, commit to a proper target for 2030 at the Global Summit, and to listen to the concerns of children and young people as legitimate things to act on. And the only things chaplains in schools should be doing is telling the young people of Australia to pray that their parents vote this mob out. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I shall proceed to the placing of business. I don't have any postponements or extensions from the clerk. Are there any other matters to be covered here?
If not, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business and commence with Government Business Matter No. 1. Senator Rustin. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1 relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rustin. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now move to 1216 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Seward. 1216. On behalf, thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1216 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to, number 1216. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Senator Seward. Could I I uh, please have recorded that we Green supported our own motion. So recorded. Senator Urquhart. But I have it recorded that Labor also supported that motion. So recorded. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, now, Senator Seward, I understand you're moving a motion on behalf of Senator Patrick, number 1230. That is correct, Mr President. On behalf of Senator Patrick, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1230, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Seward. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Aged Care Act 1997 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Aged Care Act 1997 and for related purposes. Senator Seward. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory, an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. An explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to, con to continue my remarks. Easily granted. There being no objection, it is. Senator Smith, I understand you're moving a matter on behalf of Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. At the request on behalf of Senator Roberts, I move to introduce this bill. I do so to reflect the normal practice and the will of the Chamber for the introduction of bills which, through the limitations of remote participation, has been disrupted. On behalf of Senator Roberts, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1237, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Smith. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act of 1918 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I move oh, that this the, bill— Sorry, the, I've got to go, the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Senator Smith. I move that this bill will be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Question. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, number 1239, in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Seward. Thank you. On behalf of Senator Faruqi, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1239, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend customs legislation to prohibit the ex ex exploitation and importation of greyhounds or for commercial purposes and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend customs legislation to prohibit the exportation and importation of greyhounds for commercial purposes and for related purposes. Senator Seward. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. 
is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senators. That concludes the discovery of formal business. I have received the following letter from Senator Lyons. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need for Morrison Joyce government to stop blaming First Nation Australians and instead take responsibility for its bungled vaccine rollout, the dangerous situation in Western New South Wales and its failure to prepare and protect First Nations communities across Australia from the spread of COVID, including a failure to properly communicate and ensure access to health facilities, food security, adequate housing and isolation place places. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Can you, you, Senator, Senator Urquhart moves the motion, and I call Senator McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. In early March 2020, the Australian Government convened the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Group on COVID-19 to develop and deliver a national management plan to protect communities and save lives. The four-phase plan developed included, firstly, preparedness, secondly, de developing advice on a range of actions to prevent sustained community transition. Transmission. Thirdly, developing an effective response to outbreaks in communities, including the potential deployment of mobile respiratory clinics. And fourthly, stand down and evaluation. Lessons learned from this plan were to be incorporated into future national pandemic planning. In the event of positive coronavirus cases in remote communities, provision was made to evacuate early cases to enable an effective response and limit exposure to other community members. Work was done towards opening GP-led respiratory clinics to provide advice and health care to people with mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms, while reducing the pressure on hospitals and the risk of transmission by visits to regular GP clinics. The advisory group, which became known as the task force, agreed the preparation of culturally appropriate and consistent advice to First Nations health services and communities was a priority. Obviously, at the start of the pandemic, vaccines were pretty much over the horizon, so planning for the rollout wasn't included in the initial planning phase. But the point here is that there was a plan. There was clear communication about the threat of COVID to First Nations people, communities locked down, and took their own initiatives to restrict visitors. The community-based and controlled First Nations media organisations rolled out some innovative and creative content to get the message out. The government backed them with a small amount of funding, but what they did with that money was remarkable. Some great ads promoting good hygiene were produced, jingles and songs were written and broadcast, with community leaders and identities leading the way. They use social media, radio, local leaders to get the facts out and to keep communities safe. Informing people about the importance of washing hands, keeping 1.5 metres apart, of keeping movement to a minimum, of developing new ways to observe cultural obligations like sorry business. The government backed First Nations communities and organisations to get the job done. Community controlled organisations work together to inform people about the facts. And guess what? Up until a few days ago, we had not lost one elder. Earlier this year, we were celebrating that in contrast to indigenous populations in other parts of the world, Australian First Nations people had escaped the pandemic relatively unscathed. Just 147 cases up to the start of the year and no deaths. With all this planning done nearly 18 months ago, with what we knew worked to keep First Nations people and communities safe, all we can ask now is what the hell happened? And let me tell you, it's not First Nations organisations and people who have dropped the ball here, and it's not our community controlled health sector. 
It's not our First Nations media organisations. It's not our housing associations or land councils. They have continued strongly advocating for the need for adequate vaccine supplies, for health workers to be ready on the ground, for facilities to be set up for people who needed to isolate, for assistance and backing in countering the dangerous misinformation that's getting around. The Morrison-Joyce government and its ministers keep falling back to the line of vaccine hesitancy. This is their attempt to abrogate all responsibility for the ongoing tragedy that's continuing in Western New South Wales. What they are saying every time they blame vaccine hesitancy for the spiralling caseload is that it's blackfellas' fault for not getting the needle, for believing the stories that are out there, for putting themselves at risk. Well, guess what? I didn't hear them saying that every time a person in Bondi got COVID or Byron Bay or the Whit Sundays. I didn't hear the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, or even the Minister for Indigenous Australians saying those wellness gurus in Byron just need to overcome their gullible beliefs, their susceptibility to being conned by COVID deniers and just get vaccinated. I don't hear the Prime Minister taking action against members of his own coalition who are out there peddling COVID misinformation, directly leading to any kind of thoughts on vaccine hesitancy. The Morrison government's cowardice in refusing to take strong action against the lies, the dangerous lies, being spread by their own people, in particular the member for Dawson, is reprehensible. They won't take action because they're too scared he will pack up his bag of conspiracy theories and leave the government facing a by-election. In the words of the Deputy Prime Minister in an interview last month, if you start prodding the bear, you're going to make the situation worse for us as a government, not better. And I'll say that to my colleagues. I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. The Morrison-Joyce government is happy enough for one of their own to go around promoting vaccine hesitancy. But let one First Nations person say they're concerned about getting the needle because of the misinformation being spread like from the member for Dawson, then it's all about First Nations people being foolish enough to believe what they say. It's their fault for putting lives and communities at risk. That's what this government is saying. Nothing to do with the failures of its own performance, nothing to do with the Prime Minister's failure to deliver on his promise to vaccinate 1B priority groups by winter. And today, on the first day of spring, less than 21% as First Nations Australians have been fully vaccinated. The Morrison-Joyce government have failed spectacularly to get messages out there countering the misinformation and directly targeting First Nations audiences. At the outset of the pandemic, Labor supported the government's move to fund community-controlled First Nations media organisations to produce and broadcast their messages about staying safe. The funding, and it was only about 230,000, supported local broadcasters to produce and broadcast health and safety materials to address local issues, concerns and misinformation. It also helped broadcasters engage the support of local elders and leaders to pass on the importance and the gravity of the COVID-19 pandemic. It worked. The media organisations developed those messages in their language relevant to their audience and it resonated with the community. They weren't messages devised in a boardroom in Canberra or Sydney and farmed out to broadcasters that no one understood or listened to. We knew what worked. We knew about the vital role First Nations community control organisations have to play. But the Morrison-Joyce government didn't learn and it hasn't listened and it did not prioritise the health and safety of the vulnerable. Your priorities have been made very clear now in this vaccine rollout. This government prioritises the implementation of the harmful and unproven cashless debit card over keeping First Nations communities safe from COVID. And the proof's there. This government's translated material about the cashless debit card into 13 Northern Territory First Nations languages. There are ads spruiking the card on First Nations radio in print, there are ads and articles flogging the benefits of the cashless debit card. 
There are even items in local council newsletters urging people to sign up. Yet nationally, radio ads about COVID have been translated into just six First Nations languages and only two here in the Northern Territory. There is a woeful lack of community relevant information. And this is completely down to this government being totally unable to hear, to consult and to coordinate with local First Nations organisations. Vaccine hesitancy is nothing more than a failure of this government to firmly counter misinformation and to implement a comprehensive communication strategy with First Nations communities in First Nations languages. It's shameful that the Morrison Joyce government sees no issue with continuing to not listen, to not heed, to not plan and to not care for the most vulnerable Australians in this country, First Nations people, disability people, those that you said you would have vaccinated by the winter. Prime Minister, you had two jobs vaccination and quarantine, and you have failed. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bragg. Oh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I rise to address the Senate on the question of this urgency motion. Uh, and these are very serious matters, and I will, will seek to spare you the talking points as we try and address uh, what is a, uh, a serious and a grave situation. And I agree with Senator McCarthy. It's not appropriate for people to blame uh, the, the people. Um, this is not about blaming any Australian. Um, I don't think it's a good look for politicians to blame people. Uh, and I don't think that is what is happening. Um, I mean, the issues here are, uh, are acute. They are uh, happening in the west of my state in uh, towns that I've visited and spent uh, quite a bit of time in, towns like Brewarina and Burke, uh, Walgett, Canamble, um, and uh, they, are, they, are, they are towns that do not have uh, ritzy facilities. They have, um, in many cases, quite reasonable medical facilities that are run uh, by passionate people at the AMSs. Um, and so the whole point of this was to try and keep um, uh, the COVID infections out of these communities because for obvious um, direct health reasons, but also because the facilities in these places are, are not what you would find in Sydney. And that would be the same in any Australian state. And it doesn't matter who you are, the facilities are not as good in the bush um, in most cases. Um, and the sort of treatment that is required for people who um, contract COVID-19 uh, when it is a serious case um, um, would stretch a basic medical service very heavily. And so the objective right now in Western New South Wales, and I've spoken to some people that have, have been there in the past few days, um, is to try and uh, manage the people as best as can be achieved um, in those locations who have COVID. Uh, and when it is beyond the capacity of those medical institutions in those parts of the state, uh, they are taken by the Royal Flying Doctors Service to Sydney or to a larger hospital. The second part of the plan is to, of course, vaccinate people, vaccinate all the people who live there, uh, because that is the best protection. And what we are seeing um, across New South Wales is a real commitment to getting vaccinated. I think today we've hit 70 per cent of first doses in New South Wales, which is a real, a real feat. Um, I have spoken to people who are from Brewarina. Um, I mean, their, their view is that we, in some ways we have been a victim of our own success and that there's been a sense of complacency. 
because uh, there were AstraZeneca vaccines available in these towns, towns like Dubbo, from the 25th of March this year. So it was available, um, and perhaps there wasn't a sense of, of urgency. Um, perhaps because the country had done very well, and I would argue, given how many remote Indigenous communities there are in Australia, the country has still done very well in keeping COVID-19 out of these communities. Um, but there is, there is COVID-19 in the west of New South Wales. Um, there is also COVID-19 in the town that I grew up in, in northern Victoria, uh, in Shepparton. Um, and so those are two communities which are dealing with COVID, but there are many, many, many more remote communities uh, that are not having to deal with COVID. Uh, and so that, that is one of the reasons uh, that has been put to me, that we have not had the level of vaccination take up that we would have liked. And as it stands uh, at about 35 per cent today, 35 per cent of people, Indigenous people have had a first dose. And that is, that is not high enough. And that is something that we need to, to turn around quickly, uh, particularly if there are likely to be further um, outbreaks which we want to prevent at all costs. Um, the other point to make here is that beyond the Royal Flying Doctors' Service uh, and, the, and the VAX hubs that have been set up in these towns, uh, there, there are the, the OSMAT teams. and These are Commonwealth government teams uh, aided by the ADF and they're going around to people's houses, to their premises and offering them a, a vaccination. So if you um, are living in Walgett, which is a lovely little town, um, you, can, um, you can go along to the Mass Vax Hub, which I'm told is at the local footy oval, um, or you can be visited by an OSMAT team or an ADF team to receive a vaccination in your in your front yard or in your in your house, so I mean that that is really now the the, the, the focus. So, um, of course, with these communities in lockdown, it presents the same issues that people have to consider uh, in in urban issue, in urban areas. Only that they are more pronounced because the technology um, is not as good. You know, I was talking um, this morning to uh, another person familiar with the situation who made the point that. The homeschooling there is very, very difficult, uh, and the homeschooling is difficult because there is a low level of broadband penetration um, or good internet penetration. There is, of course, um, in many cases, a a lack of uh, technology resources in the forms of computers and iPads uh, and the like, which are required to do homeschooling. And anyone who has who has become familiar with this concept of homeschooling uh, would know that. Uh, it often does, in public schools, um, rely upon having some access to the internet and having some access to uh, an iPad um, or some sort of a tablet uh, in order to facilitate that. So, the 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 issues in in that part of the state are are, are acute from a health point of view, and there are these very significant other consequences that have arisen. Um, I, I would say that. Um, with the, the the vaccinations that are happening now in Dubbo, um, and they're looking at uh, basically 18 sites in inside the Dubbo LGA, and these are providing uh, about 7,000 doses a week. 7,000 doses a week is is a lot of doses um, in a town like Dubbo. I'm not sure exactly what the pop population is, but it would be somewhere around I think 40 or 50,000. Um, so. Um, very quickly, I'm expecting that we will see these vaccination rates go from 34% uh, as an average, um, if that is the same in Western New South Wales, I'm not exactly sure, um, um, up towards the, the overall population-wide average, which, as I say, in New South Wales is now hitting 70%. So these, these, are, these are serious issues. Um, I think that the only way we can manage this is through putting a lot of resources in, through the military, through the OSMAT, um, through the VAX hubs, and then the additional um, home support and care that is required um, in, these, in, these, in these areas. 
I mean, overall, the objective to keep COVID-19 out of Indigenous communities, I would argue, has largely been met. There has been a high degree of Indigenous input into the management of this pandemic. Um, um, we have had, sadly, one Indigenous death, but overall it has been a strong performance. We are dealing with this outbreak in Western New South Wales, uh, which is in a number of very small towns. And I emphasise again for the, for the Senate um, that the, the towns like Brewarrina and, and Burke, they are small towns. They are really small towns. Um, and they, they, were, that they were never going to have an opportunity or the capacity to deal with these things on their own. Um, now there has been an outbreak, we have moved resources into those places, and my hope is that we can get on top of these outbreaks pretty quickly, but you can't get on top of it without vaccinations, which is why the um, AstraZeneca and, sorry, and then the Pfizer um, shots um, are now available there. In a bigger town like Dubbo, which has more resources, it is, I'm sure, a bit easier, uh, but again, um, we, do need, um, we do need those shots to go into the arms. We're expecting uh, 6,850 doses a week in the Dubbo LGA, and that is really important that those, those go in because um, we don't want to lose any more people. Uh, losing one is more than, more than we should have. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We are all, without exception, affected by COVID-19. We're all weathering the storm, but we are definitely not in the same boat. So there's the haves and the have-nots. The ongoing impacts of colonisation and land dispossession and the theft of our children by the governments of this country mean that our people are already experiencing the worst impacts of an inequality that we did not create. We are no strangers to dealing with infectious diseases to which we have no immunity. When the pandemic hit, we led the way in keeping our communities safe. But governments, both Labor and Liberal, sent us body bags before they sent PPE, assuming we would fail. Our people are always the ones to be hit the hardest because our health, legal assistance and income support services were already under strain before the pandemic because of neglect by Labor and Liberal governments. Don't make out that you care when, when you're in government, you do exactly the opposite of what the people want. Our people were very clear at the start of the pandemic and for decades before that, our people have been demanding homes for all, higher income support payments so that our babies would not go hungry, the immediate and safe release of imprisoned First Nations people and more resourcing and public money for our health, social support, legal assistance and family violence prevention services. What did we get? We got what the old colonial system has always done to us, and that is dismissed us and ignored us and not allowed us to self-determine and decide our own destiny as first people of these lands. I want to pay my respects to my fellow First Nations senators who have spoken in support of this MPI, particularly uh, Senator Dodson and Senator McCarthy. It's too often that our people get talked about or we get spoken for, but we don't get to speak for ourselves. Times have changed, haven't they, when you've got to deal with black senators in 2021. Our people know how to look after ourselves and each other, and we certainly know how to do it better than any Labor or Liberal government. How long you fellas been here? 200 years. We've been doing this for thousands and thousands of generations. So when decisions are in our hands, our solutions work and we take care of our communities. That's why we need treaties 
or a treaty. We are better off when we are free to make the choices that are best for us. But today, Labor and Liberal governments around the country decide who does and who doesn't get to eat today, or who gets to be vaccinated or not, or who gets access to a good hospital or not based on the colour of your skin. Our people and our cultures are strong and resilient, and just like everyone else, we thrive when we can set our own course. We need your solidarity. Our people are dying. Our be our babies are hungry because too many Labor and Liberal governments over decades Senator have pushed Senator Thorpe, your to time has it. expired. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise today to speak about the absolute catastrophe that is unfolding in First Nations communities in Western New South Wales because of the spread of COVID into those vulnerable communities. Completely avoidable, completely avoidable. And yet <clears throat> the Morrison government, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr Ken Wyatt, uh, Senator Colbeck in this place and indeed the Prime Minister are trying to convince us that all is well. Well, it is not well. It's not well. And today we have <clears throat> yet another letter from the Murray Ma Health Corporation pleading with Mr Morrison to send assistance, to put in place specialist quarantine facilities, to help with the overcrowding, which was foreseeable what was going to happen. This is not the first time this community health organisation has written to the Prime Minister. They wrote to the Prime Minister 18 months ago, 18 months ago, to say we need an urgent plan. And for Senator Colbeck to stand in this place today and say, oh, it's all OK because we offered First Nations people vaccines as part of the 1B group, that's all they did. That's all they did. We've heard about communication failures. We've heard about vaccine hesitancy. We've heard about proselytising by religious groups. And all the while, the Morrison government is trying to pretend everything is hunky-dory. Well, it isn't. The Murray Ma Corporation know what's going on. They're on the ground in Western New South Wales. And we have put this government on notice. Earlier in the week, Senator Dodson and I wrote an urgent letter to Minister Wyatt to say, what are you doing about contingency planning in Western Australia? Many of our remote communities are on the border with South Australia and the Northern Territory. It's not rocket science to imagine that the disease can spread fairly quickly from Western New South Wales into Western Australia. Indeed, we had two truck drivers cross the Nullarbor uh, last week, last Friday, and they uh, turned out to be COVID positive. That's how quickly it spreads. And yet there's no plan, there's nothing in place to protect remote communities anywhere in this country. And we've now got the shocking statistic of a man who's passed away in Western New South Wales. And the responsibility for that rests fairly at the feet of the Morrison government. They're in control of vaccine rollout. They're in control of quarantine. And they've failed at both of those jobs. They've failed at communication with First Nations communities. They've sent white nurses into communities in Western Australia completely unannounced and wonder why we've got vaccine hesitancy. It takes communication. It takes elders. It takes cultural leaders to get communities vaccinated. It takes taking the vaccine out. And this uh, response earlier in the week that pharmacies are now able to give the vaccine, where do they think the pharmacies are in remote Kimberley and Pilbara in Western Australia? What a joke. And it shows you how out of touch this government is and how they don't really care about what is going on. Because Western New South Wales is a catastrophe. They're the words being used by uh, the Murray Ma Health Organisation, the corporation, and it was absolutely avoidable. And the responsibility sits fairly and squarely with Mr Morrison. And there's time to fix things. There's time to protect other communities. But it needs you to sit down. It needs you to listen. It needs you to engage with 
Aboriginal community leaders. Because just making the vaccines available as part of the 1B group tick done is not good enough. It is not good enough. Many of those communities, English is the third and fourth language that's spoken. And what are we doing with our communication? Nothing. In fact, when we met with General Fruin a couple of weeks ago, he admitted to us they hadn't got the communication right. 18 months in, we're making fundamental errors like that. We've got an uncaring government. The public will judge you. We are watching, and you'd better get to work right now, urgently, and fix the mess that you've created. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Well, I am bitterly, bitterly disappointed by the actions of Labor today. Politicising a family's grief, politicising a community's angst, and prioritising blame over solutions, which is exactly what they've accused us of doing, but this is what they are doing. I want to put things in a bit of perspective on some of the issues raised today. This, this idea that uh, once Delta reached our shores, it's still entirely preventable to keep it out of our communities. As Senator Lyons herself just said, there was a case of a truck driver and essential worker with all the right permits who travelled to Western Australia, and yes, it was then discovered he had COVID. I want to commend all of the businesses, all of the roadhouses and all of the um, people across the nation, family businesses, who have got in place their COVID safe plans. Because the truth is the Delta variant is causing significant concern right across the world. No country has managed to contain a significant Delta outbreak. In fact, we saw in the UK, even though they had record high vaccination rates, when Delta hit their shores, it, um, they went back into various stages of restrictions and lockdowns to try and deal with it. It is undeniable that the infectious nature of the Delta variant is a significant factor in the situation we are seeing before us, not only in regional New South Wales, but also in regional Victoria and um, in Sydney and Melbourne. Now, I'm not for a moment trying to deny the problems faced by the people of World Kenya and other communities. But we have been working and will continue to work with our Indigenous communities to find solutions. In fact, in March last year, at the very, very early stages of the pandemic and before any lockdown, we set up the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Group. This is with Indigenous peoples, because, as is quite rightly said to us all the time, don't be the white people telling the Indigenous people what to do. Listen to the Indigenous people, and that's what our government has sought to do. In March, late March last year, that advisory group had developed a management plan. And indeed, the Murray Ma um, clinic that Senator Lyon was talking about, from May last year, they were a recognised uh, GP respiratory clinic doing great work with their people in Wilcania. And from March this year, they had transitioned to be a Commonwealth vaccination centre giving out the AstraZeneca vaccine. And from June this year, They've been able to give the Pfizer vaccine, and I thank them for what they're doing in their community for their people. But we are also doing other things because it is not a simple solution. Dealing with COVID is not a simple solution, and uh, we need to take a holistic approach. I'd like to also um, address some of the other outlandish suggestions by those opposite. Uh, Senator Lyons' comments 
I want to draw to Senator Lyons's attention and to Labor's attention comments by the first Assistant Secretary of the Vaccine Cut Task Force during his presentation to the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19, 23rd of July this year. And I quote, in response to questions that I asked, because I have been asking through that committee ever since its establishment, are we rolling out vaccines in regional areas? Are we looking after our Indigenous people? I've been asking those questions, more so than those opposite. And the answer I got was every aspect of the COVID-19 response and vaccine rollout has been done in partnership with the Aboriginal health sector. But don't just take my word for it. Let's look at the fig Working with them, thank you, Senator Polly. We did. We worked with them. We asked them. Oh, sorry, was it Senator McAllister? I apologise. <laughs> but let's look at the figures. In Australia, over 200,000 Indigenous Australians have now had their first dose. Over 108,000 are now fully vaccinated, which is over 20 per cent of the Indigenous population. Is that the same rate of the rest of the nation? No. But it is certainly a lot further than those opposite would have you believe. In relation to Western New South Wales, an additional 600 doses of Pfizer have been reallocated to the Dubbo Shire, um, and an additional 600 doses have been reallocated to the Dubbo Regional Aboriginal Health Service. More broadly, our government is working with 2,645 primary care sites in regional Australia, including over 1,500 general practitioners, nearly 1,000 community pharmacies. 27 Aboriginal controlled health care providers and, of course, our wonderful Royal Flying Doctors have set up 182 uh, Flying Doctor service sites. And while I'm talking about the Flying Doctors, because they are one of my favourite organisations, it may be pertinent to uh, repeat an anecdote that was provided by Minister David Gillespie during question time today. He told of the story of RFDS nurse Kellyanne Johnson, an Aboriginal woman with family from Jarvis Bay, who is now with the Flying Doctors providing vaccinations to residents in Wreck Bay, another Commonwealth Territory. Yesterday, Kellyanne vaccinated both the youngest and the oldest Aboriginal resident in that population, and everywhere in between, she says. Kellyanne has been a real inspiration to her community and following her community engagement is considered a local hero. As one Indigenous leader said, some of the kids now want to be RFDS nurses and I would strongly encourage them to follow that gallant career path. So I want to thank not only Kellyanne but all of our flying doctor nurses and the doctors and the pilots who facilitate getting them out there, and their logistics crew and ground crew. Thank you for the work you've been doing, because they have not just been vaccinating. They have also been providing medical evacuations. They've been providing uh, personal protective equipment deliveries into our regional and remote communities. And they are the ones who are going into the Kimberley and the Pilbara that Senator Lyons thinks our government was giving to community pharmacies. We know our geography, we know regional Australia, and we know how to service them. Back to Western New South Wales. Following the current outbreak um, that leaked out of Sydney, there's currently 690 cases. And yes, it is very sad that and there has now been a death. An Aboriginal man in his early 50s who was positive to COVID has passed away. And uh, my condolences go to his family. And I apologise that this place has chosen to take advantage of your grief for cheap political shots. In Western New South Wales, we have a multi-agency, multi-government approach to vaccinating our regional and remote population. Uh, we're currently working with the, with the state government and the Aboriginal Health Services. 
We have got over 100 Australian Defence Force personnel deployed. We are using the Royal Flying Doctor Services. We are using the on-the-ground GPs and pharmacists who people trust and know and feel confident to go. And I am receiving feedback from those in these areas about how relieved they are to see these people and to hear the messages. And yes, it is true. Communications. We have been rolling out communications, but have, they, have we always got the message right? Not necessarily. But that is where, and I thank the elders that have stepped up to encourage their communities. I thank Riverbank Frank, and I thank the other Aboriginal elders who are strongly advocating amongst their populations for people to roll up their sleeve. And I implore Labor to come back to Senator the bipartisan Davey, position we have. Senator your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on this MPI about the need for the Morrison-Joyce government to stop blaming First Nations Australia and instead take responsibility for its bungled vaccine rollout, um, uh, the dangerous situation in Western New South Wales and its failure to prepare and protect uh, First Nations communities across Australia from the spread of COVID, including its failure to, communicate, to properly communicate to ensure access to health facilities, food security and adequate housing and isolation places. I read that out specifically because this is also about years and years and years of neglect of First Nations communities, to the point where the government knew that First Nations communities were extremely uh, well, highly at risk from COVID. They knew that at the beginning of the pandemic. They knew it when they set the plan for vaccination rollout, which is why First Nations peoples were in 1A and 1B, and importantly, to make sure First Nations peoples got vaccinated early on. And yet here we are, exactly what was feared and what Myanmar warned the government about. But the government knew because they've known for years and years and years about inadequate community, not just in Western New South Wales, in my home state of Western Australia and in the Northern Territory and in South Australia. And I'm sure it's the same situation in Victoria and Tasmania. They knew this. They knew that our First Nations communities have a significant gap in life expectancy and a much higher burden of chronic disease than any other community in this country. And yet, the stroll out didn't even bother to really prioritise First Nations communities, same as they didn't on if uh, people in residential aged care and aged care workers for, and for disabled people. In New South Wales, the data shows a huge gap between First Nations and non-First uh, Nations vaccination rates in every region in the state. Why has it taken so long for the government to release this data, but also to get these vaccinations in people's arms, to deal with the conditions that would lead to the situation that we find ourselves in now? This situation is unacceptable. And don't blame Delta. Don't blame Delta for this. We knew it with the Alpha that they were going to significantly, if it got into communities, significantly impact on those communities. And don't say that we're taking advantage of this to push this point, because that this is life and death for people. So of course we are going to raise it. Of course we are going to raise the point in this chamber that vaccinations are not getting in the arms of First Nations peoples and they have been let down massively. Senator Dodson. Senator Dodson. I can see that you're there, Senator Dodson. It, you might have to just check whether you're on mute. And if not, please, you'll have to log out and log back on. We'll go to is Senator McMahon there. Uh, yes, yes, I am here. Uh, pl please go ahead, Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, look, the first thing that I would like to do on speaking on this uh, matter of urgency 
is to say that I absolutely reject the premise of this. Uh, it calls on, it talks about the need for the Morrison Joyce government to stop blaming First Nations Australians and instead take responsibility for a bungled vaccine rollout. Now, I reject all of that comment, all of that sentence. Um, who, who is said that anyone is blaming um, First Nations Australians, or in fact, anyone else for that matter? And why do those opposite, why do they constantly have to find blame? You know, we, we talk about we're all in this together and we're all working together and we should have a bipartisan approach. Yet those opposite continually politicise this issue and continually want to uh, apportion blame to someone. Um, I, I haven't heard anyone in this government um, blaming First Nations Australians, uh, yet uh, you know we're accused of doing that here. And uh, I absolutely reject that. We're not blaming anyone, yet that's what those on the other side continually, continually seek to do. Why does, why does there have to be someone to blame? Can we not just, can they not just join with this government in getting on with the job? Uh, and secondly, take responsibility for its bungled vaccine rollout. Um, there has been nothing bungled about this vaccine rollout at all. Yes, there have been aspects of it um, that may have been less than desirable, where things haven't worked out as planned, but it hasn't been bungled. You know, things, things happen. And uh, there's, this is unprecedented. This is an absolutely unprecedented situation. We're being asked to do something that we as a nation and we as the world have never ever attempted to do previously. So, you know, of course, not everything is gonna go absolutely according to plan all of the time. But that does not mean that the job is bungled. Uh, and this government has been exceptionally good at dealing with it and in dealing with everything that has been thrown our way. And many things have changed. This is a pandemic uh, and it's a dynamic situation. And, and, uh, and we have dealt with everything that's come our way and we've dealt with it practically and efficiently. Now, what has become clear as part of this is that um, some of the, the, uh, the governments that are actually responsible for, as those on the opposite side say, getting jabs into arms, which is the states and the territories, uh, they have decided that they want to be responsible for, for health and for the vaccine rollout, and, uh, and that's fine. So they probably should be. Uh, they know their communities, and particularly with regards to Indigenous communities, they know those communities certainly better than the federal government does. So it's appropriate that they should be in charge. Yet we hear that, for example, in the Northern Territory, uh, there's, there's some fairly poor results coming out with regard to Indigenous communities. Utopia, one community in Central Australia, from the, uh, the, the manager of the clinic there, at possibly 10 out of 700 residents vaccinated. Um, and, uh, and Kintor, another remote Indigenous community in Central Australia, uh, approximately a report of one in, one, in 400, one in 400 people consenting to be vaccinated when a, a team went out there uh, with enough vaccine to vaccinate that whole community of over 400 people. Now, this failure absolutely has to fall at the feet of the Northern Territory Government. Again, not laying any blame, but if they are incapable, incapable if they're incapable of doing this rollout, then they need to ask for help. We're certainly here and prepared to, to help and to provide resources and funds where they're needed. But the Northern Territory Government is very much in charge of this rollout in Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. They need to admit that they are not capable of doing this effectively and they need to ask for help where they are, are failing in uh, their task of rolling out the vaccine to remote Indigenous Territorians. Come forward, say you're not doing the job, and your time has expired. Senator Dodson.
Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing from Broome. Uh, this MPI wouldn't be on our agenda, only that the, in the other place yesterday afternoon, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, uh, Australians, was blaming hesitancy amongst First Nations people for the dreadfully low rates of vaccinations against COVID. Hesitancy is an issue that has to be overcome. And we still have a lot of work to do, is what the minister said. But why is it that in September 2021, this government thinks that having a lot to do is news in this particular space? There's only one answer to that. It's because this government has been scandalously and callously negligent. At the very start of its rollout program, the government identified First Nations peoples as number one priority, the group to be focused in upon and prepared for the virus when it arrived. To the extent that hesitancy amongst First Nations people is an issue, is not their fault. The government's bungled and inadequate messaging is the cause of that. And then there's the impact of wrong-headed evangelists and tin-pot religious elements that are said to be spreading propaganda to create fear amongst, uh, about the vaccine and amongst the remote and susceptible communities. These are no more than wolves in sheep clothing is the way I see them. And what's the government doing about this to fix this hesitancy and misinformation? Well, the minister yesterday gave us no comfort. If the government's got a plan to avert the, uh, whatever the uh, hesitancy there is, then the minister told us nothing about it. This government is more concerned, it seems to me, about punishing people than managing the lives of First Nations people and getting them the vaccine that's necessary to avoid COVID. We know COVID is raging First Nations communities in Western New South Wales. And my awful fear is that it's only a matter of time before communities elsewhere are overwhelmed. And I've heard, we've heard why the connection between East and West happens. What we're witnessing in, West, in New South Wales is tragic enough. But if this scourge ever gets into remote Australia, the impact will be catastrophic. My own state of Western Australia has a hard border, but apart from occasional spot checks elsewhere, the policing of that border is readily confined to, or really confined to the main access points, like the highway and the airports. The border means very little to those in Aboriginal communities who regularly travel for family or cultural businesses from the APY lands of South Australia and the Northern Territory into Western Australia and vice versa. I know that the Vaccine Commissioner of Western Australia has sought assistance from the Morrison government for the Defence Force to help out in these remote breaches. But as far as I know, there's been no AFD assistance provided from the Commonwealth government. These are times that really call for leadership and vision. Leadership from the top of the Commonwealth Government is needed, informed by a clear side of, of vision. We've heard Senator Seawood talk about the awful conditions that are well known in this country that prevail in the social indicator areas that affect in First Nations peoples. So this calls for urgency, communication, organisation and action. We wouldn't be in this mess if the government had done its job and fulfilled its obligations to protect First Nations peoples. Lives are at stake and the government shouldn't hide behind Nacho and the peak organisations. Time's up 
Government, get out there and do your job. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I couldn't agree more that this is a matter of extreme urgency, which calls on the Morrison-Joyce government to take responsibility for the dangerous situation in Western New South Wales. Why was this government sitting on its hands and sitting on data that clearly showed vaccination rates in First Nations communities in Western New South Wales was desperately low? Why did you not do something sooner? Because you just don't care. There's such a severe lack of adequate housing in Balkania that people are having to isolate themselves in tents because their homes are overcrowded. Locals have said that food being delivered is sometimes out of date and nutritionally poor. These fa failures and the utter disregard for First Nations communities is not new. They have been targeted systematically since the start of colonization and the pandemic has changed nothing. According to the government's own vaccination plan, First Nations people were in either phase 1A or 1B. They should have been vaccinated by now. They have, the government has no one to blame but themselves. Scott Morrison's government was told clearly that were the virus to enter a First Nations community, there would be devastating results given the abysmal rollout of vaccination, food insecurity, and the lack of adequate housing and appropriate health services. A loud and clear alarm was sounded at the very beginning of this pandemic. The Maori Ma Aboriginal Health Corporation wrote to Minister Wyatt 18 months ago. The letter outlined grave fears for Wilcania if COVID was spread to the at-risk population there. It said, warnings from around the world are clear. The earlier we prepare and act, the better the outcomes will be. We cannot wait until the first case turns up in the community. And here we are now, not just the first case, but a large percentage of people and children infected and sadly, a First Nations man has died of COVID-19. The crisis unfolding in Wilcania is not mere incompetence. It is a complete disgrace. The equally incompetent New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard has bounced the responsibility off to the federal government. Minister, Mr. Hazard had the audacity to say that he had many friends who are Aboriginal in Northwest and Western New South Wales, and that he was quite frustrated Everyone knows Mr. Hazard can be very vocal about his frustrations when it suits him. So why was he so quiet about this one? Why didn't he turn his frustration into action? The federal and New South Wales governments have completely failed First Nations communities in Western New South Wales. Wake up! First Nations people know what is best for their communities. Listen to them and do what they are asking you to do. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, in my state of New South Wales, we are now seeing the tragic consequences of Mr. Morrison's lack of urgency. His lack of urgency on vaccines, on quarantine, and on protecting First Nations communities. We have seen his death, the first death of an Indigenous person in the pandemic, a man in his 50s in Dubbo. Nowhere in New South Wales has a higher rate of infection than Wilcannia, where more than 10% of the mostly Indigenous local community have contracted the virus. Mr Morrison has warned about the potential for a COVID crisis in Wilcannia 18 months ago, he was warned. 18 months ago, in March 2020, the Murramay Aboriginal Health Corporation wrote to the Morrison government. To quote directly from that letter, they said, we cannot wait until the first case turns up in the community, or worse, the first hospital case presents. The poverty and extreme vulnerability of Aboriginal people and communities in Murdipaki region is a direct result of decades of failed government policies. I went on to say, I'm sure you can understand our anxiety that these failures not continue or worsen through the COVID-19 crisis. That was in March of last year. As of yesterday, there were 73 cases in Wilcannia, which has a population of just 745 people. The worst fears expressed by the Murramay 18 months ago have tragically been realised. As Murramay said in a separate letter sent to the Prime Minister just last week, they, I quote, disappointingly, pointingly, no tangible plan was in place prior to this outbreak that could have been easily implemented. As a result, 
We've been playing catch up from day one. Our systems and services are ill-prepared. Actions are too slow to be implemented. Our response has been substandard. Existing resources and expertise is not sufficient. It is clear based on these comments that there's been an utter failure of preparing and planning by the Morrison government. Dr. Peter Maloof from the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales said yesterday, and I quote, our community controlled health services in those areas certainly expressed to government 18 months ago about preparedness and investing in resources in those communities. But those requests have obviously been silenced by both the Commonwealth and New South Wales governments, and now we're seeing these high numbers of cases. He went on to say, it's just horrible. It's worth remembering, while Mr Morrison is doing the rounds and the media talking about a national plan, that under Mr Morrison's earlier plan, his vaccination plan, the First Nations people were part of phase 1B of the rollout and were supposed to be fully vaccinated by this winter. Well, winter has come and gone. Spring is here and just 12.5 per cent of Indigenous people in New South Wales are fully vaccinated. So not only has Mr Morrison not heeded the warnings of the Murrah May and other groups, not only was there no plan in place in the event of an outbreak in far western New South Wales, but he's also failed to hold up his own vaccination plan. But I want to contrast that to the inspirational leadership we are seeing from members of the local, those in the local community. Last night, NITV shot a spotlight on Leroy Johnson and Walpa Thompson, who are making five hour round trips to hunt and deliver kangaroo meat from the uh, Mutawinji National Park, which, which Mr Johnson manages and then taking it to Wilcannia to stop the, to, uh, to the local community to be stopped from going hungry. Or well, they're called this operation Deliveroo. If only the gig platform Deliveroo had even a sliver of integrity and community spirit that you have shown. But I, have, I want to commend Mr Johnson, Mr Thompson, and those who are supporting their efforts, including the CEO of Baringi Native Title Derek Hardman, Baranyinji Elder Robert Kennedy and local broadcaster Brendan Adams for stepping up and demonstrating some sorely needed leadership during this outbreak. I hope the Prime Minister is taking note and quite clearly the government does not know how to represent and support regional Australia. And quite clearly the concerns raised by this community are rallying call for the government to get Senator its act Sheldon, together. Sheldon, your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. And those have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Jenny, Jenny, can I grab you for the... Stop the bells. The question is the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Davey teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 13. The question is resolved in the negative. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I seek leave to move to postpone a motion. Uh, and the business of the Senate matter number uh, one? Business of the Senate, yeah. I was waiting for you to say, yeah, you can do it. Um, uh, it's business of the Senate number one to the first day of the next sitting. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. It's so postponed. Thank you. Just give people a moment to leave the Senate chamber or take their seats. I will now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page three of today's order of business. Document one. Document two. Which is, I'm sorry, I'll read them. Document one, vacancy in the representation of South Australia. Document two, superannuation government co contribution for low income earners act 2003, operation of the government co contribution scheme. Okay, I'll now move to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart. Sorry. Act. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee of the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest 14 of 2021. Thank you. 
Senator Urquhart. Sorry, I know that um, the government whip is going to do this joint standing committee on treaties. Mm -hmm. Could I ask if no one is speaking to that if you could seek leave to continue your remarks at the end of that? Thank you. And um, I will, on behalf of the Select Committee on Temporary Migration, I present the final report of the committee <coughs> together with accompanying documents and I move that the Senate take note of the report and I understand that Senator Shikoni wants to speak to that report. Thank you. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. As the Chair of the Select Committee on Temporary Migration, it is my pleasure to speak to the report on the occasion of its tabling today. The Select Committee on Temporary Migration was established by the Senate on the 5th of December 2019. Its mandate was to inquire into and report on the impact temporary migration has on the Australian economy, wages and jobs, social cohesion and workplace rights and conditions. Now, with international borders closed, COVID-19 has exposed the dependency of our economy that it has on temporary migration. Prior to the global pandemic, Australia was home to the second largest temporary migrant workforce in the OECD. There was significant and growing evidence of exploitation and wage theft in sectors with high levels of temporary migrant workers. This exploitation was facilitated by the vulnerability of their temporary status, lack of workplace protections and the inability to assert their workplace rights. Now, over the course of the past two years, the committee has received 131 submissions from individuals, from community groups, peak bodies, businesses, unions and a myriad of other stakeholders. In these submissions, the committee heard from those with all manner of life experience. But there is one story that runs true through almost every one of them. And that is a story of a broken system that is failing to deliver for those that need it to. Madam Acting Deputy President, over the course of the past two years, we've heard of temporary visa worker exploitation, of wage theft, of physical abuse and sexual abuse. We've heard of visa harassment times stretching into not just the months, but the years of a systemic lack of communication from the Department of Home Affairs with visa applicants. We've heard of farmers who are struggling to access the labour that they need to meet their demands in harvest periods and of their frustration in navigating visa programs and the bureaucracy surrounding Australia's various labour schemes. We've heard from communities suffering from the social effects of transient workforces and, the des and, and desperate to offer temporary migrants temporary, uh, permanent opportunities to settle, but unable to do so, and all too common tale in regional areas. These voices heard throughout the 131 submissions and in 10 individual hearings right across the past two years have told us that Australia's temporary migration program and its migration program more generally is in desperate need of reform. These voices deserve to be heard, and it is in this report that we seek to not just tell the stories of those behind the voice, but to also offer positive solutions to which ails them and the nation at large. Informed by expert testimony and first-hand accounts from witnesses, the recommendations contained in this report, all told coming to 40 in number, offer a bold, yet sensible vision for the future of Australia's migration program. Part of that vision is for a comprehensive review to be undertaken by the government of Australia's visa system with the objective of achieving greater simplification and improving its usability. Time and time again, the committee heard in submissions and testimony of complex nature of our visa system, subclasses upon subclasses, endless mountains of paperwork, and it was this theme of complexity that the committee encountered repeatedly in evidence that was received. Complexity for visa applicants, complexity for employer participants of the seasonal worker program and the Pacific Labor Scheme, complexity for those who suffered wrong, getting the help they need and the justice they deserve. I am pleased to say that the report includes recommendations to address all of these matters. 
Further, the committee recommends that more resources be provided to our hardworking public servants in the Department of Home Affairs to give them what they need to improve assessment times and communication with applicants. Under the visa system envisaged by this report, applying for a visa would be straightforward and assessments would be conducted in both a timely and transparent manner. Skill shortages, where they may be suspected of occurring, will be assessed and declared by an independent body, incorporating the voices of government, industry and unions. Australians will always have first opportunity to fill job openings as they should, as through a refocusing of our migration program on permanency. Those who do come here for work will have the ability to stay and to contribute should they wish to. And as the pandemic has shown us, Australia's reliance on millions of guest workers is no longer sustainable. Not that it ever was. Gone is the 88 day slave requirement of the Working Holiday Maker Program. Farmers who need labour and where the labour cannot be sourced domestically can access this through the Seasonal Worker Program or the Pacific Labour Scheme. Workers who we know are more productive and are afforded more protections from those who do the wrong thing. And for those dodgy operators, those hire companies, should these recommendations be adopted, as I hope they will, if found to be exploiting workers, not only will they have a revamped and an empowered Fair Work Inspectorate holding them to account, but they will be prohibited from employing temporary visa workers into the future. Madam Acting Deputy President, those who spoke to our committee told us that they were fed up with report after report, band-aid solutions and a lack of systemic improvement. These recommendations are that systemic improvement. They constitute a suite of solutions to persistent problems that will improve the temporary migration program and make it work for Australia. Migration is a key economic lever that can help the Australian economy. And if we get the migration settings right, we can encourage economic growth and ensure that no Australian worker is left behind. Temporary migration has a very important role to play in areas where we cannot skill up enough Aussies quickly to meet demand. That is why we need to reset our migration program to meet the unprecedented economic challenges that we are currently facing. Australia is a nation built by migrants just like the stories of my parents that came here from Italy. We can remain the successful multicultural nation that we are, but only if we use migration to assist Australia's economic recovery and enable migrants to have a pathway to permanency. That is important. I'm disappointed that as a result of the pandemic, that we as a community didn't get to visit all the places in Australia that we'd hope so. Whilst we were fortunate to hold a number of hearings outside of Canberra, I would have liked to have spent more time in regional Australia speaking to locals in their communities. Nonetheless, I sincerely thank those who made the effort to dial into our hearings to provide their testimony to us, as I thank all those who made contributions to the committee, either in person or in written form. I'd like to place on, my rec on the record my thanks to fellow committee members, Deputy Chair Senator Chandler and Senator Walsh, Throughout the course of our inquiry, proceedings of the committee were conducted in a very cooperative nature. Lastly, thanks must also go to the Secretary, without whom this report would not have been delivered, and to Bastion in my office for his advice. To the Government, I hope that you recognise the value of this report and consider it seriously with all the recommendations contained within it. These recommendations represent a balanced assessment of the needs of our community. Our migration program and the temporary migrants specifically are important to our community and our economy. And it is time that we all work together to make sure that this program is everything it needs to be to guarantee our nation's future prosperity. And I commend the report to the chamber. Senator Carr, uh, are you seeking leave to continue your I remarks? I could. Uh, thank you very much. Seek leave to continue my remarks. Is yes, leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Davy. Uh, thank you. I present reports on behalf of the Public Accounts and Audit and Treaties Joint Committees, as listed at item 16 on today's order of business, and I seek leave to continue my remarks.
Is leave I, granted? Leave is granted. I also present executive minute responses in relation to various reports of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? Yes. Minister? Uh, I table documents relating to two orders for the production of documents concerning COVID-19 vaccination rates. Committee memberships. Oops, no, oh, sorry, you, Minister. Do you? Okay. The president has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. Minister, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Minister. I move that Senator Pratt replace Senator McAllister on the Economics References Committee for the committee's inquiry into the Australian manufacturing industry, and Senator McAllister be appointed as a participating member. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence National Health Amendment, COVID 19 Bill 2021, National Redress Scheme for in Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Bill 2021, and Pay Parental Leave Amendment, COVID 19 Work Test Bill 2021. Minister? I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together, and be now read a first time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Um, Clark. National Health Amendment, COVID-19 Bill 2021. National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment Bill 2021. And Paid Parental Leave Amendment, COVID-19 Work Test Bill 2021. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Paid Parental Leave Amendment COVID-19 Work Test Bill 2021 and move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that that uh, motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order for the day for a later hour. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is, is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. I will now go, go to the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021, in committee. Now. The committee is considering the Sex Discrimina Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021 as amended and amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1382 moved by Senator McAllister. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those that are Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. And if you would, the Chamber might indulge me briefly while I just find my notes. happy to indulge, particularly as I've just taken the chair. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, earlier in the debate, I moved uh, these amendments um, and I indicated that the amendment proposed replicates the private senator's bill that I introduced earlier into this chamber uh, and seeks to establish 10 days paid domestic violence leave as part of the national employment standards. Uh, and essentially, what this, bill, what this amendment would do is improve the existing entitlement to the national employment standards from five days unpaid domestic and family violence leave to 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave. And that is a much needed reform. Um, business tells us that there is a very significant impact 
of family and domestic violence on their employees. Uh, in 2016, the National Retail Association estimated that in a single year, almost 45,000 women working in the retail industry experienced some form of family and domestic violence. The Australian Council of Trade Unions estimates that it costs $18,000 and 141 hours to leave a violent relationship. Many working women resign or are terminated from their employment because they need to take the time to deal with issues that arise as a consequence of domestic abuse, finding housing, attending the court or a doctor's appointment and ensuring that their children have the support that they need. And it puts women fleeing violence in a precarious position. Many face the unacceptable choice of fleeing safety, fleeing to safety or keeping their job. And no one should be forced to make this decision. Given the prevalence of family and domestic violence in Australia, its impact on employment and the economy, there is an urgent need to support working women to flee violence and to keep themselves safe. The current arrangements are simply inadequate. The experience of businesses who have already introduced paid leave is that, on average, women do not take the entire 10 days that are available to them, but instead use part of that entitlement modestly, carefully, to make the changes that they need. Australian women want to keep working. They value their working lives. This amendment seeks to provide the choices, the real choices, that would deliver real equality for Australian women who are presently confronted by violence in their households. The question is that am I seeing any oh Senator Waters. You have the call. No, we're not hearing you, Senator Waters. You're not on mute. Can we try again? Uh, is anyone else seeking the call? Minister. Um, the government will be opposing this amendment. The primary purpose of this bill is to implement the government's commitments in response to recommendations made by the Respect at Work report. Um, I would also observe that in 2018, an entitlement to five days unpaid family and domestic violence leave in a 12-month period was inserted into the National Employment Standards in the Fair Work Act. Uh, this followed the Fair Work Commission's decision to provide five days of unpaid family and domestic violence leave to employees covered by a modern war award. The Fair Work Commission itself is currently reviewing the family and domestic leave clause in modern awards and further consideration of the issue of paid leave by this government will be appropriately informed by the Commission's consideration uh, of the issue. And I would also note um, that employers, of course, are able to provide entitlements that suit their own workplaces. Thank you, Minister. We'll try Senator Waters again remotely. Senator Waters, you have the call. Do, do we have luck with audio this time around? We do. Go ahead, Excellent Senator Waters. News. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, and I rise to speak very briefly on uh, this amendment before the Chamber 1382, which would give uh, workers 10 days of paid family and domestic violence leave. Um, this has been long-standing Greens policy and we are in full support uh, of this amendment. Uh, we had a similar amendment drafted ourselves, but as I referenced earlier today, uh, we've, seen, uh, we've come to an arrangement about who moves what to, to try to make sure that the chamber is, a, um, is progressing smoothly. Uh, so I just want to place on record that we think this is eminently sensible. And whilst it goes beyond the recommendations of the Respect at Work uh, report, so too uh, does the miscarriage leave in the bill, which we also support. But the point is, um, if you're opening that, uh, if you're opening up the possibility of unrelated amendments, then we think that this amendment should also be moved. I sat on the uh, committee inquiry into the government's bill for five days of unpaid domestic violence leave, and the evidence was abundantly clear. Uh, workers need paid leave. Five days of unpaid, unpaid leave is as good as nothing. Um, and in fact, it costs employers to have the relationship uh, with their employee seven uh, unnecessarily. 
So in fact, it's a, it's a saving to business. So you'd think that the government would get right behind it. And most importantly, it's the right thing to do. And many employers, of course, want uh, to do the right thing by their employees. Uh, so to cut a long story short, we are in strong support of this amendment and we urge the government to finally uh, put its money where its mouth is and uh, back uh, the call for 10 days of paid family and domestic violence leave for all workers. Okay, thank you, Senator Waters. I believe that's the final contribution. So the question is that amendments one and two on sheet 138 Eight two, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. No. The noes have it. No, have it. Have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Stop the bill. So the question is that amendments one and two on sheet 1382, as moved by Senator McAllister, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 13 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <laughs> Senator McAllister. Um. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to move opposition amendments on sheets 1381, 1385 and 1399 together. By leave. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McAllister. Thank you. And I move the opposition amendments on sheets 1381, 1385 and 1399. I've elected to do these together because I'm conscious of the time and the significance of passing those aspects of the bill that are important to Australian women. I will speak briefly about each of them in turn, commencing with the amendments uh, on sheet 1385. The Respect at Work report uh, included a recommendation at recommendation 23, which states that recommends that uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission Act be amended to allow unions and other representative groups to bring representative claims to court, consistent with the existing provisions in the Australian Human Rights Commission Act that allow unions and other representative groups to bring a representative complaint to the Commission. That recommendation could not be clearer. It is very straightforward, and neither could the government's rejection of this recommendation. This recommendation to facilitate representative actions has been endorsed by many submitters to the inquiry on this bill as an important means to provide greater access to justice for those seeking redress for workplace sexual and sex-based harassment. But ensuring access to justice is clearly not a matter that this government thinks is of any importance to those who have been sexually harassed or who have suffered sex-based harassment. This bill does not implement this recommendation, and the government's response to the report overall simply notes the recommendation. Another example of weasel words, where the government says that they support all 55 recommendations, but when you read the five print, like most other things, in fact they have absolutely no intention of dealing with them. The government's response asserts that there is an existing mechanism to enable representative proceedings in the federal court. It is directly contradicted by the Respect at Work report, in which Commissioner Jenkins says this. Standing provisions to commence proceedings in the federal courts are limited to an affected person, which is defined as a person on whose behalf the complainant was lodged with the commission. And she goes on to say this. This means the ability to take court proceedings under federal discrimination law is currently more constrained than the ability to bring complaints to the Commission. It prevents public interest-based organisations from bringing an action in the courts, even if they have pursued it with the Commission first. She goes on to say this, although there are provisions to bring a representative complaint to the federal court, although not the federal circuit court, these provisions are technical and complex 
and are different to the requirements under the Australian Human Rights Commission Act. It's a pretty clear problem definition, isn't it? The ability to bring representative complaints is constrained, it's limited to just one of the two relevant courts, and it's not aligned with the process for the Human Rights Commission, which means that it is more than necessarily complex and acts as an impediment to justice. Why wouldn't you fix this? You asked Commissioner Jenkins to go and look at these issues, but now you ignore her advice. You note it, and then you assert something entirely contradictory. Because again, this arrogant government thinks it knows better. It asks an expert to do a piece of work, a piece of work they are happy to trumpet as being a landmark piece of advice, and then does absolutely nothing about it. The amendment before the chamber on sheet 1385 seeks to implement recommendation 23. I turn now to the amendments which are on sheet 1381. These amendments perform a very important uh, role in the way that workplace sexual harassment and sex-based harassment is dealt with under the Fair Work Act. Workers who are sexually harassed do need access to a fair, effective and efficient complaints mechanism, and this set of amendments would establish this. Not only is there a need for a clear prohibition on sexual harassment and sex-based harassment as recommended by Respect at Work and rejected by this government, there is also the need for a complaints provision in the Fair Work Act which would be available to all workers, including former and prospective workers who seek a remedy through the Fair Work Commission for current or past sexual harassment. And that is the effect of the amendments on page 1381. And I turn finally to the amendments set out on sheet 1399. These amendments are quite straightforward. They pick up two recommendations made by the Australian Human Rights Commission in their submission to the Senate inquiry on this bill. In their submission, the Commission notes that the bill explicitly provides that not only sexual harassment but also other sex-based harassment is prohibited. And this re reflects the experience of many people who experience harassment at work that is on the basis of their sex but is not, and is not sexual in nature. And the Human Rights Commission said this, and I quote it, the important change in the bill to the Fair Work Act and regulations in relation to sexual harassment should also encompass the new legislative concept of sex-based harassment. That is, that the Fair Work Commission should be able to issue a stop, uh, a stop sex based harassment order, and employers should be given the confidence that if an employee engages in sex based harassment, this will be a valid reason for the termination of their employment. What is the point of referring a bill to a Senate inquiry for the experts, the very people who drafted the report, to make a submission, make a sensible technical amendment, if the government is going to ignore it. I'll remind senators that the only amendment moved by the government so far in this debate has been to defer commencement. You've received expert advice from the Commission, the people who wrote the Respect at Work report. I simply do not understand why this amendment could not be agreed to. I will leave my remarks there, but I'll make this final point. Throughout the debate today, Labor has sought to make the argument that there was a comprehensive review undertaken of the legal and regulatory framework to support women in their workplaces. It was undertaken by the people handpicked by the government with the expertise to do exactly this kind of work. The Australian Human Rights Commission has done this work for many other organisations very successfully. Why would the recommendations not be implemented? And why would the government persist with a pretence that they support all 55 recommendations if they've got absolutely no intention of legislating a very good number of them? Thank you, um, Senator McAllister. Senator Waters. 
Thanks very much, uh, uh, Deputy President. I'll make some very brief remarks, but I'll uh, state at the outset that the Greens will be supporting each of these amendments that are being moved uh, uh, conjoined tonight. I'll start off with some brief comments on 1385, which would uh, enable representative actions to be taken. Um, this is a very important amendment. Again, uh, the Greens had amendments to the same effect drafted, but um, uh, this is the one that's that's been moved to the bill. Uh, Addressing sexual harassment issues at a systemic level will help relieve the burden on individual workers to, pers to pursue complaints. And particularly where an employer is a repeat harasser, representative action on behalf of two or more employees can encourage cultural change. It should not be left up to workers to individually uh, pursue complaints and potential court action as the only remedy available to them. Representative actions must be allowed to be taken. It's exactly what Commissioner Jenkins recommended for the very reason that it is an enormous burden on the shoulders of workers, particularly young junior female workers uh, who find it unthinkable and it's why we see so few complaints. We could fix that with representative actions so that unions or other representative bodies could, with the full consent of course of the complainants, take, their, uh, take the action on their behalf. That would be a delivery of justice um, and any opposition to this amendment is a denial of, of access to justice. For many workers, they want the harassment to stop. They don't want to be named as the victim. Um, and importantly, the amendment does require the consent of every person covered by a representative action. Uh, so we are in strong support of this amendment uh, 1385. Moving quickly to 1381, um, this is a dispute resolution process uh, which would make it simpler for complaints to be dealt with under the Fair Work uh, Act. Um, Workers who are sexually harassed need access to fair, effective and efficient complaints mechanisms. So not only is there a need for a clear prohibition on sexual harassment and sex-based harassment, as recommended by uh, Commissioner Jenkins in the Respect at Work report, but there's also a need for a complaints process in the Fair Work Act, which is available to all workers uh, who seek a remedy through the Fair Work Commission for current or past sexual harassment. Um, I understand these amendments are drafted based on the process for dealing with unfair dismissal claims. Um, so essentially it's a simplified process to minimise trauma and to expedite outcomes for all parties. Uh, we will be supporting uh, Amendment 1381 and I would urge the government to do the same, although, yeah, it's not going to happen, sadly. Uh, the final amendment is uh, 1399, which um, again we support. This would uh, this is for stopping sex-based harassment orders. So, as folk understand, the bill uh, provides some good enforcement options to allow workers to apply to the Fair Work Commission for stop harassment orders when they're subject to sexual harassment. But the bill doesn't provide the same option for workers affected by sex-based harassment. Uh, as it should. It's a technical amendment, as Senator McAllister described it. Um, I hope it's just an oversight by government, um, but I um, can only form the conclusion that the government, in fact, does not really want to be dealing with issues of sexual harassment in the workplace. Otherwise, why else would it have bowled up a bill that so roundly ignores many of the key recommendations in the Respect at Work report? Um, uh, we here collaboratively are giving the government the chance to legislate the full suite of 55 recommendations. Uh, the amendments that are being moved cover off on all of the recommendations that the government has ignored. And it is incredibly disheartening, but perhaps not surprising, to see the government vote against them at every turn. Um, it, it just beggars belief that you would uh, ask for such a report to be written and then draft a bill that bears such little resemblance to it and still try to claim that you're addressing the problem. Nobody believes you. Do better. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. And in terms of these amendments, I've actually addressed um, the government's uh, view of them in the summing up speech. And in the interest of time, um, I won't make any further comments. Thank you. So the question is that opposition amendments one and two on sheet 1385 and opposition amendment sheets one, 
amendments 1 to 25 on sheet 1399 and opposition amendments 1 to 6 on sheet 1381 uh, moved by leave be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. <clears throat> I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order, stop the bells. So the question is that opposition amendments one and two on sheet one three eight five, and opposition amendments one to twenty five on sheet one three double nine, and opposition amendments one to six on sheet one three eight one be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart. 
as teller for the eyes and Senator Davey as teller for the nose. Order, there being 12 ayes and 13 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just let people get back to their seats. And I'll put the next question. Uh, I'm assuming we've now dealt with all of the amendments. We haven't. Beg your pardon. Jumping the gun. Thanks, um, Deputy President. And in fact, uh, this is, I, I think, the last amendment that I'll be moving on behalf of Labor. Um, I seek to move the amendments on sheet one, four, three, two, uh, items one and two by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, the Respect at Work inquiry heard that the existence of a sexually permeated hostile environment was not routinely recognised by individuals or by their organisations as sexual harassment. The Commission was of the view that this amendment would provide clarity and certainty in the law, which is we are frequently reminded by the Law Council is, in fact, essential for the administration of justice. It would assist in setting clear boundaries in the workplace for what is and is not acceptable conduct. Uh, and on that basis, again, Commissioner Jenkins recommended this change that we are now proposing as Recommendation 16C. Again and again and again, Senators are rising in this chamber to urge the implementation of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. And at the risk of tedious repetition, I'll just make this point again. The government said all of the 55 recommendations are supported, and yet so few of them appear in the legislation before us. And I hope on Monday. When, Premier, when Prime Minister Morrison stands up at the Women's Safety Summit and makes his big speech about how terrific it is that this legislation has made it through the parliament, I hope that he fronts up and is honest with Australian women. I hope he tells them that there are just a handful of the 55 recommendations that have actually been implemented as part of this legislation, that in fact so many of the recommendations that they purport to accept are merely noted and then pushed to one side or kicked into the long grass for some interminable process for which there is no end point and no prospect of a meaningful conclusion. Because all we can conclude, witnessing the behaviour of the government in this chamber, is that they are not in any way interested in providing a meaningful legislative response to the issues that were identified by uh, Commissioner Jenkins and which are so clearly laid out in this report. It's clear that the change that I am now proposing, the final amendment to be moved by Labor, does not have the support of a majority of the Senate at this time. Nonetheless, we are moving this amendment to ensure that this important recommendation of the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's landmark report is not ignored in this debate. Unfortunately, it has been ignored by the Morrison government. The Morrison government said that it agreed with Recommendation 16C of the Respect at Work report in principle. But it has ignored it in practice. Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. I'll make a very brief uh, contribution on Amendment uh, 1432. We again support uh, this amendment. Um, it is in fact Recommendation 16C of the Respect at Work report. That same one that the government claimed that they would accept all of the recommendations of, and yet seem to have. Uh, put forward a bill that resembles Swiss cheese with so many holes in it, it's more hole than cheese. Uh, so we support 
the recommendation uh, 16C, we support this amendment, which would uh, create a prohibition on creating or facilitating a hostile uh, working environment. Um, in many ways, the, this uh, creation of a positive duty uh, to maintain a safe workplace could have obviated the need for this prohibition on creating a hostile workplace. But since the government wouldn't come at a, a positive duty to create a safe workplace, um, we're trying again with this prohibition on creating a hostile environment. Um, but sadly, it seems that once again, the government uh, will not be actually taking these recommendations seriously. Uh, and uh, we'll try to claim credit for uh, doing a job that, in fact, they've barely scratched the surface of. But um, unlike Senator McAllister, I'm confident that they won't fool anyone at the Women's Safety Summit next Monday. Uh, and I don't think anyone will buy any of the words that come out of the Prime Minister's mouth when he's talking about women's safety. Um, I'm not sure whether he'll have to check with his wife before he makes that speech. Uh, she seems to be the moral barometer um, uh, when it comes to things pertaining uh, to women. And of course, I'm sure he won't mention the fact that the uh, frontline services that deal with domestic and family violence are still drastically underfunded, even after the small increase that was given in the budget. There's still one quarter of the funding that's needed to meet demand. So it's yet more spin uh, from this government. It's either spin or complete silence. We've got complete silence on equal pay day from the Prime Minister and from the relevant minister. Um, and now we'll get spin overdrive when it comes to what they're doing for women. But I'm sorry, you're not fooling anybody. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. And just very briefly, uh, the Respect at Work report suggested that a new prohibition should be introduced in the Sex Discrimination Act for creating or facilitating a hostile work environment uh, on the basis of sex. Uh, the government does not believe this is necessary, given that the model work health and safety laws already require that workers are protected from health and safety risks including psychosocial risks that can result from a hostile work environment. There is currently a specific obligation under work health and safety laws to provide a safe work environment. Uh, intimidating, hostile, humiliating or offensive environments would be considered a risk under existing work health and safety laws, uh, regardless of sex. Inserting an additional prohibition, including as drafted, may be duplicative and actually increase confusion for duty holders and workers. So the question is that opposition amendments one and two on sheet 1432 by leave be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. <coughs> uh, believe the noes have it. Senator Seaglick. President, could you um, uh, note in Hansard our support for that amendment? Thank you. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Uh, given it was our uh, amendment, we could, could yes. you please note we'll that note. we also support yep. that? Yep, we'll note that as well. Were you seeking the call, Senator Waters? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm happy to move to the next amendment if, the, if now yep, is the time. Sure. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, move Green's amendment on sheet uh, 1433. Yep. Yes, amendments 1 to, one to 3 are leave together on sheet 1433. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Waters. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just speak briefly to that. Um, addressing sexual harassment issues at the systemic level rather than the individual level will help relieve the burden on individual workers to pursue complaints and to encourage cultural change. Uh, so this uh, provision um, which would allow the uh, Human Rights Commission president and a delegate of the uh, president, if they so delegate, to inquire into matters that relate to systemic acts, omissions or practices um, really goes to driving that cultural change and to giving the Commission the power to do so of their own volition rather than waiting for an instruction which would never come um, from a minister, certainly wouldn't come from a minister in this Morrison government. So this provision really would complement the uh, sadly failed amendment to allow representative actions uh, by unions or other representative bodies, again relieving the burden on individuals to avoid harassment or to confront their boss or to run the gauntlet of the legal system on their own. Uh, examining systemic behaviour, practices, procedures and cultures of workplaces can make it safer for everyone, which is exactly why the government should vote for this amendment, but don't hold your breath. 
Uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Labor supports this amendment on the basis that we have moved and supported so many others that it implements a recommendation of the Respect at Work report. In this case, recommendation 19. Uh, I don't intend to provide any further remarks. I think that the material set out in the report explains the importance of the recommendation and it ought to be supported. Minister. Uh, thank you. And this amendment seeks to respond to recommendation 19 of the Respect at Work report to provide the AHRC with a broad function to acquire into any matter that may relate to systemic unlawful discrimination under any of the federal anti-discrimination laws, either on its own initiative or at the request of the minister. This amendment alone would not fully implement Recommendation 19, given that it is confined to unlawful acts under the Sex Discrimination Act, rather than systemic unlawful discrimination under all federal anti-discrimination acts. This proposal must be considered together with proposal to change the core functions of the AHRC with a positive duty accompanied by compliance and enforcement powers. And given the lateness of the hour, I um, will leave my remarks there. So the question is that the <coughs> motion on sheet 1433, 1 to 3, by leave, is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seaworth. Could you record our support for our own amendment, please? Yes, certainly. And Senator Urquhart, the uh, same? Could you, support, uh, could you uh, record that Labor supported that amendment as well? Sure. Thank you. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I now move Amendment One on Sheet One Four Three Four. Um, now, while we welcome the new offence of sex-based harassment, the bill sets the threshold for establishing sex-based harassment as unwelcome <coughs> conduct that is seriously demeaning. It's a very high threshold. Many submitters, including the Commission themselves. Uh, said that that was an inappropriately high bar that would prevent women from coming forward. Um, the explanatory memoranda provides that the threshold avoids capturing mild forms of inappropriate conduct that are not sufficiently serious in nature. The Northern Territory government's concerns throughout the inquiry process uh, shared their concern that victims might be deterred from making complaints, um, and those concerns were shared by many others. Uh, and I quote, there's been some discussion in the NT about the burden of proof and the onus on an employee to prove that an act is sufficiently serious to warrant action under the proposed legislation. There is some concern that this may cause additional distress to employees who are already required to establish the facts of the harassment or discrimination, end quote. The test for sex-based harassment would still require conduct to be unwelcome, uh, demeaning, and something that a reasonable person would have anticipated would cause offence or humiliation. In determining whether conduct amounts to sex-based harassment, the Commission is required to have regard to the seriousness of the conduct, amongst other things, already. Those provisions already imply a degree, uh, already imply a degree of seriousness uh, is needed to establish the offence. So explicitly requiring something to be seriously demeaning will put people off making complaints if they think their stories won't be considered sufficiently serious. It sends a message that so-called minor sex-based harassment should be tolerated. There is no justification for subjecting victims of sex-based harassment to this higher bar uh, than for other victims, survivors of other offences. Um, once again, the government is trying to change the goalposts. They are trying to appear like they're doing something, uh, namely establishing a new offence of sex-based harassment, but they're making it so damn hard for anyone to actually be able to make out that offence that it's, it's an offence in writing only. Uh, it, it's, it's a pyrrhic victory to have this on our law books when the threshold for meeting it has been designed to be so high uh, that most people won't bother trying to make that claim. Uh, a fact I'm sure the government knows full well, and I'm sure that they've drafted it deliberately. Well, this amendment seeks to delete the word seriously so that the test would simply be one of demeaning rather than seriously demeaning, uh, because as I've just said, it already has those inbuilt other features that need to be met. There is no need to have that additional bar of serious 
when it is already imputed by the other limbs uh, in that uh, in those sections and the surrounds. So um, I commend this amendment uh, on sheet 1434 to the chamber. Senator McAllister. Deputy President, uh, Labor supports this amendment. Um, significant concern has been raised by the requirement that conduct be seriously demeaning. The words seriously in this context create too high a threshold. Surely it is sufficient for this form of harassment to be made out that a person engaged in unwelcome conduct that was demeaning. Is it not enough to merely demean someone? Must you seriously demean them before you're in contravention of this provision? Our concern is that requiring a threshold this high will deter some people from making complaints. They will feel that the very first hurdle will be an assessment of their character based on an assessment of whether or not the unwelcome conduct which they felt demeaned them on the ground of sex was sufficiently serious. This is the entire cultural problem that we are trying to grapple with. And of course, in the Senate inquiry, the Human Rights Commission made a submission expressing their concerns about the way the government has approached the drafting of this provision. They said that they were concerned that the threshold of seriously demeaning set the bar too high. I repeat my observations from earlier. This government should listen to experts rather than arrogantly presuming, arrogantly presuming that it knows better. And in this case, they should listen to the views of the Commission to determine what constitutes sex-based harassment rather than being guided by their own internal culture with respect to the kind of conduct that they consider acceptable. Minister. Thank you. Uh, Chair, um, seriously demeaning is one of the requirements for conduct to meet the new statutory definition of sex-based harassment that would be introduced by the bill to the Sex Discrimination Act. Uh, the term seriously demeaning was chosen following stakeholder consultation, uh, but also to reflect the case law on sex-based harassment, and it is to be interpreted using its ordinary meaning. So the question is that um, Amendment 1 on sheet 1434, as moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Thank you. Senator Waters, uh, Senator see what you're seeking to have your vote recorded? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Could I just check with Senator Waters? I thought this was the one that she wanted to divide on. I okay, beg your sure. pardon if I've mixed up the numbers. Yes, I'll, I'll make the it, call again. Um, so, so the noes have it. The ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat>
Stop the bells. So the question is that Amendment 1 on sheet 1434, as moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I, uh, on behalf of Senator Janet Rice, I now move sheets, uh, amendments 1 to 5 on sheet 1373 uh, uh, by leave together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you. Um, I'll just give a very brief explanation of these uh, amendments. The Greens support the elimination of discrimination in all forms, and we recommend that the opportunity be taken to clarify the scope of protections for gender diverse people uh, in the workplace. So this amendment would ensure that discrimination against gender diverse workers and workers with intersex variations of sex characteristics is clearly prohibited. This is consistent with protections that already exist under the Sex Discrimination Act, but it uses a preferred term, uses the term sex characteristics rather than intersex status. Uh, so with that said, uh, we think this is a very meritorious amendment and we urge the Chamber to take the opportunity to extend protections to gender diverse people uh, in the workplace. Senator McAllister. Deputy President. Labor supports simplifying federal laws by aligning the adverse action and unlawful termination provisions of the Fair Work Act with the provisions of the Sex Discrimination Act. This is also a question of fairness. Labor believes that all Australian workers should receive the same protections under the Fair Work Act, including trans, gender diverse and intersex employees. We understand that this is the intent of the Greens amendment 
and we support this intent. This is why we will support the alternative amendment, which I understand will be moved subsequent to this one, uh, which brings the relevant Fair Work Act provisions into alignment with the Sex Discrimination Act. However, rather than aligning the adverse action and unlawful termination provisions of the Fair Work Act with the Sex Discrimination Act, this amendment now would introduce a new definition of sex characteristics into the Fair Work Act, and this would create an inconsistency, a new inconsistency between the two acts. Just Equal and a number of other organisations have argued that the definition of intersex status in the Sex Discrimination Act is out of date. They have recommended that the Fair Work Act adopt a new definition of sex characteristics, like the definition that was recently adopted by the ACT government in its Discrimination Act, rather than using the old definition of intersex status. In this amendment, the Greens propose to adopt that definition for the Fair Work Act, uh, but they're not proposing to replace the current definition of intersex status in the Sex Discrimination Act. The subject matter of the amendment is really important, but it is different to the subject matter of the bill, which is already complex and far-ranging. And In relation to this particular bill, Labor's focus has been on implementing the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. Consequently, we have not had the opportunity to consult widely on other issues relating to the Fair Work Act and Sex Discrimination Act, including the new definition that is proposed in this amendment. We know from our long experience that uh, it is unwise to amend anti-discrimination laws, in particular key definitions, without a thorough and focused consultation process, and Labor will not support this amendment. Minister. Uh, the government will also be opposing uh, the amendment moved by the Australian Greens. Uh, the government believes that people are entitled to respect, dignity and the opportunity to participate in society and receive the protection of the law regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity or intersex status. The Sex Discrimination Act prohibits discrimination on these grounds in a range of areas of public life. The primary purpose of this bill is to implement the government's commitments in its response to the respect at work uh, and to implement as a matter of urgency measures to strengthen national laws to better prevent and respond to sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. Discrimination on the basis of gender identity and intersex status is already prohibited in the Sex Discrimination Act. This amendment uses different terminology that does not align with the definitions in the Sex Discrimination Act. The amendments also do not address the constitutional head of power for the provisions, uh, which may require amendments to other parts of the Fair Work Act. Uh, and on that basis, the government will be opposing the amendment. Okay. So the question is that the amendments one to five on sheet 1373, moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The, I think the noes have it. Senator Seward. Please, uh, hands up, please note that the Greens uh, support our amendment. So noted. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Waters, I think. Yes, minutes. I have one final amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Acting uh, Deputy President. And I move uh, amendments one to four on sheet 1427 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, also moving this on behalf of the excellent Senator Janet Rice, who um, would be able to speak much more eloquently on these matters than I. Uh, but given the lateness of the hour, I'll just explain that this is an amendment very similar to the one that I sought to just move, uh, which went down in flames. Uh, but it would use the term that's currently used in the Sex Discrimination Act, um, because we'll uh, see if we can get some more support for this one, although we know that the community does actually prefer using the term sex characteristics rather than intersex status. Uh, so with those brief explanatory remarks, I commend Amendment 1427 to the Chamber. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you so much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, as I indicated in earlier in relation to the last amendment, we will support this one. Uh, it has the effect of aligning the Fair Work Act with the Sex Discrimination Act and provides an important protection for workers. Uh, 
we support simplifying federal laws by aligning the adverse action and unlawful termination provisions of the Fair Work Act with the protections in the Sex Discrimination Act. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. And, uh, the government will be opposing the amendment, uh, and it is for the same reasons as I've outlined in relation to the previous amendment moved uh, by the Australian Greens. Thank you. I'm sorry, Senator Patrick, I didn't see your hand up there, but Senator Patrick would also like to make a contribution. Thank you very much. And really, this is just to cover off on uh, all of the amendments uh, that have been moved by the Greens and Labor thus far. Um, uh, I have been paired in support of them, uh, but it's just not obvious to everyone uh, who might be watching or reflects back on it with the hands with the hand side or the journals later. So I want to make it very clear that. I, that uh, all, this, all the uh, amendments moved in committee uh, are, are by the Greens and by Labor have supported, and have done so on the basis that they seek to basically fill in all of the holes that have been dug by the coalition uh, around uh, the Respect at Work uh, report that, uh, uh, that has been produced. What's happened is, of course, uh, the government has uh, moved some way to dealing with uh, the recommendations, but I don't believe that they have uh, uh, fulfilled the necessary standard in relation to uh, the work that has been done on this. And uh, uh, so, so um, again, just indicating my uh, my support for the all of this, the second, all of the uh, committee of the whole amendments that have been. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Patrick, Minister. Um, just, just in terms of the bill and just listening to uh, Senator Patrick's contribution uh, and the contribution of other senators around the chamber, uh, I do want to make it very clear uh, that this bill that I do hope will pass tonight, and certainly that does appear to be uh, the will of the chamber, uh, will strengthen and streamline the national legal frameworks that deal with sexual harassment. Uh, and this is part of the government's strategy uh, for preventing and addressing sexual harassment, as outlined in the Roadmap for Respect, preventing and addressing sexual harassment in, the Australian, um, in Australian workplaces. And certainly in terms of, and again, I have listened uh, carefully tonight, uh, to the amendments that we are making. Uh, they are substantial amendments and they will make a difference uh, in workplaces, and in particular, uh, clarifying that sex, the Sex Discrimination Act covers judges, members of parliament and ministerial Order. staff, and ensuring that state and territory public servants themselves are covered by the Sex Discrimination Act uh, by removing the existing exemption uh, that is in place. This is actually, uh, Madam Chair, a very important uh, change that we are making, and certainly based on uh, the stakeholder feedback, is one uh, that is wholeheartedly uh, supported. And in fact, I was pleased that when the government did announce uh, that it would be making this change. Um, the feedback, uh, in particular from uh, the legal fraternity, uh, was very, very supportive uh, of what the government was doing. In terms of also, though, expanding the coverage of the protection from workplace sexual harassment under the Sex Discrimination Act, and we're doing that by picking up the broader concepts of worker and persons conducting a business or undertaking. Uh, and that definition comes from the Work Health and Safety Act. And what we're doing with this amendment uh, is ensuring that all paid and unpaid workers, and this will now include, and this is very important, volunteers and interns uh, are protected from sexual harassment under the Act. And again, this is about expanding the coverage uh, of the protection from workplace sexual harassment under the Sex Discrimination Act. Um, what we're also doing uh, is introducing an express provision to clarify that sex-based harassment is prohibited 
under the Sex Discrimination Act. There did appear to be some confusion um, in relation to that, uh, and this will certainly go a long way, and in particular uh, ensuring that employers well and truly understand uh, that sex-based harassment is prohibited uh, under the Sex Discrimination Act. Uh, we're also in the bill uh, that is before the Senate tonight. Uh, we're expanding the coverage of the ancillary liability provisions uh, in the Sex Discrimination Act to include sexual harassment and the new sex-based harassment provision. And another important amendment, which we probably haven't reflected on um, during the committee stage, uh, is amending the Australian Human Rights Commission Act to extend the time period uh, for making a complaint under the Sex Discrimination Act, uh, meaning that a complaint cannot be terminated on the grounds of time unless it has been 24 months since the alleged incident rather than six months. Uh, and certainly this was based on feedback uh, that this would be a more appropriate time frame uh, to allow those people uh, who are or who have been subjected uh, to sexual harassment uh, in the workplace uh, to bring uh, their claim. We're also clarifying, because there was confusion uh, in relation to this, that victimising conduct can form the basis of a civil action for unlawful discrimination uh, under the Sex Discrimination Act, in addition to a criminal complaint. And in relation to the Fair Work Commission, uh, we are clarifying that the Fair Work Commission can, under the existing anti-bullying jurisdiction, uh, make orders to stop sexual harassment. Uh, this is a very important uh, clarification, but also ensuring, or should I say, we're clarifying uh, that sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to a valid reason for dismissal under the unfair dismissal provisions uh, of the Fair Work Act. And again, there was, uh, and it was sometimes disappointing to receive this feedback, uh, there was confusion uh, in relation to whether or not sexual harassment can be conduct amounting to a valid reason for dismissal uh, under the unfair dismissal provisions of the Fair Work Act. Uh, and uh, we are ensuring that we take steps uh, to clarify that. And the final, the final change that I would like to comment on, because it is something that I think was embraced uh, by the Chamber, uh, and also is something um, that I know there's been a lot of support for, uh, and in particular Julian Simmons, I'd like to acknowledge him. Uh, and certainly the work that he has done with Pink Elephants, and I think everybody here knows Pink Elephants, uh, in relation to miscarriage. Um, while not recommended in the Respect at Work report, uh, the bill will also enable um, an employee to take up to two days of compassionate leave if the employee or the employee's current spouse or de facto partner has a miscarriage. And so uh, these are the changes um, that should the bill be supported, and it does appear to be the will of the chamber, uh, will go through tonight. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the amendments listed. Sorry, Senator Hanson Young. Um, I'd just like to rise at this point of the debate. We've been debating this bill for uh, an, over a day now, and of course, it is important that we put in place laws to protect uh, women uh, from harassment from sexualised bullying, from being berated and belittled in their workplace. And I just find it extraordinary that in the course of the debate here today, we had some comments made by Senator Pauline Hanson that really only made the situation worse for a young woman who wasn't treated properly and looked after properly in this place. And that, of course, was Brittany Higgins. A woman who, if she hadn't stood up and called out her treatment, what had happened to her, been prepared to expose herself with such vulnerability, we wouldn't even be debating this bill here today. 
It wasn't okay for a member in this place to come in here and victim blame. It wasn't okay, and it needs to be called out. Now, there are people in this chamber who have worked with Ms Higgins. There are others who know her well. She deserved better than to be used as part of political attack in the debate today. In fact, we actually all owe a great, a great lot of gratitude and thanks to Ms Higgins for being brave enough and courageous enough to tell her story. And the reason her story was so powerful and didn't just shake this building, it created waves right across the country because her experience resonated with so many other women in workplaces right around this country, in social clubs right around this country, in friendship groups, in universities and, sadly, Madam Acting Deputy President, even in schools. Now, those protests that happened on the lawns of Parliament House and elsewhere around the country that organically were created because women in this country have had enough of being told to be silent, of sucking it up, of not declaring what has happened to them by fear of shame, of embarrassment, of not being believed, they're the women that we should be listening to. And I know that there are many women in this place who understand that, understand that from a very personal perspective, understand it because it resonates with all of us. It's either been our experience or it's been an experience of one of our loved ones, our sister, our friend, our mother. We all know somebody who has been assaulted, harassed, abused and was made to feel like they had to stay silent by fear of retribution or shame. And one of the most powerful contributions to this such desperately needed change in public policy in how we deal with harassment at work, the laws that protect women, was when Brittany Higgins and other women like Grace Tame decided to step out and speak truth about their experiences Throwing off the cloak of shame means that more and more women knew that it wasn't okay. What happened to them wasn't okay. That if they came forward, they would be believed. And I just find it extraordinary that in a debate such as this, that has been brought forward because of this entire incident, that there were members of this chamber who were prepared to belittle that experience and that bravery. And it's not acceptable. This bill does not go far enough at all. We've spent hours debating amendments because it is not good enough, because the Prime Minister didn't hold true to his promise. But it is a recognition that the power of coming forward and breaking one's silence can make a difference. And for that, we should all be thankful to Brittany Higgins. Thank you. So the question is that amendments one to four on sheet 1427 be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. 
the noes have it. Thank you. So the question now is, sorry, Senator, Senator Seward. Sorry, can we just, could you, could Hansard record please the grant support for our amendment? So noted. Senator Eckhart. Could Hansard note the Labor Party's support for that last amendment? So noted. So the question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Against no. The ayes have it. So the committee has considered the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Be now adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 and for other purposes. Government Business Orders of the Day No. 2, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 2 Bill, debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator McAllister. Minister. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where I was up to on my, on my summing up speech, so I will just quickly run down um, again the details of this bill. Obviously, Schedule 1 of the bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act to require non-government entities seeking endorsement as a DGR to be a charity registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission or be operated by a registered charity. Ancillary funds and specifically listed entities will be exempt from this requirement. Um, the requirement to be a charity already applies to the majority of, GD, of DGR categories in the subdivision 30B um, and the measure will amend special condi conditions applying to the remaining general DGR categories requiring non-government entities to maintain charity registration in order to retain their eligibility, eligibility for DGR endorsement. Schedule 2 of this bill contains amendments to the Income Tax Assessment Act that remove the preferential tax treatment provided by offshore banking units, OBUs, they are commonly known as, and provide transitional arrangements for existing OBUs. In October 2018, the OECD's Forum on Harmful Tax Practices found that Australia's OBU regime contains harmful features and, as a result, the Treasurer announced in 2018, in October, that the government would seek to address the OECD's concerns. The OBU regime has been closed to new entrants since, that treasurer's, since the Treasurer's announcement. So passing this law will allow the OECD to confirm that Australia has amended the OBU regi regime to ensure that it's not a harmful tax practice. And this is, inconsist is inconsistent with the Morrison government's ongoing support for international tax integrity and will protect Australia from potential reputational damage and other possible consequences. The bill provides for two years transitional arrangements to assist existing OBUs to transition away from the regime. And I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. I understand that there is a second reading amendment moved by Senator McAllister. So the question is that that amendment on sheet 1388 be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. Division required. No division required. Okay, so the noes, the noes have it. Okay. Did, would you like to be recorded on handset as having? <laughs> Thank you, sir. And and Senator Seward. Us too. <laughs> Sorry. So noted that you have voted in favour. Thank you. Okay. So I understand. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. I'm just looking at some of the text. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. The question is oh sorry, Minister. Sorry. I think you've just got to ask if Yep. Sorry, I wasn't aware we had amendments. So, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered.
Minister. Uh, thank you. And uh, I move. I seek leave to move amendments one and two on sheet one four four two on behalf of Pauline Hanson's One Nation movement by leave. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. So, Chair, I seek to speak so on behalf granted. of Senator Hanson. Okay, so I've got Senator Roberts wanting to speak and Senator Patrick. So we'll start with Senator Roberts. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam, uh, th thank you, Chair. The key point here is accountability. I know now of organisations that had a disastrous first two months of JobKeeper and then very quickly recovered. They tried to stop JobKeeper payments and couldn't. We also know that some businesses game the system. So what it shows is that we need a proper audit. I'll give you some background. In March 2020 and April 2020, it was a time of great uncertainty. Deaths overseas were reportedly very, very high in the tens of thousands. A lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, and that meant erring on the side of safety. So we all, all the parties in the, in the Senate, supported the government's approach on job seeker and job keeper. We basically gave them a blank check, waved it through, because it was a time of perceived threat. I warned at the time of a need to get data, develop a proper plan, and, and that we would hold the government accountable. I noted Taiwan's stellar performance and, and ivermectin. Now, the government got it wrong with JobKeeper. OK, but we all saw that. And that's not a criticism of the government, because um, it's so long as the government doesn't make too many mistakes, in hindsight, it's very, very easy uh, to see that job keeper and job seeker can be open to criticism. And I'm proud to say that I erred on the side of caution and safety in a time of great uncertainty. Senator Hanson and I are not afraid of, of admitting errors. But it was, a, it was an error that was based on making sure that we erred on the side of safety. So we can, we can not hold that against anyone. Senator Hanson later questioned continuing job keeper. I did the same. Parliament did not stop it. Labor wanted to extend it and widen it. The parliament failed to hold the government accountable. Federal government continued to support capricious and unjustified lockdowns and still do. The parliament condones the lack of a proper comprehensive plan, yet has blasted billions out uh, into, into the community. So that's the broad perspective. We were faced with a lot of uncertainty. The government made some initiatives. We supported them. And some parties wanted to continue them and wanted to continue them through till now. So let's have a look at some specifics. Labor apparently is claiming $25 billion has been paid to companies that did not suffer a decline in revenue out of the $90 billion paid out in JobKeeper. The treasurer says he doesn't know because he does not have companies profit and loss statements. And some of them had an increase in revenue. And some have paid huge bonuses to executives. So we have a problem. Naming and shaming by itself does nothing, though. The people need action to get the money back from those who've rorted the system. We need a better system. We need more accountability to the public. We need a plan and a system in place for the future. I want to comment on tax law. Because tax law has always had secrecy provisions unless there's a higher purpose, for example, criminal prosecution. There are many practical occasions when the Australian Taxation Office releases data. This JobKeeper administration, though, is not part of the income tax system. The Australian tax of Taxation Office systems were used not for tax, but for shoveling taxpayer money to companies. That does not affect tax office secrecy provisions. Now, our tax system is based on voluntary compliance, including companies. That's company tax. Prior to 1986, every individual's tax return was checked by the ATO. That hasn't happened since 1986. It's done on a sampling basis. We need to remember also that 75% of tax raised is from individuals. So it's the individual's confidence in the taxation system and confidence in government spending that needs to be maintained. Now, the parliament makes the laws. There is only one position in the Australian tax office that is of significance. That's the taxation commissioner. Why should the commissioner approach the Senate president? Why did he write to the president when he reports to the parliament? 
The Parliament hires him and fires him. The Commissioner on this occasion has overstepped the mark. Now, ASIC will publish the figures for publicly listed companies, the jobs, JobKeeper figures for publicly listed companies. And for them, the context, including the number of employees and revenues, is available. That's not the case for publish, when it's if published for private companies because there's a need for context. There can be unintended consequences if people simply know the job keeper payments without the comprehensive context. We need to prevent various third parties targeting the businesses and taking job keeper out of context. Now the government will support this in the House of Representatives, whereas Senator Patrick's original amendment, which we uh, which we uh, acknowledge and appreciate, would have been defeated. And I'm sure that Senator Patrick is doing this to do good, not just look good. So we thank, thank Senator Patrick for his idea that we have built on and enhanced. Those in the Senate who believe in transparency with safeguards will support this amendment. I want to make two final points, and that is it highlights yet again that central government quite often gets it wrong. We highlight Parliament's lack of accountability, and instead Parliament has been posturing over this COVID situation. And we must restore Parliaments to serve the people. So that's why we're moving this amendment on behalf of Senator Hanson. And I would welcome people's support. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. The government will be supporting Pauline Han Hanson, One Nation Amendment uh, number. I've forgotten the number in front of me. One four double two. Okay, Senator Patrick, did you want the call, Senator Patrick? Thank you very much, um, um, Madam Chair. Um, there will be companies, big private companies, clicking their champagne glasses tonight, toasting to Pauline Hanson. This is a strategic victory for companies that have received taxpayers' money and funneled it straight through to uh, their dividends and executive bonuses. Uh, Senator Roberts suggests that this is an improvement upon uh, my uh, amendment, but it is not. Look, I'll, I'll end up supporting it on the basis that it does help to consolidate some information, but in actual fact, what his amendment seeks to do is uh, cause companies who are listed to disclose their uh, their details or, or for ASIC to disclose their details in circumstances where they most of them have to disclose it anyway. It's a dud. It actually doesn't do very much. We know that uh, there are a whole range of different companies that, uh, that received JobKeeper and did much better than what they had originally thought. And we know that because they are uh, uh, businesses that are listed and have a requirement to uh, disclose uh, details to their shareholders. So this, this bill, I mean, most of the ASX companies such as Harvey Norman have already disclosed. Pauline Hanson, Senator Hanson is pushing an amendment to disclose information which is already published. Now, what we need to understand about this, this amendment is that it what, is what it doesn't do. What my amendment does do, but theirs doesn't. It does not include hundreds of foreign controlled companies operating in this, in this country that may have put, put up their hand for JobKeeper because they're not listed on the Australian stock market. So everyone should absolutely know what's happening here. Uh, Senator Hanson, uh, One Nation are permitting foreign controlled companies to get away with taking Australian taxpayers' money uh, that was given to, to them uh, by way of JobKeeper. That's what's happening. Uh, companies uh, such as the Bank of China, companies such as Gem uh, Gemini, companies such as Wilson, they're all companies that are uh, uh, Chinese-owned that are not listed on the, on the stock market, yet may well have received JobKeeper. I'll go to some other ones. The big four uh, consultants with their you know, very secretive partnerships, they're not required under this amendment to disclose 
how much JobKeeper they may or may not have received. Thank you very much, Pauline Hanson. Thank you very much, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Senator Roberts. Those companies get to take the JobKeeper and keep it, even if they did not um, uh, uh, fare poorly as a result of the pandemic. It doesn't include clubs. It doesn't include private schools. It doesn't include political parties, political parties that are, could have stuck their hand up for uh, JobKeeper and may not have had a change in revenue at all, but are basking in taxpayers' money and will continue to do so because Senator Hanson has moved an amendment, One Nation has moved uh, an amendment uh, which, which will get government support, and I presume uh, as a result of that they're not going to support my um, far more encompassing amendment. So those political parties may well uh, enjoy that, that taxpayer-funded benefit, money that could have been uh, used for, uh, for other things. What about the very large private companies? We've all been talking about these large companies that don't even have to file of financial reports because they're grandfathered. So not only do they don't have to uh, file financial reports, but One Nation is giving them a free kick. Again, they'll be sitting in their private jets thanking One Nation uh, for permitting them to get away with a huge uh, strategic victory. And meanwhile, Treasurer Frydenberg will be getting a pat on the back from them because he's managed to successfully talk down One Nation from support of my amendment. Now, I'll tell you, One Nation has supported my amendment. They've supported the order for production, but they've been somehow talked down, talked down by big business somehow. What about um, uh, companies such as uh, Salesforce, Dow, GE, IBM, KKR, McDonald's, all uh, US companies, McKinsey's. What about the tax haven entities that are not listed on our stock market? So likely not paying much in the way of tax, but potentially collect collecting JobKeeper information. So uh, you know, companies uh, like uh, Wilson Group, uh, Brookfield, Energy Australia, which is domiciled in the Jersey Islands uh, off the UK. What about those, Senator Roberts? What about those companies? You're just happy for them to get uh, a whole bunch of bucket load, uh, trailer loads, truck loads of Australian uh, taxpayers' money by way of JobKeeper, and they may not uh, have uh, uh, suffered the downturn, as you accepted in your speech. You just truck this money off overseas to a tax haven. We will never, ever get to know anything about them. And you have just ex exacerbated the problem by doing this. This is, a, uh, this is nothing uh, but a dud. That's all I can describe it. I mean, it's been circulated in the last 15 minutes. Okay, it's not well thought through. Um, how about, a, how about, how about uh, some of the banks, some of the banks that operate here that are not listed on our stock market? that may well have employees here, may well have put up their hand for, for JobKeeper. And I'll be asking the Minister uh, to uh, assure us that no foreign controlled entities receive JobKeeper. And I'm absolutely sure that uh, the, 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 the Minister, the representing Minister, won't be able to tell me that. Won't be able to say that, no, no, it's OK, Senator Patrick, all of those companies uh, are all good. Uh, they didn't receive JobKeeper. This is you know, this is a, uh, an honesty system that was put in place. The parliament said we needed to help Australian companies. We, and, and no one begrudges uh, that, that uh, sentiment. We passed laws back in April, on April the 8th last, last year. I remember it well because I just got out of isolation from COVID, flew to Canberra dealing with JobKeeper, passed the laws that had no detail. We had... Uh, uh, basically flyers passing around the chamber talking about what JobKeeper uh, would do. But in actual fact, all the legislation was that we passed was, a, was ahead of 
uh, of power and we left all of the rules to the treasurer. He created an honesty system. He created an honesty system that said, uh, if you have, if you predict that you're going to, to to have a loss in turnover, uh, then you can put your hand up and get JobKeeper. But he made a massive prudential failure, a massive prudential failure that will now cost us billions. Okay, it has cost us billions. In fact, it hasn't cost us billions. It's cost our children billions because it came from debt, and it's cost our grandchildren's. Uh, because it has come from not not from uh, the bank accounts of governments, but from the debt side of the ledger. Okay, that's that's what's happened here. No safeguards, and for uh, people to put up their hand and say, "No, I want to protect the privacy of these companies." Well, sorry, this is not their private money. If they go to a bank and get some money uh, from the bank, that's a matter for the company and for the bank. If they go to the public and get some money, that is a matter for the public. We disclose in this country uh, grants that go to companies, including the total amount. We disclose contracts, government contracts that go to companies, the total amounts on Austender. This is no different. This is money that went from the taxpayer to a company. It is not private information. And I do not understand for one moment why it is that one nation has, uh, has decided to limit the disclosure to companies that have to disclose anyway. That's the stupidity of it. It makes no sense. I urge one nation to reconsider not supporting my amendment because my amendment does do the job that captures all the people that I've just labelled. But I will have some more to say on this shortly. Your time's expired. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, it, this is all actually kind of funny, isn't it? At, at least to the extent that it exposes in the most ridiculous way the entirely frivolous approach that one Nation has to actual decision-making in this chamber. Uh, let's reflect on how we got here. Um, of course, some weeks ago, Senator Patrick moved a very similar amendment to the one that he has circulated for debate this evening uh, in this chamber. And Labor is very supportive of that amendment because it requires, it requires of course, uh, companies that receive JobKeeper to be disclosed and the amount that they, uh, that they received. I won't go into the policy merits of that. I might come back to that later. But of course we support that. And I acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr Lee, who of course has worked very, very hard to elevate this issue in the public debate and expose the significance of transparency. Okay, uh, One Nation supported it at that time. Then Labor sought to move a similar amendment to this legislation. And we got word back we got word back that although One Nation had supported this position previously, they weren't prepared to support it if it was moved in the name of the Labor Party because they felt that the Labor Party hadn't been sufficiently kind to them in recent time. What are you? Like five years old. This is not how public policy is made. <laughs> Generally, people who seek to participate in the Australian Parliament vote on the merits of the issue. It is rare, rare indeed, for a political party to actually concede that the reason they're not voting for an issue is not because there's any merit in the policy argument that's being brought forward, but actually because they have hurt feelings. How absolutely ridiculous, although slightly terrifying, slightly terrifying, I would imagine, for Australians who look to the Senate, look to the Senate to be the place where legislation is scrutinised and government is held to account. Because that's what this amendment is about, of course. It is about accountability. It is about government accountability and it is about accountability being placed on the businesses who received this money. Transparency and accountability, the bedrock on which this Senate has been built. Not important for One Nation, at least, at least not if it's going to be moved. Uh, by people in the chamber that have hurt your feelings on occasion from time to time. All right, so 
How shall we deal with this? Senator Patrick says, oh, well, I'll put it in my name. If that's what's required to get support, I'll circulate it in my name. He does so. Now we've got this backflip. One Nation, we don't know what their voting position is on Senator Patrick's amendment, but we can assume by their decision to, at the very last minute, circulate this amendment, a pale imitation of the policy position advanced in the amendment circulated by myself and Senator Patrick. We can assume from that decision that they've changed their position again. Now, the amendment that they've circulated is essentially meaningless, absolutely meaningless, because Australian listed companies have already been directed to report government payments. ASIC's already given them that direction, and that includes JobKeeper. And so the effect of the amendment that's before us now doesn't do any harm. Perhaps it might make tracking down the information a little more simple. But it's essentially simply to replicate an obligation that already exists. And as Senator Patrick pointed out in his contribution just now, it leaves untouched large numbers of organisations, companies that are not Australian listed companies, no obligations for them under the amendment that's been proposed here. And it comes as the Australian public are increasingly demanding that there be transparency around this program. Herald reported just recently that 65 per cent of Australians not only want to know who got the money, but think that there ought to be some obligation to pay it back if you received it on terms that were not consistent with the original intention of the program. None of the amendments before us tonight go to that place. But they do ask for transparency, and it is not unreasonable that we do so. In New Zealand, they have established an online register listing all of the recipients of their wage subsidy scheme. In New Zealand, about 5 per cent of businesses have repaid some of their receipts because the truth is it was not really reputationally sustainable for them to hold on to them. Businesses do have ethical obligations. They are part of a political community. They certainly seek to be part of it. And all that we are asking is that the government be transparent about which businesses have been in receipt of funds. It is quite astonishing that the government is so afraid of this scheme that they have twisted and turned and turned themselves upside down. I will be intrigued to find out what it is that they've offered to Senator Hanson in exchange for the ludicrous amendment that's before us tonight, but that will have to wait to Thank another you, day. Senator McAllister. It being 7.20 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. The committee reports to the Senate. And I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> the sacrifice of Australian forces in Afghanistan shows our nation at its best. Almost 40,000 Australian troops served in Afghanistan to defeat terrorists and support our allies. 41 Australians lost their lives, and another 260 were wounded in battle. Hundreds more remain with the mental scars for life. Consistent with our proud history, our Australian diggers served with unparalleled courage and their performance was respected by other for armed forces around the globe. With the help of our allies, our Australian troops achieved their mission's primary aim of bringing justice to Osama bin Laden and his al-Qaeda operatives, who were responsible for one of the greatest acts of humanity in history. As we approach the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks, we should remember the loss of thousands of innocent lives on that day. The secondary objective of our mission was to support our allies, especially the USA. Follow, uh, following September 11, Prime Minister John Howard invoked the ANZUS Treaty for the first time. This was an attack on America's homeland, and we had an obligation to help them. 
But our commitment was not just born from a contractual requirement. We share a common bond with the US as countries formed under God to defend freedom, equality and peace between nations. We have fought alongside America in every war since World War I, and we have been proud to fight with them again in Afghanistan. Fighting with America is in our nation's interest because we have an interest in defeating any ideology that seeks to undermine our freedom and our liberty. Over the past 100 years, we have helped defeat fascism, communism and now Islamic terror. As good friends, though, we must be willing to tell home truths when needed as well. The war in Afghanistan was launched for a just moral cause, but as the years rolled on, the mission became aimless and it wasn't always clear how success could be achieved. To the extent there was an objective, it appeared to be the establishment of a free and democratic country in Afghanistan. As former President George W. Bush said in his second inaugural address, address in 2005, the survival of liberty in our land increasingly depends on the success of liberty in other lands. The best hope for peace in our world is the expansion of freedom in all the world. In hindsight, this was the folly of vaulting ambition. Our reach exceeded our grasp. We must vigilantly, vigilantly protect the freedom and rights we enjoy, but we cannot impose our system on other countries at the point of a gun. Some now say the West should have stayed, left troops in Afghanistan, just as we have in Korea, Japan and Germany since World War II, but those troops were not facing IEDs 20 years after the war ended, and by 1965 there were no ongoing hostile civil wars in those nations. We need to concentrate on building our own nation first before we build the nations of others. I support the member for Herbert's call for a parliamentary inquiry into the war in Afghanistan. We owe it to the sacrifices that he made and other Australians made to conduct a warts and all review of what went right, what went wrong and what we should never do again. Such an inquiry should also examine the chaotic withdrawal of citizens and visa holders over the last few weeks. I'm increasingly concerned about the misplaced priorities of our military leaders. Just three months ago, 30 current and former defence personnel formed an Australian Leaders Climate Group. At the time, the former defence Chief of Defence, Admiral Chris Barry, claimed that climate change was one of the two existential threats that keep him awake at night. There was no mention of the exit from Afghanistan or the South China Sea or China's bellicose statements over Taiwan. Our increasingly woke armies have been embarrassed by the Taliban in the last few weeks, and it is time for a rethink. And what better time than today, which marks the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty? The ANZUS Treaty was signed in 1951. We were at war on 1 September 1951 against Communist Korea, and China, less than a year before, had just sent 200,000 Red Army troops across the Yalu River to fight us. At the time, Robert Menzies wrote in Foreign Affairs that, and I quote, the real and deadly and present question is whether inside the next two years we shall become strong enough to resist and therefore deter a vast communist aggression against one manifestation of which we are now actually fighting in Korea. The ANZUS Treaty was a pact of free nations against the tyranny of, and destruction of communism. Seventy years later, once again, our biggest security threat is communism from a resurgent and bellicose communist China. A day after Kabul fell, the Chinese ta tabloid Daily, the Global Times, wrote that from what happened in Afghanistan, Taiwan should perceive that once a war breaks out, in the Straits, the island's defences will collapse in hours and the US military won't come to help. But now we see our Lord's leaders talk of the threat of climate change rather than the threat of communist China. We risk making the same mistake as we did in Afghanistan for reaching what we cannot grasp. We cannot alone change the climate, but we can defend our countries, our freedoms, and that is what we should return to do now that we have left Central Asia. Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise to speak regarding two reports which have been released this year the Productivity Commission's Productivity Insights Report and the Intergenerational Report. Together they have painted a picture of Australia's recent past, current situation and future trajectory. The reports are concerning because under this Morrison Liberal government, our standards of living are lower. And this trend is likely to continue if there is no intervening action. In a world that seems uncertain, our communities want a government that can deliver what they set out to achieve. So how does this aspirational essence ring true in contemporary Australia? Well, it must start with the vaccine rollout and ends with secure, well-paid, full-time jobs. Now let's talk about full-time and secure work. 
or, as I would refer to, boosting the living standards of Australians. The Productivity Commission released figures which determined that we are currently living in the worst decade for living standards in 60 years. This is truly shocking finding, but probably not surprising to many who are struggling to make ends meet and see a more certain future in a COVID world. The latest intergenerational report has predicted that this trend will likely continue. If we don't meet the aspirational average 1.5 per cent productivity growth over the next 40 years, Australians will see their income be $32,000 lower by 2060. I say that 1.5 per cent is aspirational because there is nothing that the Liberal government is doing right now to boost productivity. They will just uh, not join the rest of the world and commit to net zero by 2050. They are not sending any clear signals to the private sector for technology adaption. Uh, they are cutting funding to our universities, which are engines of innovations. They are continuing to cut from TAFE. To put it simply, they are not investing in the future of Australia. This will be the Liberal Party's legacy and their lasting impact on Australia. A Labor government will introduce a start-up year to potentially create 2,000 new businesses and provide a platform for future job growth and economic opportunity. Labor will offer income contingent loans to 2,000 final year students and or recent graduates to support their participation in accelerated learning programs. Startups have been shown to possess very good job creation and they show great potential, encouraging new firms to, um, which will be good for our economy, good for job growth and even better for wage growth. It is the duty of government to work with the private sector to inspire and stimulate national focus for in, um, and for championing the growth that is so desperately needed and direction and leadership for our business community, especially those created by young Australians. Working with higher education institutions, being entrepreneurial and working with investors will, be, will ensure that Australia is better placed, better placed to identify opportunities, better placed uh, for the investment for universities in further research. Building this cooperation should also make it easier for, for people to actually see that there are real business opportunities here in Australia. We need investment in our universities, not cuts to the universities, not making it more difficult for Australians to be able to attain a university degree, to price it out of the reach of most Australians. There is a need for government to assume a leadership role in encouraging entrepreneurial activity and the emergence of new firms that can use tech for social good or improve the productivity and efficiencies of other businesses. If government does not invest in policy with an intention to reform, then Australia's living standards will continue to flatline. Australians can't afford for this to happen. Australians deserve the hope for their future, to have better living standards so they can get up in the morning and go to work, save for their future and buy a home and be able to raise a family. The next generation deserves better living standards than their parents. This is the new Australian dream, but it may remain just that, a dream if we continue to elect Liberal governments, because Scott Morrison's legacy will be one that will see our living standards Order, Senator dive. Polly. Senator Griff. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I rise to speak tonight on productivity. Hardly an original issue to raise, but an important one all the same. Many here have spoken previously about the importance of productivity and the danger of our long-running productivity crisis. It is important because we have had poor productivity growth for too many years. It is the main reason why our economic and wage growth has been low for so long and why our standard of living is less than it could be. But previous contributions on this topic have been full of warnings and dangers. I would like to contribute something more optimistic. We may be about to turn the corner on productivity. 
and we must do all we can to take advantage of this opportunity. For many Australians, millions of Australians, working from home has been a silver lining in the pandemic. While few would want to do it exclusively, many have had our eyes opened to a very different way of working. It has shown workers they can, in fact, work remotely. It has shown them the cost of a long daily commute. It has shown managers that workers can, in the main, be trusted to deliver when they work from home. And it has shown managers a world of possibility in restructuring their businesses and offices to take advantage of that flexibility. It will likely be months until the data is published, but we will see significant productivity gains in the last year. This will be mainly concentrated in industries that could adapt to flexible work arrangements. That has certainly been the international experience in countries where lockdowns and work from home arrangements were less common than here. The effect here could be even stronger. We will likely see those gains in the November data release, but they should be sustained for several years as firms adjust and apply the lessons they have learned. There is an expectation productivity growth will taper out as that adjustment is completed. This is possible if the only lesson we learn is about remote work. But we can sustain that growth if we learn the deeper lesson, and that is the value of experimentation and innovation in our workplaces. This is the one area where Australia has always struggled. Management proficiency is an undervalued skill. Most in management jobs have no special training. In the main, new managers learn by copying other managers through mentoring or even random management books. <laughs> amateurs learning from amateurs is a terrible way of developing proficiency. People learn bad habits as well as good ones. They simply don't know the difference but they may never learn the difference if they just copy their peers. And if none of your peers are willing to experiment, you won't learn to experiment either. This kind of direction holds us back. I hope the pandemic shakes up this kind of thinking. I hope managers view the pandemic as an experiment in doing things differently, an experiment in determining a way to learn the value of innovation and change. I do hope they keep trying new approaches, new methods, new ways of doing business. I hope it becomes instinctive for managers everywhere, because the pandemic has shown how experimentation can unlock a huge amount of value. Value that means more productive businesses, more positive staff and more satisfying customers. We also need to nurture an instinct for innovation. It is already natural for Australians outside the workplace. We are a people who naturally want to have a go, to figure things out, to do things better. If we can bring that attitude into our workplaces, we could see real and sustained productivity growth. Not just for a year, or a few years, but a sustained increase that would raise our incomes, improve our well-being, and ensure better lives for ourselves and for our future generations. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. Within days, one of the most important weeks of the year will be upon us. Women's Health Week begins next Monday, the 6th of September, and runs through until Friday, the 9th. It will be five big days dedicated to the health and well-being of Australian women and girls. Good health is powerful, and it begins with each of us making health a priority. We are sending a strong message about the importance of women's health and well-being via a national campaign of events and online activities. Women's Health Week was first run in 2013 by Jean Hales for Women's Health. It is now a permanent fixture in the Australian calendar, held in the first week of September each year. 
Last year, despite being in the grip of a global pandemic, more than 90,000 women participated in 1,400 events and 45,000 women subscribed to the online program. Imagine what will happen with this year's online program now that we've got an even better understanding of technology. During Women's Health Week, boardrooms, <laughs> classrooms and living rooms will be transformed into spaces where women and girls can share information and stories about health checks, health conditions or any issue that impacts their well-being. More than 2,200 online and offline events are running across the country, including walks to watch the sunrise, online health checks, meditation tools, a women's adventure film and a five-day self-love challenge. Articles, interviews, recipes, quizzes, podcasts, tips and discussions will be shared on the five-day daily topics and you can see them at www.womenshealthweek.com.au during the full week. The week starts with Move It Monday, a day dedicated to moving the body. Join a live fitness class. Find out how much you need to move to be healthy and learn life hacks for working from home. Day two deals with <coughs> tricky periods, a women's health topic that needs more attention. This topic covers everything you need to know about the menstrual cycle, including busting some common myths about what is and isn't normal. Gynaecologist Dr Amanda Ward will talk to Young Australian of the Year, Isabel Marshall, about her mission to eliminate period poverty. Wednesday's topic is Private Lives, a day when the discussion centres on sex and relationships for women and girls. Sexuality educator Vanessa Hamilton will be discussing how to have better conversations around sex, consent and intimacy. Mental health has received a lot of attention during the COVID-19 pandemic, with Lip Timber sharing tips on Mind Matters, Mind Matters Day to help participants find a new normal for mental health in these times. Professor Jane Fisher will discuss grief, while psychologist Dr Sarah Cotton will talk about the stressful convergence of work and personal lives during lockdowns. New South Wales CWA Chief Executive Danica Lees puts the health needs of regional and remote women on the agenda. Naturopath Sandra Villella will share foods that can improve your mood, and the Gidget Foundation's Arabella Gibson will address the difficulties facing new mums in the pandemic world. Women's Health Week concludes with one big slumber party, sleep, and how important it is to women's health. That's the focus for Friday. Facts about the impact of sleep disorders and sleep deprivation in women will be shared. Jean Hales for Women's Health will also publish five days of free, evidence-based health information at, on their website. MS Australia is also presenting a mix of activities, presentations, resources and events during the week. Multiple sclerosis affects around three times as many women as men, and I was pleased to be able to share my family's experience as part of MS Australia's Women's Health Week video. MS Australia's digital hub for Women's Health Week can be found by searching their website. Although not solely focused on women's health, the Australian Government's two-day national summit on women's health also falls next week. Topics exploring financial security, policing and justice, sexual violence and challenges facing diverse members of the Australian community will be covered virtually on Monday and Tuesday and you can view the program at womensafetysummit.com.au. The Australian Government invested $535 million to support the health and wellbeing of women and girls in this year's budget. So I encourage women across Australia to visit the Women's Health Week and National Summit on Women's Safety websites, make that appointment for a health check, get active and connect with family and friends. A good health starts with you. Order. Thank Senator you. Senator Thank you, Mr President. In another episode of We Will Do Anything But Tackle Climate Change, a bunch of Liberal National MPs are jumping up and down, wanting more school chaplains, so they can knock the very real fear of a looming climate catastrophe out of the minds of young people. The problem isn't the kids' activism and recognition of climate emergencies, but it is your inaction on the climate crisis that is the real problem. School kids don't need religious chaplains. They need a government that embraces science and takes responsibility to protect their future. 
Here's an idea. If the coalition is so alarmed that young people are worried about climate change, maybe take their concerns seriously. Climate activism is not the source of anxiety for young people. The government's climate denialism is. And it's not just young people who are worried about the climate crisis. Australia's biggest climate poll was taken recently. The results are in and they are unequivocal. Voters in every single seat in this country, in regions and in cities, want more action on climate change. They want renewable energy, not a senseless gas-led recovery. The people of Australia are united in their ask. They are pleading for us to take stronger action to save the planet and humanity along with it. They are asking us to invest in renewable energy. They are telling us to keep coal in the hole and gas and oil in the soil. People know we are in deep shit. They know that if strong and urgent action is not taken, there will be mass extinctions of animals and plants, and the very sorry, survival Senator, of humans sorry, will Senator be Sorry, Senator Farika, I have a point of order. It's a point of order, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I thought that language was uh, very unparliamentary, and I, I didn't hear the word. If there was something that was unparliamentary there, Senator Faruqi, I'll ask you to withdraw it, or I'll have to review the Hansard and come back to the chamber. If there was something unparliamentary, it is easier to withdraw it. I didn't hear the word in question. I'm sure I would draw if there was something unparliamentary. You either withdraw or you don't, Senator Farouk. If you don't, I'll review the Hansard and come back to the chamber tomorrow. If, but I'm asking you if you did. If you didn't, that's, I'll review the Hansard. OK, thanks, Mr President. I'll review the Hansard and come back tomorrow. The problem we have is the two big parties, Liberal and Labor, are also united in an opposite quest, driven by their donors, the fossil fuel industry. They refuse to break ties with outdated, redundant and dirty energy sources. It really does boggle the mind that in a climate crisis, when a majority of people are demanding action, both Liberal and Labour want more coal and gas. They don't want to clean up the influence of money in politics because it would ruin their business model. The road to Glasgow should be paved with solar panels. But I fear, with Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce at the helm of our government, this is a pipe dream. Crawled about emissions reductions during COVID-19 when the country is shut down and at a standstill is as ridiculous as it is misleading. A pandemic is not a climate strategy. I can tell you this, political parties and politicians who ignore their communities and constituents do so at their own peril. People have had it up to here with career politicians whose only goal is to cling on to power by hook or by crook. And in this pursuit, they steamroll over the wishes of their community. People are tired of being taken for granted. More and more are waking up to the fact that politics is not just the domain of parliamentarians. I meet these people every single day. Their activism and organizing is what will get the action that we need. I've met with them in Berrima in the New South Wales Southern Highlands, where their 10 year long struggle has just blocked plans for a new coal mine. I've stood with them in Breeza, where their relentless 13-year campaign has ended with the cancellation of the Shenhua Watermark coal mine. I've joined them in Bentley, where their blockade saved their land and water from coal seam gas fracking. Even though the choice to destroy our planet is a political decision made time and time again by self-serving politicians and destructive corporations seeking endless power and profits, it gives me great hope to see communities forging ahead and winning. Because no matter how out of touch politicians in this place are, out there, the people know change is possible when we fight for it. And by God, people are fighting. And we are winning. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. The fall of the Afghan government and the subsequent Taliban takeover has quite rightly sent shockwaves around the world. Largely, the public discourse has centred around a narrative that the Taliban takeover means that the last two decades have accomplished nothing. I rise tonight to say that I strongly disagree. What that narrative fails to see is that over the last 20 years, generations of women have seen what gender equality, or more accurately, near gender equality, looks like. This gave the whole country hope for a freer life and hope for a better future. These brave Afghan women 
unshackle themselves from the restraints placed upon them and achieve things that seemed unimaginable 20 years ago. In the past two decades, Mr. President, Afghan women have fought for their equal and rightful place in society, protected by our coalition forces. Young girls were free to attend school, women welcomed into universities, the police force, politics and professions such as the law. In Afghanistan, this was a radical step forward and was evolving the very fabric of their society. Make no mistake, Taliban's likely unravelling of these gains is an atrocity, and this is the greatest tragedy to come out of the fall of Kabul. Recent pronouncements by the Taliban that they have somehow modernised themselves to be, are being proven false by anecdotal evidence every day as brutalities are being reported. However, to say that the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan discards the last 20 years of work is, fundament, is a fundamentally flawed notion that erodes the progress that was achieved by Afghan women. It erodes all the progress that those Afghan women achieved in patriarchal Afghanistan. With or without the, the Taliban, Afghan society was still a hyper-conservative, patriarchal society. The presence of our coalition forces simply provided these women with the, these women space to fight their own battles and take up their rightful place in society. If the Taliban want Afghans to live in peace, then women must play a role in that peace process. Women's participation in peace processes results in a more durable and stable peace. It is just over 20 years since the adoption of the uh, Security Resolution 1325 that affirms the important role of women in the resolution of conflicts, peace negotiations, peace building and in post-conflict reconstruction. The foundations of an inclusive and fair society stand strongest when they are built on the active participation of all of its population. The quality of a society is determined not only by the form of civil, civil institutions within it, but also by the extent that different social groups participate in these institutions. A nation cannot modernise without progress in women's rights. The women of, of Afghanistan have fought to improve the quality of the governing systems within that country over the last 20 years. They freed themselves from the shackles constraining their civil liberties in a big step towards modernising the region. What the Achieve Nothing discourse fails to recognise is that decades of progress made by these women cannot be eroded in a few days. The opportunity, the freedom, the hope provided by the last 20 years of progress is firmly seated in their minds. However, there is a finite period before the memory fades. It is in this period, starting right now, that the international community must insist that the Taliban not completely erase these gains. If the Taliban want to be recognised as the leaders of Afghanistan, they must demonstrate that they lead all Afghans equally. The gender norms and values of a whole generation have been challenged. Afghan society have seen how important gender equality is and the great many benefits that come with empowering women in society. While hard-won territorial battles may have been overrun by the recent Taliban takeover, the notions and ideas of a freer society still burn bright within the hearts of Afghan women. The women who fought off the oppressive yoke of society were changing the country by existing the way that they wished to exist. The liberation of Afghan women was the greatest accomplishment in the region, and it is this loss that should be mourned, along with the lives of our 41 defence personnel, whose sacrifice enabled this accomplishment. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Van. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. See you tomorrow. Thanks, President. See ya. Thank you.